Hello everybody, welcome back to Mateo's Corner. It is spooky month, so I decided to play a spooky game. Uh, this is called Vampire the Masquerade Shadows of New York. Um, this is based on the Vampire the, Rem the Masquerade tabletop game, if I recall, and they also made like a couple like video games and stuff based on this. I think there's also like some comics and stuff. Uh, I had a friend recommend this game to me, so, uh, yeah, we're just gonna jump into it. I don't know what's gonna happen, but, uh, here we go. Ah, the hardest decision of all, making a save slot. Here we go. Ooh. Interesting. Huh. Alright. Welcome to my castle. Don't expect everyday logic to work here. It went out of the window sometime after midnight, maybe earlier. My kingdom is not of this world, you see. I wonder if this is a, a light novel. Hm. It li li lies, lives. <laughs> I can't read today, I'm sorry. <laughs> it lies far, far, uh, it lies far outside of concrete, tangible reality. I've tried to identify the way people reach it, and I'm convinced it has something to do with the moon. <gasps> Will there be moon doggos? I hope there'll be moon doggos. Some say the moon's aura can turn them insane. Wow, okay, you didn't even let me finish reading that? Can I go back up? Okay, cool. Some say the moon's aura can turn them insane. You've heard the phrases moonstruck and lunatic. The way I see it, Moonlight gives them some subliminal permission to reveal their true selves. I feel like they're talking about werewolves right now. <laughs> it's just... I just don't know why. It's just really... It seems that way. And so, whenever they let the silver radiance guide them to the gates of this place, they feel different. Once they pass the doorstep, they're ready to act out. A dance of horrors and marvels begins. Ooh. It's 3.31 a.m. Welcome to Big Beat Burger. Oh, look at the backgrounds moving. That's cool. If you're here at this hour, you're not exactly readying up to be a productive member of society come tomorrow morning. More likely, you're praying that the sunrise never comes. Uh-oh. Insatiable children of the night gather round hoping to bask in the afterglow of tonight's victories, unwind after a frustrating series of failures, or simply fight to keep themselves together. Meanwhile, I'm just sitting here, greedily greedily, re 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 greedily reveling in every interaction they have. They have no idea they are only here for my amusement. To them, I'm just a random girl, sitting in the corner. Oh, I'm a girl, okay. Um... I'm going to wait till the thing finishes. There we go. Let me see. I have to do a, f a girl voice now, now that I'm a girl. Okay. But this is my domain. <laughs> I've been coming here almost every night for years. I know where to sit, where to look, and where to eavesdrop for maximum amusement. <laughs> She's now Mickey Mouse, apparently. <laughs> I'm basically a voyeur, and unashamed to admit it. It gave me insight about the human condition I'd never otherwise have gathered, and, more importantly, a necessary skill set to make ends meet as a journalist. It is I, Mickey, P.I. at large. <laughs> as I re <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm having too much fun with this. I apologize. Wait, can I look at my journal real quick? No? Okay. Can I look at my text? Oh, it's actually the text of the game. Okay. As I write on my crappy old laptop, patiently waiting for the legion of negative voices in my head to get too tired to offer useless feedback, I keep my senses peeled to pick up stories around me. Of course, a lot of regular events, such as food fights, are nothing to write home about, aside from my unfortunate tendency to become collateral damage in someone else's battles. <laughs> I can just imagine, like, real talk, I, I can imagine Mickey, like, getting ideas for stuff, just sitting at a cafe somewhere, like, people watching and writing down in a notebook or something. 
<laughs> Actually kind of cool. To this day, I've had to wash my clothes because of Coke, Diet Coke, coffee, apple pie, and some sort of, uh, improvised honey mustard bomb. Every stain tells a different story. Sometimes this hobby is exhausting. Sometimes it's disturbing. And sometimes it's dangerous, although not as risky as back when I wasn't carrying pepper spray. Still, the sights I've taken in over the years here have made it absolutely worth it. I've got so many stories, I don't know where to begin. <laughs> Once upon a time... <laughs> In a cottage down by the river. <laughs> uh, theatrical breakups. <laughs> Impromptu morning parties. Unexpected friendships forged in the fires of senseless battle. A.K.A. the 20th Century Fox merger. <laughs> a lady in a gorgeous Givenchy dress ordering a box of takeout chicken nuggets. Paying in cash with her hands completely covered in blood. She was asked if she wants a napkin. Of course, she said no. Not suspicious at all. <laughs> Two thirsty macho dudes shamelessly going for it in the corner. Hushed moaning filling the lobby while everyone valiantly fights to act as usual and maintain an illusion of normalcy. A straight-up kung fu fight between a diminutive cashier and some drugged bodybuilder going through a psychotic episode trying to break all the windows. So what you're saying is, we've got some yaoi in the corner, we have uh, a female Hannibal Lecter, and now we have <laughs> Johnny Cage going up against Goro. In a, or not Goro, who's a bodybuilder in MK, going up against, um, oh, what's his name? Giris in the corner as he's trying to break windows. This is amazing. Oh my god. The big guy left the joint fully convinced he KO'd himself while the server, service worker was just standing next to him. Seemed proud of his victory, too. A middle-aged hag getting a heart attack after screaming her lungs out not to let Muslims near her food just because she saw a white girl wearing a hairnet behind the counter. Wow, that's, um, mm. That's, uh... Huh. A, a masked couple robbing the restaurant of 30 hamburgers, forcing the employees to cook at gunpoint. Police later said... Those were art students reenacting some hipster book they read. Probably Twilight. <laughs> this is life. The Disney life. <laughs> this is humanity at its worst and best. This is the noise that serves as the foundation for my creativity. This is the Soma that keeps me going. This is... <sighs> as pathetic as it may sound... These days, this is the only place where I feel truly alive. I mean, can you imagine trying to buy someone like Marvel from the excess of your own home? It's not the thrill you think it is, ladies and gentlemen. Wait, the background stopped moving. Okay, they're moving. I thought they stopped moving for a second. Sometimes I think of myself as a leech, feeding on those people's stories, emotions, and personalities just because I'm not satisfied with mine. At times, I think my, of my psych, psyche as some kind of shitty postmodern construct that is fundamentally incapable of honesty, but only yearns for something felt and truthful, buying everything in the world. The mouse shall rise again. <laughs> Does this even make any sense? I look at the screen of my laptop. 3.47 a.m. At this point, I'm almost... Sub... Sub... Somnambulic? Somnambulic. I'm gonna go with somnambulic. But nothing interesting has happened yet. Feels like all the customers are watching each other tonight, hoping for the others to provide a fun diversion. This is my turf, you parasitic douchebags. Next time... Go find your own. Kingdom Hearts is mine. <laughs> I think...
think it's time to call it a night. The coffee I always order so that they don't kick me out is undrinkable. Ugh! I reread the rough draft I've been working on for the last six hours. God damn! This is pure trash! I hold the backspace button until the Google Documents page is nothing but a calm white slate and let out a sound of deep relief. <coughs> Sorry, I'm losing the voice for a second. Let me take a little sip of water here. It's very wordy. I, this must be a, no, a, a light novel or something. There's no pleasure more intoxicating for a frustrated writer than ragging on someone even worse than them. And what target is easier than the dumb bitch you used to be ten minutes ago? <laughs> wow, that's harsh. I know she's talking about herself, but... Jeez, not everything's perfect, but dang. I mean, okay, to be fair, I guess I've had moments like that where, like, I'll do something and I'm like, you frickin' moron, what were you doing? I check the time again. I need to go. I have an important meeting tomorrow at 10 a.m., and I have a hunch it's not going to end well. It's those Fox people. They want to make another X-Men movie without my consent. And it's not because of an irresponsible dumbass who's going to need a few cups of coffee to simply function on a basic level despite, like, you know, four hours of sleep. It's basically my life, four hours of sleep. It's because I always have a hunch things are not going the way they're supposed to. Click, clack. Click, click, clack. The heck? Oh, she's typing. The loud clatter of keyboards assaults me from all sides, makes the splitting headache unbearable. Used to be, I used, I, I dreamed of nothing else but being a part of the New York Lone Star editorial team. It was the first magazine I started reading regularly. The first magazine I ever bought for myself. That's, that, that's kind of cool. Now, simply hearing the word Lone Star is enough to ruin my mood. Never mind seeing all these old farts, phoning in more reactionary opinion columns and Wikipedia-level analysis of current events. I gotta change the voice soon. My throat's getting hurting. Click, clack, click, click, clack, click, clack, click, click, clack. You can do a song. Click, clack, click, clack, click, clack, click, click, clack. They used to destroy and rebuild my entire worldview every month. They shaped my thinking about politics, art, journalism. They even pointed me toward my favorite cigarette brand, for God's sake. Then some talented people started leaving for greener pastures. Some got too wrapped up in their own neurosis. Some became complacent, and we don't like that kind of thing. Oh, my poor throat. <clears throat> I might have to read this normally, guys. I I've been trying to, to, to keep the voice, but... Oh, goodness. <sighs> okay, let's try again. <clears throat> All of them committed the sin of allowing themselves to grow older. Fresh blood was deemed unnecessary, even though young freelancers kept being bled dry. Wow, they're really phoning in the uh, vampire... Uh satire with the journalism things interesting these days whenever someone from outside lodestar talks about lodestar it's because of a few idealistic contributors willing to accept meager pay while putting in a serious work what a bunch of dumbasses i mean that's the life though right you d that's how most people start in any business you know they're willing to take less pay to work where they really want to be, and then they just start going at it once they start tip -a dipping their toes in. Heck, for a while, I, I, I had a job where I was an unpaid volunteer, and then they started to pay me when they figured out that I was actually doing a good job. Um. Other than that, the magazine specializes in publishing pale echoes of provocative ideas I heard somewhere else a few years prior. Oh, shoot. There was more to that. Uh, let's go back. Hang on. Uh, there we go. Wrapped in an aesthetic that hasn't been cutting edge for a decade. Okay, sorry about that. I, I, I hit the button too soon. No wonder the readership is in free fall. 
But even though the ship is sinking, the old guard won't let it go down without a fight. As in, if anyone from the outside attempts to board the vessel in hopes of fixing its course or its holes, they will swiftly be taken care of. I should know. Been there. Done that. As it stands, the only full-time staff member who doesn't make me regularly attempt to cringe my face off with his writing <coughs> is Lodestar's editor-in-chief, gosh darn it, Brian, I'm just going to call him NG, Brian NG, the man sitting in front of me right now. Of course, he only has time for editorials these days. A drop in the sea of needs. Managerial dudes hit him hard. It's the second time he lets out a theatrical cough like this. He said his piece, and now it's up for me to react, and I'm coming up blank. But what do you want me to say, Brian? I'm pissed off. Ha <laughs> ha! I can tell you you've uh, I can tell you've already made up your mind, but you still want to go through the motions just to make me feel listened to. Whatever. Let's do this. One shot, one kill. Uh, let's see. Brian, the guy is guilty of major fraud. The man's a sexual harasser. You're protecting a complete POS. Hmm. I get to cheers. Let's go with major fraud. Uh. Let's go with major fraud. Brian, my article isn't even something like lashing out at the rich and hoping they don't hit back. I think Double Spiral's investors would appreciate being told they're being scammed. That's if, and that's a big if, they're not a conscience part of the scam. Oh, come on! And even if they weren't, I doubt they'd be generous enough to protect us from the fallout. You're avoiding the core of the issue. No, I believe I've pinpointed it in a precise way. If it were up to me, I'd greenlight the article here and now, and we wouldn't be having this conversation. Oh, shoot. I did it again. <sighs> okay, Julia. But you're killing the article just because Rich Shithead told you he doesn't like it. I mean, that's how it normally goes with, with editorials, doesn't it? I mean... <laughs> Even non-editorial shit. If there's some dude who doesn't like it, chances are they're going to make it happen. Get real. This is not about some millionaire jerk calling me to make an offer I can't refuse. What is this about, then? Because it looks awfully like... It's about my bosses telling me this outlet can't afford the legal action we have already been threatened with. So, millionaire interference. I see. We'll snuff them out. <laughs> Buy them. Kill them. Doesn't matter how. The mouse has power. Oh, for crying out loud, Julia. Don't make me treat you like a child. You know how this works. I publish your story. It's Thiel versus Gawker all over again. A lawsuit here, a lawsuit there, until we're bled dry. Like vampire stuff. I have a mortgage. I have three mouths waiting to be fed at home. I have an amazing team that doesn't deserve to be torn apart over some. Don't you think it's telling you mentioned your mortgage first? Ooh, the music kicked up a little bit. Wow, the music's really loud in this game. Silence. Just asking questions. I know better than to get into these empty semantic arguments with you, Miss Sawinski. You're good at them. The problem is, you're still not good enough. Meaning? You're too in love with weaving a good story and establishing a seductive narrative to let facts get in the way. You 
you've got enough boring sweds with no principles on board these days. They always give you facts, because that's all they can do. I'm using facts as a way to approach some kind of truth. Except facts can blindside you. And Double Spiral has enough facts to water down your story to the point where it makes no sense to publish it. Their HR and PR are working overtime to deliver a convincing counter-narrative. And they're doing a great job. Won't mitigate the damage completely, but will put every little thing in question. Jesse Montgomery is a racist, a fraud, a sexual predator, and a downright satanic fuckhead. Julia. Let me say it again. Jesse, whoops, Jesse Montgomery is a racist, a fraud, a sexual predator, and a downright satanic fuckhead. Do you personally believe it or not? This is not... Wow, this is getting pretty heavy for the, the beginning. You've listened to the tapes. You've read the transcripts. You've seen the documents. You've got the files. I'm asking for your personal opinion, sir. Do you believe it or not? Don't make me pull the keyblade out of my ass and beat you with it. Click, clack, click, clack, click. Of course I do, but that's besides the point. It's not. Look, how about I just say it loud and save us both some time. We're not having this conversation because there's an actual conversation to be had. You set up this meeting knowing very damn well there's only one way it's going to end. You've got a mortgage and three mouths to feed. You prioritize the well-being of your direct surroundings over some nebulous concept of greater good. I get it. I really do. Yet for some reason, it seems like you're only prolonging this conversation and rationalizing your decision so that I... Forgive you? Officially exonerate you? I'm not... <clears throat> I'm not the bad guy here, Julia. Mmm, another choice. Mmm. What are you then, in your own words? A man who does what's necessary to protect his own. So, I don't count as your own anymore? He mutters something under his breath ending with a self-pitying chuckle. I don't know if you'd even want to work under a scumbag like me from now on. Oh, come on! Don't turn this into some pity party. No, I'm absolutely a scumbag. And why is that? Because I'm firing you. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. My thoughts are scrambled. For a brief moment, the state of my bank account displays before my eyes with startling clarity. A howling void opens in my chest and starts traveling towards my stomach. No, don't panic yet, you idiot. Get more information. Now, there must be a catch. Let me get this straight. Ever since we met, I have been working on stories and pieces no one else in your office would touch with a ten-foot pole. Constantly interviewing total nobodies, always busy traveling to the middle of nowhere or regretting my last trip, re repeatedly ordered to clean up someone else's mess. Julia. All your long-winded spiels about how the disposable work is the most important work and suddenly, you only remember the disposable part? My feelings about the quality of your work remain the same as ever. It was vital. It kept the magazine going. 
I will always appreciate it. Then why would you threaten to fire me? I would never threaten you. It's a done deal. They've made their decision pretty clear. They? What they? Who is this they? He glances left and right, and then points up upward for a short moment. When he speaks up again, it's in a hushed voice. I cannot keep doing this voice. I am so sorry. You know, the big kahunas can't really question them, and they wanted your head on a silver plate. He's not looking me in the eye. You're not joking. I would never joke about stuff like this. It's real. Fucking hell, it's real. Damn it, 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 all to hell. All these years, all this grind. Oops. All my plans, and for what? Fucking asshole, you know I deserve better, and I always deserve better, and it always ends with me going down the drain, back to the sewers. Fuck. Wow, she is, spi she is spiraling. Uh-oh. No. Take a few deep breaths. Don't lose the plot now. Keep yourself together, you idiot. The moment you show weakness, they go for your throat. Get back in control. I might have to change her voice uh, during the parts when she's not talking. Because I cannot speak in that voice forever. You can't do this. I wish I didn't have to. But it's a lost cause. No, I mean... It's impossible. Julia. You can't fire someone who's never been hired in the first place. It takes him a few seconds to put on his, oh, I get it face, let out a troubled gasp, and start massaging his temples. Ah, a loophole. Lodestar. Okay, yeah, for these parts, I'm not going to do the Mickey Mouse voice because it hurts my throat, and this will give me time in between to do stuff. Uh, let's see here. Lodestar has been my biggest source of income for the past few years. That much is true. But technically, nobody's ever hired me here. It was all freelance jobs. A full-time position only served as a kind of dangling carrot, a promise of a decent pay grade, career perspectives, maybe even some kind of insurance to save my failing health. Oh, that's sad. And the recognition I would get for being a part of the Lodestar team. A position that everyone around me see seems to respect. Aside from me. Then why did I want it so much? Wow, the music got really loud all of a sudden. I apologize. Dot, dot, dot. There will be time to mourn what could have been. For now, I act like I don't care. You know what I mean. If I let you work, even under a fake name, it would be a guillotine for me. This is ridiculous. You know I'm going to start shopping this story around the second I leave this room, don't you? Of course I know. I told him. Any response? Let us worry about that. Well, that doesn't sound ominous at all. No, it really doesn't. Let's see. Click, clack, click, clack, click. Ah, uh, it seems to be a, a running thing with this place. I do wonder if I could get accustomed to one of these loud mechanical keyboards some people here love to use. Yeah, I would imagine that if that's all you heard most of the time was just clicking and clacking, you'd probably go crazy unless you were really into your work. Whenever I did my work here, I was still expected to bring my own crappy laptop and sit closer to the lobby. Always on the outside, no matter how hard I try to break in. A vibration in my back pocket. Feels like a bad omen. I decide to ignore it for now. I've been working on this story for, I don't know, 16 months, on and off. I know. You kept cheering me on. I know. We have agreed on the pay I'd receive. I know. I'm two months behind on my rent. No, wait, two and a half. I catch him off guard. He's momentarily taken aback, and then gives me an empathetic stare. Don't you look at me this way. You don't have the right. I didn't know. Well, now you do, bastard. 
Look, if there's anything I can do to help... If you can't tell your big kahunas to fuck off, I don't think there's a single thing. Julia. I pull out a smoke and light it up. Gotta get back in control. Please don't do that. There's a smoke detector here. No worries. Nick turned it off a few weeks ago. Probably the most creative thing he's done in the past five years. Good old Nick, the perfect 21st century cinema reviewer. Never has an original thought of his own. Just relies on his purely algorithmic tastes to stay likable. And the best thing is, it works. Funny, I used to dream about his job. It was Brian who killed this dream, making me realize Nick won't be unseated anytime soon, and offered to teach me the ways of an investigative journalist instead. Wait. So does that mean that event? Well, no, I guess that's true because eventually, that guy would probably lose his job because if people don't care about going to the movies as often and whatnot, um, it wouldn't really matter. Plus, reviewers are a dime a dozen. There's so many of them that, like, you know, sometimes a reviewer is around for a really, really long time and then they just stop doing it or there's better people that come along or there's someone with a new style or things like that so yeah I, I, I can see why Brian um, told her to do that one instead wasn't the career I ever wanted to pursue but to my dismay I turned out to be surprisingly good at it until this Montgomery thing happened oh wait I thought that was her talking shoot serves me right serves me right lesson learned should have pursued my dreams instead Stop it. Nicholas is a good friend, a respected critic, a member of my team. And put out that smoke. People tell me I let you step all over me. Why do I even let you act this way? Because you once told me honesty is most important in a mentor-student relationship. And that works both ways. And because I thought we were friends. He, he bites his lip and stares sideways to avoid my eyes. At the end of the day, bosses aren't friends. Must have been a terrible mentor if I didn't even teach you that. Um, hmm. May I must have been terrible. Could have been better. You are still responsible for me. Dot, dot, dot. I'm going to say dot, dot, dot. I'll let him keep talking. The best I can do for now is just stay silent. I don't feel too stable right now. Like I could explode any second. I mean, well, yeah, I can understand. Julia. I might have failed you as a guide, but I will do what I can not to leave you stranded, okay? There are options. None of them are a remedy for your troubles, but... Oh, wait a second. Another vibration in my pocket. Another foreboding feeling. This time I reluctantly take the smartphone out of my pocket. If it has to rain, why not let it pour? A new email. It's a lengthy one. And the sender. Speak of the devil. No. No, no, no. This can't be. Christ. I just, uh, got an email from Mila Lopez. She claims she's just been laid off from Double Spiral. Same as, uh, Mike Antonoff and Jared Rivera. What? It's... what happened? I'll spare you all her insults, okay? The key thing is, it seems their HR knows all the confidential information about my journalistic investigation and used it to shut everyone's mouth. Hell, apparently Montgomery walked up to Lopez as she was emptying her desk and told her to thank me for being a, and I quote, dumb and careless cunt. Brian goes pale. I think he has a very good reason to. 
You fucking scumbag. You outed... Oh, he outed her. Oh, dude. Oh, it was probably his higher-ups. His higher-ups probably told him, you know what? You need to out all her sources. You need to out her and let it all drop. Wow, that sucks. What? What? Of course not. What are you even saying? Uh, she caught you, sir. Just admit it. And, you know. <laughs> oh, don't you dare play coy. It must have been either you or me. No one else. And you know the way I work. My investigation was bare basically untraceable. Both on and offline. Carefully picked meeting spots. Encryption upon encryption. Every direct quote rewritten five times just in case. All sorts of red herrings scattered around. I know my shit. You know I do. And this timing? Did you just pass a flash drive to your beloved big kahunas during a meeting as a sign of goodwill? He did. Here we go. Here it is. Here is his confession. <laughs> Objection! Sir, you have outed yourself. Look, I get why you're upset, but why don't we just talk this through calmly? Uh-oh. Well, she's basically saying F off, so... Fury takes the wheel, and I'm just here along for the ride. I can't do anything about it. In a deranged way... Realizing you're just a passenger in your own body feels liberating. Let's just see it all unfold. Calmly? Fuck you, Brian. Julia! I've been paranoid for months and months, acting like everyone I didn't know was an assassin or a corporate spy. I know I haven't messed up, not in a way that would implicate all of them. You, you goddamn... You thought you could get away with this? I haven't done anything improper. Don't push the blame on me. Yeah, but... You did, though. You outed her sources. I mean, yeah, the big kahoot has probably told you to, but at the same time, you could have just been like, I don't know how she works. I don't know how to do things. Can we just take this time to, like... I really like the art in this game. It looks really nice. So what? You're claiming it's my fault? Because you're never the guilty one? It's always the bosses, the economy, the obligations you have. And now me? You're being silly. Quit with this martyr bullshit. Calm down or I'll have to. You immoral shithead. You motherfucking... Calm down for God's sake. And so it goes. I yell out a lot of words I wanted to say for a long time, but held back. I fling a lot of insults I've been workshopping for years, hoping I'd never use them. I break a few things. At times, for a split second, I see pity in somebody's eyes. It's gonna haunt me for a long time, but in the heat of the moment, I don't care. These people, no, this company has nothing left to offer me, so at least let me take this catharsis. In the end, a security guard has to escort me out of the building, and that's the end of my journalistic career. I just feel like my world has crumbled into nothing. Oh, Dakota. I mean, you have every right to, like Jesus. If I were you, I would have already broken down into a sobbing mess. I don't even know if this is a guy or a girl, so I'm just going to roll with this voice for the rest of the time. Oh, I'd love to, but I'm on a subway. Far too proud to cry in public, even now. And... And? It's stupid, but I feel like someone out there keeps destroying everything I hold dear, just to see my reaction. Like it was a prank show, and someone was waiting to record me crying. 
So, out of sheer spite, I'm doing my best not to cry. Fuck you, whoever and wherever you are. That's the most Julia Sawinski thing I've heard. Spite is the greatest motivator, huh? Not feeling particularly motivated to do anything right now, to be honest. I just want to stay in my bed until my shithead landlords call the cops to forcefully evict me. Not surprised. Shit. I know that whenever life decides to fuck you over, it's always one thing after another. But this is... This is too much. How much is too much? Let's recap this last week of June 2019. Oh, it's kind of current. I've been kicked out of my job. Well, not that I've ever been hired, so let's just say my mentor broke every vague promise he ever made to me. A big thing I'd been working on for a year and a half went down the toilet. It's all useless. My boss didn't protect my sources properly. And now they've been trying to reach me through every possible channel to threaten me or just yell at me. And they have every right to react like that. All my side gigs were shut down. Nobody's replying to my emails. Someone's been dragging my name through the mud behind the scenes. And it worked. I still have no idea who's been sending these shitty messages around. I've been asking, but... Listen, don't worry about it. I'm not gonna stand out of the by and watch you get cancelled by some mean-spirited, delusional... I said, don't worry about it. I have three unread messages from my landlord. The message previews were stressful enough. A call came from Chicago. Oop. Apparently, Dad has bladder cancer. Mom is in hysterics. She'd go crazy if she had heard about my situation, so I have to pretend everything is okay whenever she calls. And she calls every day. And she just won't hang up after she offloads all her burdens on me. I can't blame her. Because we all had to learn to cope with Dad's psychopathic tendencies somehow. I was robbed. All my documents and what little money I had, gone. Don't even know when or where it happened. And it's driving me crazy because I'm always extremely wary of pickpockets. The list goes on. I don't want to sound paranoid, but it really feels like a cons concerted attack. Concerted? I think it's what it is. <laughs> paranoid is good. Anyway, I know you always hand weave this topic anyway, but just remember that if anything happens, my place is your place. You don't have to get through it alone. I do. I've been a trouble magnet and as self-centered as I may be, I don't want it to affect you. I know. Uh, listen, uh, I, I have another call. All right. Just call me if anything happens, no matter how dumb it seems, okay? And swing by whenever you can. I will. Thank you. See you. I put my phone away, exhale, and blankly stare in front of me. Christ. I glance at my reflection in the window. Just look at this idiot. Whenever the situation requires me to dress formally, I still, f I still feel a bit like a child cosplaying as an adult. Ah, you don't like to wear suits either. I'm not the only one. It's not that I don't like wearing suits. I just, I just get very uncomfortable. I think one of my shoulders is a little higher than the other one. So when you try to put on like something that's really tight fitting, it gets really like, even if it's loose, it's very restricted, and I get all like uncomfortable. I think it's my anxiety, but whatever. Should have just followed the dressed for the job you want advice and continued dressing up like a trust fund kid who keeps partying on, partying on Brooklyn rooftops for years without a care in the world. It's only after a while that I realize the car is empty. Unnaturally so. I start feeling uneasy, but someone enters my peripheral vision. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. That looks like a vampire. And that's the last thing I consciously, consciously register. The world dissolves. When I come to, I'm out of the subway, 
standing in a back alley I don't recognize. It's pretty dark. My eyes start adjusting, and I try to figure out what happened. There's a gun in my hand. A faint silhouette at my feet. It's not moving. Somebody stands in front of me, covered in shadows. I can't fully make out her face, but she's staring at me with visible intent. She speaks. Her voice is raspy and androgynous. Her tone, hateful and mocking. Aren't you a nasty one? W what's going on? Who are you? Don't play coy. My mind goes blank. I look at the ground. There's a body riddled with bullet holes. And I recognize who it is. Was. The corpse belongs to Mike Antonov, one of the double spiral whistleblowers. My source. He was just threatening to get back at me a few hours ago. Before I can feel even the tiniest bit of compassion, I face a terrible realization. They will think I'm guilty. Oh my god. Am I guilty? How is this real? You? You've done something to me, haven't you? B back in the subway. That, that was you, wasn't it? A man is bleeding out at your feet, and you're turning this around on me somehow. I haven't done anything to him. Again, don't play coy. You knew him. He was mad at you. You started telling him sob stories about your situation. He wasn't having none of it. You got mad. Things escalated. He died. This isn't true. It's plausible, but that doesn't make it true. Or does it? Oh wait, gosh darn it, I keep forgetting that when it's this part, it's just her mental thing. This is just a nightmare. It doesn't even make sense. It, it, it must be a dream. And if it isn't, the person in front of me must be responsible. There's a faint voice in my head, screaming that it's her world, that I'm just living in it. What the fuck have you done to me? Nothing yet, but I'll do what I can to get you locked up for life. This is a murder in the first degree with special circumstances. Her detached voice and nonsensical tone only reassures me this can't be real. I refuse to believe it is. Before I even manage to think this through, I point the gun at her. If I did murder him, you wouldn't be acting like that. You wouldn't be standing in front of me. You'd be running away, calling the police begging for help, yelling that I'm a psycho. Oh, you are a psycho, but I'm not a coward. I won't let you walk out of here alive. This doesn't make a lick, single lick of sense. Tears well up in my eyes. Why are you doing this? Because sometimes one has to confront what they're really made of. There's no two ways about it. She's gotta be nuts. Slowly but surely, she starts walking towards me. Stop right there, or, or I'll shoot. Go on. It's the only way you can get off the hook, isn't it? The only way you can survive. But you will definitely prove you are the monster I claim you are. What the fuck is this tone? So controlling, inauthentic, patronizing. I'm serious. For your own sake, you'd better be. She keeps getting closer. Maybe I did kill Antonov. Maybe I don't deserve to live. Maybe it's less tiring not to live. Maybe I should just let her take care of me. Maybe I'll just wake up. Or maybe this insane reality needs to be rejected as violently as possible. Maybe a world that wants to destroy me deserves to be destroyed. She's right in front of me. 
It's now or never. Don't shoot. I won't shoot. Just help me. Please help me. I will. She yanks the gun out of my hand with ease. Her strength is horrifying, actually, and turns it against me. Then she pulls the trigger. With a gaping hole where my heart used to be, I fall down onto Antoff's body. If it's any consolation to you, if that's the way you were, there's no chance you were ever going to amount to anything. I've just hastened the inevitable. Your low life, not even worth drinking. I'm just angry at myself for wasting so much time and resources to give you a second chance. Sierra wanted me back in Chicago as soon as possible. She'll have to wait a bit longer. Ah, well. I have no idea what she's talking about, but I have no condition to care anymore. Did I just get a bad end? Oh my god, I think I got a bad end. <laughs> I got a bad end. <laughs> Gosh darn it. Ah, shoot. Aw, oh, no! I can't skip the credits either. Um, wow. That was a very short... Let's play... No, I'm kidding. I'm gonna try to get past... Oh, I can skip the credits. There we go. Alright, I'm gonna go back to where I was. And, um... We will continue the actual story, if it'll let me. Um, hopefully it will. <laughs> oh, wait, I have to do a new game? Oh my gosh, wait, really? I can't just load when you're done, you're done? <gasps> oh no, I should have saved. Oh, I should have saved. A few moments later. We are kind of back where we were. Um, I'm just going to skip the text until we get to that point she's right in front of me it's now or never shoot all right here we go this is continuing the actual story sorry that happened last time i didn't actually know that you could get a bad end so quickly in this game um but here we go i close my eyes and squeeze the trigger Ooh, i wonder what's gonna happen a loud bang echoes through the alley i'm afraid to look at what i've done I've been to a shooting range once and felt absolutely horrified by pistols. Such a small thing, but it can easily puncture a hole in the fabric reality is made of. Never knew I'd be able to use it against another human being. The very thought makes me want to puke. You were a right choice, after all. I'm so glad. You haven't allowed yourself to break. But you've crossed the line I needed you to cross. There's a silent flame in you that could become an inferno if left unchecked. I sure hope it will. She's still alive. Her voice is coming from behind me. She puts her hands around my waist, and her cold mouth touches my neck. I can feel my shirt getting violently torn off. I don't understand. And I'm too dazed to protest. That was your final test. Congratulations. You've proven yourself worthy. I can- Ah, uh, now she's turning into a vamp. No. No, our poor main character. I can feel something sharp sliding into my neck. It's not too painful, just startling. Think. A doctor pushing a needle into your vein without a proper warning. Then it hits me. Pure bliss. The dopamine receptors I've considered completely fried until now suddenly recover and bombard me with pleasure I've never known before. I finally let the tears go. They come flooding. They've been waiting for years. It's such a relief. Is it raining? I feel like I'm in the middle of a deluge, at least. Washing away all my fears, all of my sorrows, all of my anger, all of my pain, all of my ego. I become one with the world, 
and the woman behind me. She's holding me tight, making me feel like the only important thing in this world. Everything else blurs. I feel something intense toward her, something I've never felt before. Is this love? I hope it is. This is not you. This is a familiar, cynical voice in the back of my head. But it's okay. I never felt particularly fond of me anyway. New York, you're perfect. Oh, please don't change a thing. He who laughs in the shadows always has the last laugh. Hallelujah. Praise be. Well, wow, this is an interesting way her world is going. When everything is cliche, nothing is. Isn't that the ever-distant utopia I've been chasing all along? People on the other trains. I hope you're doing fine. God, shut up. Just enjoy it. I mean, I wasn't going to tell you to shut up, but... We need to get on with the story here, game. So, uh, you finally understand. She's making love to me. It's giving birth to me. She's burying me. Ugh. I'm pretty sure I've been dead for a while. I'm pretty sure I could stare at my own corpse in her hands from a distance. For a moment. Somehow. And then... I'm alive again. She lifts her mouth from my neck. No. Wait. I taste blood in my mouth. Was I... drinking her blood too? I realize that whatever this was, it's over. And I have to bask in the afterglow while I still can. I also immediately understand that I'm going to chase this fleeting feeling for the rest of my existence. Finally, she lets out a whisper which concludes the ceremony. No matter what happens next, don't forget, you're a monster. But you were lucky enough to be born into a world of monsters. So don't you ever mourn that fact. Embrace it. Oh, I got an achievement for... <laughs> I got an achievement for getting past the uh, first chapter. Whoa, wait, what? Wait, is this a time loop thing or are we just here again? What the heck? Once again, I find myself in Big Beat Burger. Familiar surroundings. Faces I recognize. Mood... The same as it ever was. Still, I process it in an entirely different way. It all frustrates me now. Or, more precisely, makes me frustrated with myself. It's like I'm clinging to the remnants of a cocoon I've outgrown. Oh, look at her. She even looks different now. Look at her. She's all sassy and stuff. Ugh! It's the same with these cigarettes. I don't need them anymore. So why do I keep holding on to them? Fucking hell. It's like I refuse to accept that I'm something better than I used to be. A vampire. Oh, dictionary's updated. Just two nights ago, I met Karen. She embraced me, and by which I mean turned me into a kindred. She calls herself my sire, and me her child. Alright, so let's see real quick. Oh, you can actually read what these mean. The embrace. So the embrace is how a vampire turns their human prey into a fellow vampire, for whatever reason. Like most things, the details are a bit more gruesome than whatever romanticized images Hollywood has shoved down everyone's throat over the years. Unless you think total exonduation followed by the replacement of your vital bodily fluids by someone else's sounds romantic. <laughs> Ew! That's kind of gross. <laughs> Jeez. Uh, kindred. A term of fellowship among vampires. Thought to have been coined after an anarch uprising of some sort, but the Camarilla doesn't talk about that much. Hmm. Sire, the one who makes you a bloodsucker, a vampire's name for parent. Mine was Karen. Child, what a sire calls his or her vampire progeny when they are being naughty. Sort of like when an exhausted mom calls their kid by their first name. Also tends to the go-to when somebody feels like they're out of arguments and needs to make their seniority known. Plural form is childer. Interesting. Um, go back and we'll continue here. I'm so glad I... Oh, you know what? Actually, let me save real quick. 
just so that we uh, don't lose our progress. And then we'll go to load. Night two. Here we go. God, that sucks. If you make a wrong decision, you have to do all this again. Oh, I got to start remembering all this so I don't mess up. Oh, cool. So if you've read the stuff before, it turns white. That's awesome, actually. Uh, last night, she taught me the basics of survival. Drinking blood. Manipulating humans. Bending steel. Controlling the shadows. Tonight, I expected more lessons. Instead, she just told me to go out and enjoy myself. What's the catch? I asked. To which she responded, I might kill you if you prove to be a disappointment. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Rules I gotta follow now. There are a few rules. I have to uphold the masquerade. I can't contact anyone I knew as a human. I can't let anyone realize I'm not human anymore. I can't embrace anyone, and so on. The Masquerade. The systematic secrecy of vampires built to conceal our world from humankind in order to protect us. Essentially, the Masquerade is our shield against the fear and ignorance of human beings. Make no bones about it. If the vast majority of people ever learned we exist, we would be hunted to extinction. Yeah. I mean, it makes sense. Otherwise, I'm free to do whatever I want. But for some reason, the first thing I did was come back here. Old habits die hard. Karen is probably watching me from somewhere, even now. The way I understand it, tomorrow night she's supposed to introduce me to the Camarilla, a local society of vampires. Let's go see what that says. Camarilla, the big boys and girls in town. The largest vampire sect I know of. Plays well with mortals, or rather, plays mortals like a fiddle. Manipulative and rigid in structure. Almost feudal. Really, there's a prince in involved, no joke. Heavily interested in maintaining the masquerade and other so-called traditions, which helps the two previous points. Very interesting. Hmm. Turns out, they are the ones systematically ruining my life lately. All a part of some secret evaluation that I barely passed. Just imagining the reach they have makes me dizzy. I wonder if they're part of Double Spiral. It would make a lot of sense. I also wonder if some hu Actually, this makes me wonder, are there some humans that are a part of the Masquerade, uh, the society as well? Like, do they have humans that they point to like, okay, you're going to work for us, this is how it's going to go? That'd be very interesting, actually. I wish I knew more about Vampire the Masquerade, because, gosh darn it, the lore of this is amazing, and and Werewolf the Apocalypse is cool. The whole world of darkness um, intrigues me. Um, after they destroyed the old me that I barely cared about, Karen rebuilt me anew. On one hand, her test left some scars that will take some time to heal. On the other hand, maybe I should just be grateful. I'm snapped out of my thoughts by a sudden scream. Some douchebag yelling about his french fries not being salty enough. I think this is my cue to leave. Permanently. Goodbye, BBB. Hope I never see you again. Oh, even her eyes look different. That's cool. I'm destined for greater things, you see. Ooh. I get to pick where to go? Aw, oh, crap. Let's see, what do we got? Retribute of Justice, a meathead bully and his unfortunate victim. I probably shouldn't interfere, but what better chance I could find to test what I've become? The Dance Macabre. Time to swing a little more on the devil's dance floor. The club beckons. The risks of swiping right. The Tinder addict smells like a bit of a loser, a wannabe intellectual, a perfect source of nourishment. Hmm. Hmm. I don't know. I didn't know I was going to have a lot of choice in this. Um, let's go with... You know? I'm kind of interested to see where, where the Tinder one goes. Let's do this. <laughs> this one just kind of looks funny to me. I don't know why. He lowers his eyes awkwardly, thinking how to proceed with his rant. So, it's like... The conversation isn't really smooth, yeah? It's like I keep throwing shit against the wall and seeing what sticks. 
But nothing seems to stick for long. You understand, yeah? For sure. It's really this lack of uh, context that's killing me about online dating. It's bad enough when a few photos and a single sentence are all you have to rely on when starting a conversation, yeah? But when there's a cosmic miracle finally happens and she's actually willing to keep replying to you and she's actually down to meet up eventually and you're out there sitting with her and after 90 minutes you still don't have that shared context just no clue whatsoever it's just like take me out and put a bullet in my head and put me out of my misery I hear you So it's just one of those dates, and it's like we've been sitting here for ages, and the only thing she has a prolonged interest in is getting as hammered as possible. Just one drink after another. Oh, I think he's talking about, I think he met someone, I think she met somebody and he's just talking about stuff. I don't think he's actually, like, trying to date her. And the more drunk she is, the more uh, familiar she's getting. It's these little things, you know? Touching my upper arm after each joke, her arm around my shoulder, her jokingly punching my waist. Yet this escalation is subtle, but steady. In addition, one reoccurring topic appears, and that is all the cool shit she has and wishes she could have shown me. Oh, too bad it's all back in her apartment. That's when it hits me. She just wants to fuck, er, uh, sleep with me. No way! Yeah! Well, ev eventually we both run out of ideas for topics that could potentially be interesting for the both of us. So I'm just like, yeah, sure, I'd love to see all that crap in your apartment. So we Uber there, and it's an admittedly pretty nice apartment. Like, nothing too fancy, but I tell her... But I can tell her dad's the kind of asshole I'd like to punch in the face if I ever met him, know what I mean? So she guides me to the kitchen and makes me some tea. A rare Indian blend. Forget what it was five minutes later. Then she excuses herself and goes to the bathroom. And doesn't come back. Ten minutes later, I run out of tweets to read and become a little concerned. I start looking around. For the first thing that catches my eye is the kitchen table. Go on. Oh, maybe- oh, you know what? He's probably a dude that- that she's- maybe she's interrogating him about something, like a news lead or something. The table's surprisingly large, and it's covered in neatly arranged documents. Like, some connect the dots, investigation board, mafia conspiracy kind of thing. Naturally, I take interest. It takes me 20 seconds to process what it is. Her entire mental health history, sorted chronologically, with all the juicy stuff neatly underlined in color. And I mean entire. It's all there. A detailed description of her fucked up household situation over the years. Anxiety, ADHD, bouts of depression, suspicions of schizophrenia, severe BBP. P BPD, well that's a tongue twister, some weird psychosexual stuff with her brother. I keep reading and reading. And remember what I said about throwing sit against the wall and seeing what sticks? I'm dead certain that's how her shrink went about diagnosing her. She finally comes out of the bathroom like an hour after she, she went in. At this point, I've read all the sit on the table three times, and not just the stuff she's highlighted for my convenience. And I feel like, right now, I understand her better. Like, someone who's read Crime and Punishment understands Rascal Mokov. I think it's how you say that name. And I'm not happy about that. Like, at all. You know what I mean. Uh-huh. 
she, I guess she's just trying so hard to listen and he's just being so out of there. As he walks in with a cheerful, Hi! I respond with a slick, All good. She nods and does this weird finger gun thing and chuckles. I pretend I've been doing work-related stuff on my phone the whole time. The small talk starts. A minute in, she casually picks up one of the documents on the table. And she starts doing these super obvious body language cues that are like, Oh no, how did this get here? I'm practically dying inside, but I put on my cool face and make it look like I'm not here. Sorry, gotta reply to my boss. Yeah, he's working 24-7, psycho motherfucker. Yeah, haha, -ha, yeah. <laughs> she slowly collects all the documents, puts them away, and then nonchalantly asks me something about Tame Impala while I'm feeling crushed by all the kind of trauma I've just learned about. The apartment starts feeling like a coffin. All of a sudden, she picks up a kitchen knife and starts playing with it with this zoned out stare. I'm fucking mortified. So what do you think I did? Who slept with her? Of course I slept with <laughs> Oh my gosh. Was I I was expecting nothing less of this dude. The way he was building it up, I feel like Oh my god. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> That's how the worst six months of my life began, and I couldn't even say I didn't see it coming. God, I'm such a slut. Yeah, I mean, kind of. Kind of. He leans back and groans while hiding his face behind his palms. I look at his neck. Every vein seems so visible and impossibly alluring. I don't think I ever looked at anyone's neck like that. I realize I feel insanely thirsty. Damn. I know. You sure took a turn. Years ago when this rape began, it was about continental philosophy. What? Sorry, can you say that again? He's pretty drunk, barely able to focus on anything but his current train of thought. Just what I was hoping for. Years ago when this... never mind. Listen, it's stuffy in here. I want to go out. Get some fresh air. You haven't even touched your drink. I mean, I would if I could. No more alcohol for me. What? No, this one's not mine. I mean, some dude bought it for me, but I don't want it. He scans the room with a death stare, looking for the guy who did it, not realizing his best chance of finding him is in a mirror. Then... Ew, what? He drinks, like, a half of my glass at once while looking around, as if he was hoping to prove his dominance over an unseen enemy. Wow. So, not only is he a weirdo, he drank out of your own cup. That's weird. You don't do that, guys. You, you, you don't do that. If you're on a first date with somebody, you don't, you don't do that. Okay. After you. Ooh, this is, this is actually really cool. This is, this is like a wallpaper. We're walking across a mostly empty street. He's focused on keeping upright and walking in a straight line. I'm focused on finding a spot where I can drink him up. You seem like bad news. Oh yeah? So why don't you just leave me alone? Determinism, I guess. I roll my eyes and that's when I notice it. A deep, underlit stairwell. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. I think I, I, I think we're going to get our first victim, ladies and gentlemen. I'm not quite sure, but I have a sneaking suspicion. I look around and realize there's no one around. This is my chance. I immediately yank him downstairs. It's almost pitch black, but I can still see his face. He doesn't seem shocked. It's more like awkwardness. 
Now listen, it's not that I, like, never wanted to do this sort of thing in public. Uh, quite the opposite. It's just that I need a certain degree of comfort to, uh, perform at optimal levels. Oh, you're gonna perform well, all right, sir. Don't you worry about that. <laughs> oh, shut up. I sink my fangs inside of his neck as he whimpers and becomes silent. Finally. That's what I've been waiting for for the past hour. He relaxes in my arms, and I relax with him. It's like all the drinks I had to deny myself until now are hitting my head all at once, with no unpleasant side effects. I feel radiant. I don't want this moment to end. But it has to. I drop his body to the floor and lick the wound closed, just the way she taught me. His pulse is faint, but steady. He reeks of booze. If anyone finds him, there should be no suspicions. As I walk up the stairwell, I insert a finger into my mouth and try to sense my fangs. No dice. It seems they really are retractable. Well, that's handy. The hunger pangs are gone. I rub my hands around my body. I feel comfortable, hopeful, happy. Can't remember the last time I enjoyed life like this. Now let's keep this party going. Oh! So we can pick one or the other now. Uh-oh. Alright, there's time to swing more on the devil's dance floor or the meathead and his unfortunate victim. Hmm. What would be less... Like, if I do this, I could eat the dude, but then I might get a witness. If I do this... Oof. Ooh, this is tough. Let, let's let try the... the. Let's try the dance floor. That seems like it would be less... Um, less of a chance for things to go wrong. Because here you can find a place to hide and do stuff. This club reeks of death, and I love it. I've been here quite a few times, but I've never seen anything this breathtaking. Everyone over around me is whacked out of their minds, and as they keep dancing madly, the spirits dance beside them. Ooh, that's cool. Spectral silhouettes phase in and out of existence, becoming more visible the more intense the music grows. It looks like a bizarre ritual, a profane mass. Ooh, interesting. I like how they also animate the people in the crowd. Like, some of them are animated and some aren't. It actually works really well. I notice it's the voice samples the ghosts react to the strongest. The most, suggest the most suggestive ones cause them to appear distorted, even tormented. Oh, it's a ghosty. Hello, ghost. It was as if someone, something was struggling to be born out of the harsh sounds and the dead were hoping to be reborn alongside it. They're all uneasy, quivering with desire for something far beyond their reach, probably the same as when they were alive. Oh, that's kind of sad. Sometimes the living dancers spot their dead counterparts. It's usually the most manic ones who notice something out of the corner of their eye for only a split second, but never realize what they've glimpsed. And I have to wait, because otherwise I'm going to miss all that text. Some apparitions dance to a completely different tune than the rest of us. One only they can hear. And those seem the saddest. Oh, these poor ghosts. I want to give all the ghosts a hug. <laughs> the spectacle is eerie. At times, it's unbearably melancholic. Above all, it's beautiful. I keep on moving to the rhythm until I reach a trance-like state. And then something even stranger happens. Every now and then, when I brush against someone, a fragmentary vision appears before my eyes. A car burning on a freeway, an outstretched hand in the depths of the sea, a man jumping out a skyscraper window. Oh, was she able to see their death? Oh, that's really interesting. Oh, I like that. Memories of the past? Preventable visions of the future? I have no idea what it means, but I'm strangely eager to find out. Oh, who's this? Oh, she looks cool. Oh, she needs a voice. <laughs> and then there's dancers like her, 
Ones that aren't ghosts, humans, or even vampires, but something else altogether. Is she a witch? A werewolf? Could be a werewolf. There are werewolves in this universe. This new world is so full of mysteries, and I plan to get to the bottom of them all. But for now, I just want to dance. Wow! What a night! I watch Times Square from above. It's beautiful. Never thought this place could make me emotional, to be honest. But here I am, feeling deeply moved. Who would have thought? Getting up here was surprisingly easy, all things considered. It took more thought than physical effort. Earlier tonight, I started experimenting with this body's limits. I realized I can jump over small buildings and climb steep walls with ease now. And my whole perception of space has shifted. I planned a scenic route across the rooftops. I did my best to avoid attracting attention, just as I was told. Stayed in the shadows as much as humanly possible. I spot a drone from afar. For a second, I feel uneasy. But I remember what she told me. Machines won't get a clear view of me anymore. Camera footage, photos, it's all glitched out or blurry. Wouldn't take it for granted if I didn't try to catch my reflection earlier on. I couldn't see my face clearly, not, not in the mirror, not even in a puddle. My face was like one of Dali's clocks. Ooh, that's, that's kind of creepy, actually. Uh, she told me to keep a low profile regardless. Someone might take note and track you down. She didn't care to elaborate, but it didn't sound encouraging. Suddenly, it hits me that I might never be able to see my own face again. I won't even be able to take care of my looks by myself. And what about the long-term psychological effects? A knot of anxiety tightens in my stomach. Jesus, this is probably just the tip of the iceberg. What else is going to change? Calm down. Wait a second. These past few nights have been the best of my life. For years, I was a downward spiral. Failing health, no future, a feeling of overwhelming powerlessness. Now everything has been flipped upside down. A total paradigm shift. A bad ending is no longer the only option. Uh, no, we got a bad end earlier, Missy. Don't you remember? You accidentally died. <laughs> I am actually looking forward to tomorrow. I forgot how that feels. When it used to stand at mere seconds to midnight, the doomsday clock has been effectively turned off. A cold breeze brushes my neck, or my cheek. Why did I say neck? As stupid as it sounds, I choose to read it as the world telling me to chin up. I can bend anyone to my will. I'm capable of superhuman strength. I'm a master of shadows. I can do anything. Tomorrow night, I'll be introduced to my duties. If everything goes according to plan, I will become a New York City representative of Clan La Sombra. Ooh. Dictionary. Clan. A vampire's family tree, specifically those sharing common blood. Imagine everyone who is your blood relative. Everyone you can picture gathered around the table at Christmas all sharing the same strengths and afflictions. Might be harder to visualize when you come by a big family, but you're still probably only picturing a few dozen people maximum. There are hundreds of vampires in a clan, maybe more. Oof. That's a big thing. Whoever they are, whatever that means, I have no idea what to expect. But tonight is different. I'm free. All my worries from a month ago feel like they belong to someone else. Finally, Things are looking up. Hey, chapter two is done. Hooray. Oh, March 2020. Back at it again at Big Beat Burger. Familiar sounds, familiar smells, familiar faces. Yet again, I'm recalling that night when everything finally seemed to change for the better. I mean, it's not like I wasn't expecting anything to go 
back to the old depressing normal. Even in the thick of it, the rational part of me recognized my state as- Oh, shoot. Recognized my state as temporary. Sorry, I didn't see that. Alright, cool. But with these highs, there's always a hope that it won't end. Or maybe that an ego death will finally occur. Ooh, ego deaths. Interesting. Be satisfied, you stupid fucking bitch. I command you. I mean, that's the thing, though, with things like this. You become satisfied with something for too long, then all of a sudden you want more, either because you get bored of what you have, or you yearn for more, just because you're always yearning for something. So, I don't, I don't blame you, lady. Here's all the logical evidence for why you should be satisfied. Here's the obvious direction for your life. Here's a detailed explanation of how you should treat the people that care for you. No dice. I always fall back into the same old habits. It's like they were encoded deep in my DNA. The aimlessness, the powerlessness, the spiritual exhaustion, these goddamn fast food trips. Yeah, because she doesn't need to eat now, right? So I, I guess it's because she stole... To be fair, you are a new vampire. You're not fully used to certain things. So it makes sense that you would roll back into the things that you're used to until you finally start to... Your brain finally starts to kick into the fact that you can do whatever you want. The stupid fucking self-loathing. Now amplified whenever I drink somebody's blood. Maybe I should just blame it all on the misfortune of my birth. You do this social climbing until you dissociate, and then you are just the this untethered, constantly frustrated ball of dumb desires. That sounds... relatable, actually. You're a very relatable character. <laughs> wow. I'm finding a lot of things out about this game. Except that, that I'm some sort of a mortal right now, and I need to figure out what to do next. I watched this obscure Asian movie once. Eli Eli Lima Sabachta. I probably butchered that name. Starring Tadano. T Tadanobu Asano. One of the coolest guys in the world. He plays this Mersbau like figure. A legendary noise musician. There's this mysterious virus spreading around the world causing despair and mass suicides. A rich CEO's granddaughter gets sick and longs to die, so he spends a fortune searching for the cure. Turns out Asano and his friend, played by this violent onsen geisha guy, are traveling through Japan, searching the corpse-strewn towns and fields for any unique item that can produce beautiful sounds. As it turns out, the avant-garde walls of noise they create are able to heal the infected. The CEO begs the band to help, offering them all the money they want, but for some reason they refuse. Through a series of flashbacks, concerts, and vignettes, a mystery unfolds. Eventually, we realize that Asano's music is not just a remedy. It's also a cause of the virus. Whenever it connects with people, they get this hunger for more extreme, more novel experiences. And eventually, they hit a wall. Nothing can satisfy them anymore. They lose their will to live. Not even the musicians are spared from this curse. They know the end will come sooner or later. The girl is saved by a mind-blowing concert, but the tragedy is merely postponed, not averted. The last shot of a Jesus-like Asano, silently considering his role as savior and destroyer, stayed with me. The form of the film is abrasive. Little to no narrative coherence, some weird cartoonish creative choices, the Japanese noise soundtrack, the very freeform and hard-to-understand weave of themes. But at this point, movies like this are all that truly connect with me. I actually want to watch this movie. If it's, if this is a real movie. 
I would love to watch this movie if it was a real thing. It sounds immensely interesting. I'm the New York City representative of the La Sombra clan now, also known as the Night Clan. They're masters of shadows who cast distorted reflections and make modern tech go haywire in their presence. Ooh. So let's see what the clan La Sombra says. That's us, the Night Clan. Other kindred call us magisters, ab abyss mystics, or turncoats, if they want to drive home the fact that many La Sombra switched sex in recent years. The way Karen... Saren? We'll call her Saren. The way Saren told the story, we used to be the brains behind the Sabbat, a pretty nasty group working in opposition to the Camarilla. They've since left for the Middle East for the most part, but a sizable chunk of my clan opted out and changed sides. Traditionally, we were entrenched in the Catholic Church back in Europe, but not for mystical reasons. Our path was that of coercion and puppetry. So pulling the strings of important religious leaders was just a means to an end. Ooh, I'm liking this universe. This is this is a very interesting universe, the World of Darkness. I, I gotta really jump into this more. It seems like there's a lot of interesting stories that are told in this that I'm missing out on. Um, the Night Clan is also borderline Darwinian in their philosophy about embracing new members. The shittiest period of my life was fully orchestrated by Saren in order to see if I was good Lasombra material. They do not care for losers who just take it lying down. Then there's the dark. I'm still coming to grips with it, but apparently shadows aren't just absences of, absences of light to us. There are openings into some kind of hell, and we can wield them or even use them to contact the dead. The downside? We share a classic vampire feature in that we don't really have clear reflections. This also transfers to not playing well with cameras, and by extension, having issues dealing with technology in general. Ooh. Cool. Um. Alright, we already read this. Oh god, another dictionary sect. Last year, a few months before I was embraced, the La Sombra had joined with the Camarilla, the biggest and most traditional sect in the vampire world. Okay, what's a sect? A group of vampires tied not by lineage but by ideology. The two most notable examples are the Anarchs and the Camarilla. Unsurprisingly, these two are also in direct opposition and are drifting further apart all the time. I mean, yeah, that makes sense. The two groups actually used to fight each other, but our leaders found some intel that made them reconsider their strategy. So they sent a diplomatic mission to parlay with their historical enemies. Oh, that was weird. The deal they got in Chicago was simple. An unlife for an unlife. For every La Sombra vampire allowed in the Ivory Tower, one La Sombra vampire has to meet their ultimate end. Oh, what's the Ivory Tower? Another name for the Camarilla, usually used in a less social, official, occasionally derogatory context. Oof. Good to know. Um... I still remember the name of the woman who met her final death so I could begin my unlife. Her name was Hester Reed, a sworn enemy of the Camarilla, a guerrilla fighter who spent decades opposing them. What's a final death? Wow, a lot of dictionary terms this episode. Uh, death for mortals is defined as the total cessation of all biological activities. But for vampires being undead, face two moments of, un of dying. The first, when their mortal life ends and a second final one when they truly cease to even exist. Usually involves rapid decomposition of the body, up to and including turning to dust if you're old enough, as if time has finally caught up with you. Oh, so like a normal vampire death. Okay. She was someone with far better principles than mine, from what I've gathered. Well, whoever she was, her execution by my sire served to convince the NYC elites to give us La Sombra a chance. Then they set out to look for a mutually agreed-upon candidate who'd become the clan's rep in the city. Oh, there's a lot of text here. My sire searched for someone who gave the impression she was more than she appeared. The local court was looking for someone they could walk all over. After long negotiations, they decided I was a good compromise. <laughs> that sucks! Now I feel so bad for her, man. Oh my god. Uh, the court. 
the kindred hierarchy of rule, basically feudalism by another name. You have a prince at the top, a primogen beneath him or her, a sheriff who has also served, to, who, who also answers to the prince, and so on. Matters are handled at secret sanctuaries called Elysiums. Note, the structure applies at the city level. Beyond that, the Camarilla's organization gets absurdly Byzantine. Oh god, that's terrifying. Um... They proceeded to systematically destroy my entire life, just to make me show I was psychologically strong enough to join their ranks. The, tone, the turncoat special, they called it. Somehow, I succeeded. And it eventually led me right back to where I started. Sigh. I stop writing and put my pen down. Oh. She might be another vampire. Um, let's see. Will that be all? Yes, Miss Duval. I hope you enjoy your stay in London. Oh, I very much doubt I will. Just like every cultured person, I think the only good Englishman is a dead Englishman. Fucked up serial cover. Flippered scum, just get the hell out. Not interested in a small talk with someone so sociopathic as her. I finish the formalities in silence. Uh, that'll be all. Tell Kadir I said hello and farewell. Safe travels. Don't let the door hit you on the way out, psycho. Ah, well. I'm the lone Lissambra in this town, and my representation role means jack shit. No title, no perks, no whatever. Right now, I'm the court's gopher, doing all sorts of work nobody else will touch. My main duties? Being a sort of immigration officer. Ooh, that's a very interesting job, actually, for a vampire. It, I'm getting the feeling that her job is kind of like the job she had as, as a, when she wasn't a vampire and she was still, like, normal human. Where it's, like, a job, but nobody really cares about your job. It's interesting parallels um, that are going on. Anyway... See, New York is probably the biggest vampire travel hub in the USA, and definitely the biggest one on the East Coast. Almost every kindred arriving from Africa and Europe comes through here. I wonder what it is on the West Coast. It'd probably be like LA. Or San Francisco. Probably San Francisco because it's right on the water. That's actually... Hmm. I should look that up later. We should see what... In the world of darkness, what that is. The local Camarilla is nuts about bu bureaucracy and population control, so every vampire leaving or arriving in this town is supposed to check with me to inform me about their travels. See, that makes sense. That actually does make some sense, even though they're nuts about bureaucracy and population control. I want to make sure that there's no rogue vampires running around causing chaos that would disrupt this thing that they have going. Alright. Well... In theory, at least. The VIPs play by the different rules. They take care of this stuff through connections and servants. But for the smaller fish, I'm like a vampire statue of liberty. The first bloodsucker every kindred coming to NYC should see. On paper, anyway. The first after the prince, or Kadir, the primogen council. These things vary. Yeah, I'm a naturally traitorous La Sombra, so they still prefer being traditional and hands-on about these things. She's traitorous? Really? Oh, probably they're meaning, like, since she's La Sombra, she's considered... Okay. Alright, let's see. The Prince. Where the buck stops. The big boss of a given domain, usually a city. These are the kindred you don't want to cross. Those who have secured and held their claim against all other contenders. Prince is a gender-neutral title for vampires, hence NYC's head honcho, Helene Ponhard, also calls herself that. Ugh. The Plymagene Council. The prince's advisors, usually elders, though mostly the younger so-called Ansia and NYC, who represent the interests of the local kindred. Traditionally, each major clan, faction, or sect would be given a place on the council. 
This framework naturally favors the Camarilla, though anyone can bring grievances to a primogen not of their own clan. There are few other rules governing who can become a primogen, but recent decades have seen the old paradigms rapidly shifting. Locally, Prince Panhard asks the council's advice often, but it's no secret that she mostly uses the primogen to confirm a course of action she's already made up her mind about. Oh. That makes sense, I guess. She wants to make sure that everyone's on board. As I said, at the end of the day, I'm just a gopher. And this work only serves to remind me I'm not quite in. Just standing at the gate. They haven't even given me an office. I just meet everyone in public places, such as coffee shops or this fast food restaurant. Some consider this an insult and lash out at me, but luckily most of them understand we're in the same boat. Only here because we're curs who need to be reminded of our place from time to time. Speaking of, my last client is 15 minutes late and I still have more errands to run tonight. This is getting irritating. To be honest, I should just find some self-respect and leave. But I won't. My sorry upbringing left me with this stupid sense of responsibility. Ten more minutes pass. Eventually, an unfamiliar woman appears by the door. She tells someone to stand by the door and walks in. Ooh, she looks interesting. Ooh, 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 hello. Long chestnut hair. Body stuck in her late teens by the looks of it. A fashionable scarf covering most of her face. Elegant clothes. A dignified walk. I signal her to sit in front of me, trying my best not to let my impatience show. She obliges. You're here to check in? I am Julia Sawinski, I presume. She's scanning her surroundings like we're at a circus. I hope he won't mind if I make it quick. I'm needed in Elysium. Name? What's Elysium? A courthouse for vampires, or a dis designated peaceful place we can go to seek resolution. Often hidden in plain sight in notable public buildings also used by mortals, such as museums, art galleries, and landmark government offices. NYC is pretty typical in this respect, as the current Elysium is a gallery in, in Queens called the Art Hole. That's, uh, that's cool. Neat. Catherine Weiss. I swear I've heard that name before. Someone else's description of her crosses my mind. That weird lady who owns the art hole but is never there? Weird. So it is her. Catherine Weiss, owner of the art hole, de facto headquarters of the new city Camarilla. <laughs> For fuck's sake, Julia, what are you doing calling her weird right off the bat? God knows you've already made a fool of yourself in front of enough VIPs in the city. Recover. I'm sorry. It's just that I still don't know many people there, so I have to go by the description I'm given by members of the Primogen. Well, the description is mostly correct. Outside of that one word that slightly perplexes me, pot calling the kettle black sounds like. Oh, uh, from what I gathered, it's just that your interests are rumored to be, uh, not fully aligned with the Camarillas, and it irks some folks up there. Being a keeper of the Elysium is not enough for some, I see. I suspected as much, but what can you do? She seems chill. Good. <laughs> yeah, that is good for you. Re re recovering, that's good. Anyway, uh, Catherine Weiss. Wow. Yes. Want me to spell it? People often have trouble getting it right. Uh, forgive my indiscretion. It's just that people of your stature usually don't bother checking in with me. They usually report their arrival to... 
one of the Primogen, and they make all the arrangements. I heard Prince Panhard is busy with the preparations for her big party. I assumed that if I spared her some paperwork, she'd appreciate it as a gesture of goodwill. Besides, I wanted to meet the infamous La Sombra representative out of sheer curiosity. My interest peaked once I heard about her. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. <laughs> she hit on me? <laughs> That's... Oh, my sire might not be okay with that. Lady, we just met. I don't know if this is gonna work. She looks around knowingly. Unique circumstances. Yes, uh, Prince Helen Penhard had uh, trouble justifying the exorbitant rent my property would need. That's little pennies for her. And as far as I know, she's been sitting on an empty property since last year. Looks like they've got it out for you. Bad. That's what I assumed, but it's nice to get a confirmation. Well, it's not like my clan is ever particularly popular in these parts. At least, that's what I've heard. Sins of the fathers and so on. Yes, just to make sure. You've never met Hester, but you know her. I do know I wouldn't be here if not for her. Have you two met? No, I only heard of her once or twice. We had similar outlooks on many issues, although we tended to come up with completely different solutions. In any case, I think it's meaningful that Hester died so that you could live. They feared her. Now they fear you. And that's why they're keeping you down. If anyone who's not a VIP said this to me, I'd laugh in their face. Oh, I get what she's doing. She's trying to bury, to buy my favors. Best not to act like I'm easy to please. Stick to business. Well, time will tell. In the meantime, I'll need you to help me out with my documentation. Of course. So, where are you coming from? Washington, D.C. She says it the way people in Hollywood movies say it. The way that suggests her Washington is wildly different from the Washington you and I would see. What were you doing there? Take a guess. Government work? Write that down. It ought to amuse Helen a little bit. If you say so, date and arrival. She takes a plane ticket out and slides it toward me. It's all here. 1 a.m. Got it. Method of transit? Plane. Purpose of visit? Meeting with... Meeting with Prince ought to work just fine. I guess... Estimated duration of visit? Undefined. Right in six months if you really need to. Place of accommodation? Conditions of intended... Of it... Bleh. Conditions of intended stay? The art hole. Conditions should be adequate. You tell me. I tend to be happy with our, our Airbnb. Home sweet home? I'm not certain that I ever felt particularly at home here. That makes two of us. Curious. Do you have nothing holding you here? The face of a blonde-haired friend appears in my mind's eye, then vanishes. There's nothing holding me anymore. I see. A prolonged silence. She stares into my eyes, and I have turned to stare. She's studying me. It's unnerving, but I do my best not to turn away. Eventually, she smiles. Didn't you say you were short on time? Oh god, yes, Kadar will kill me. I quickly begin to collect my stuff from underneath the table. You can simply inform him I paid you a visit. He'll understand, and he'll pass it on to everyone who should be in the know. 
Do you need anything else? I'm fine. I was about to ask you that myself. You're the one asking questions here. That's all from me. Good. We will see each other soon, I hope. The party tomorrow night? I, uh... I wasn't invited. She gives me a pitying look. I understand. Well, if not given the opportunity, we should make our own. I'll be in touch. Good night, Miss Weiss. I wish you a pleasant stay. Good night. And don't rush these things. You've, ge you've got your whole on life ahead of you. And you're in a position where you can take it easy. Take your time. Get a different perspective. I nod and walk slowly out the door. When I lose sight of the restaurant, I sprint toward the subway. Slow night? Oh, Kadir. Uh, what kind of voice? A hey, Vish. You're late again, by the... Uh, wait, nah, gotta give him a good name. You're late again. Nah, nah, I already used that voice. Ah, this is hard, faking new voices, people. I wish you're late again, by the way. I hope you have a good excuse. Kader Al Asami, the mighty sh uh, the mighty sheriff of New York City, is not happy with me. No wonder. I met him in front of Elysium thirty minutes later than the time we agreed on. Oh wait, let's see what that says. Sheriff, an appointed officer who enforces the prince's erdicts, and if Kadar is any measure, a real stick in the mud. A sheriff hunts down traitors and violators of the traditions. Only the greatest offenders are typically apprehended and brought back to be judged in front of an assembled court. In lesser cases, sheriffs act as judge, jury, and executioner. So he's Judge Dredd? That, that, that's, that's, that's what I'm getting here. He's basically Judge Dredd. Okay, good to know. Don't want to piss this guy off. Yeah, well, Catherine fucking Weiss decided to arrive fashionably late. A likely story. She's supposed to be out of the city. If you think I'm pulling your leg, boss, feel free to check my report. I pass him all the official papers, the way I do every night. Kadir stares me down for a good few seconds, then his steely gaze softens. You're serious? Weiss in McDonald's with the mask and elegant clothes, surrounded by the smell of French fries and hamburger patties. <laughs> That must have been one hell of a sight. Technically, it was BBB, not McDonald's. But yeah, God, I made such a fool of myself. First thing I did, I quoted somebody calling her a weirdo. I wanted to die on the spot. <laughs> Serves you right, you walking foul pa. Foul pass? I don't know how you say that word. I've been trying to teach you to control your tongue, but you never learn. It's a new gaif every week with you. Still, there's good news and bad news. The good news is, Catherine has a fondness for vampires of humble beginnings. Probably why she decided to see you in your, shall we say, natural habitat. She's one of those rich art scene assholes who seek out working class cred? I did say something about watching your tongue. The bad news is she's also very astute, so she can recognize a moron like you straight away. Uh, you never stood a chance at oppressing her. Oh, shut up! You still need me for anything here? I'll get on st it straight away. I wouldn't be standing out here chatting with y you if I hadn't taken care of my duties. Thirty minutes is all it took to finish preparations for the big party. I'm about to see everyone off. Sorry. Couldn't be helped, I suppose. But it's more your loss than mine. I just wanted some company tonight, and you could really use the chance to appear here on official duties so everyone can get to know your face. <laughs> Heaven knows your fast food job isn't going to get you anywhere. You need to... what do they call it? Hustle? You don't need to tell me that, but it's not like being paraded around for a bunch of blue-blooded douchebags is... He somehow manages to give me a painful nudge in the back without so much as a hint of visible movement. 
Language, you fool. They're coming out. Just stand here in silence for five minutes and focus on not embarrassing yourself any further, will you? I like how his voice changed while I've been talking, but I think it's just because my throat's really sore and I can't do certain things. Got it. The first two silhouettes appear in the doorway of the art hole. An old man in a wheelchair, pushed forward by his young servant. Haven't seen either of them before. Oh god, he looks like he's gonna murder somebody. Jeez. Mr. Payne, the night is still young. Hope you find the rest of it pleasant. Payne, the wheelchair. I've heard about him. Addison P Payne, one of the American Camarilla's main connections to the government in Wall Street. Disabled in quite a few ways, needs a servant to even communicate. I'd be full of resentment if I was embraced in this condition, but apparently Payne is nothing but grateful for his immortality. He keeps writing fervent defenses of the traditions in Camarilla customs. Hope you're enjoying your stay in New York City. <clears throat> he wordlessly shakes Kadir's hand, but doesn't even deign to acknowledge me. At least his servant gives me a small bow. I return it. They leave. Kadar turns to the next person leaving. Hi, Regent. Can't wait to see you in your outfit. Spare me, Sheriff. Oh, Aisling Sturbridge. Yeah, she definitely looks like this kind of voice. These fancy dress parties cause me enough suffering without your help. I can only hope you haven't conspired with Helen to embarrass me with this gift. She points to a shrink-wrapped set of clothes she's carrying inside her coat. Kadir smirks briefly. I didn't have to. As you well know, Prince Panhard displays a considerable foresight in the manner of party planning. Yes, if there's one thing she's deathly serious about, it's frivolities. A recognizably mortal quality, especially for a prince. We ought to celebrate it, not oppose it. Don't worry, Sheriff. I'm a big girl who knows her etiquette. I will play your game, amuse the crowd for a bit, and, re and return to my study as fast as possible. Aisling Sturbridge, High Regent of the Chantry of the Five Boroughs, a hero of the Battle of New York, the biggest warlock in town. Could be a prince herself if she didn't have her eyes on a bigger prize. Oh, wow, really? Now we gotta read all this stuff. Uh, Regent. Regents are the principals at the schoolhouses of the Tamir, also known as chantries. Every chantry has a regent who oversees the education of all the Tamir in attendance there. Regents may also hold positions on the Primogen Council, but be active in the clan's strategic defenses. Wow. Decent. Chantry. Where the Tamir hang out. Lots of crusty books and smoking beakers type of place, I imagine. <laughs> clan Tamir. Named after the 8th century hermetic mage whose followers for a brief period terrorized the world. Members of the clan Tamir today are only able to practice their reality bending thaumaturgic arts after consuming fresh blood. This is because the Tamir of old fucked of old fucked up in their relentless pursuit of immortality and were condemned. They have recently fallen into a great schism of competing houses all vying for the title of rightful heir to their namesake's legacy. All about their rare ancient artifact life. Nicknames like Warlocks, Hematics, or Transgressors. Ooh, hoo, hoo, hoo. We're getting some interesting people now. Uh, the thing is, nobody knows what that prize is. They only know it has something to do with the goal of her... Thumaturgical? Thumaturgical? I don't know. Research. Thumaturgical. I'll just call it that. Whoever tried to find out what it is, failed violently oh i'm sure you're going to have fun miss sawitsky here just informed me catherine weiss is back in town safe to assume she will join our festivities you're kidding me um it was her for sure yellow scarf covering her face chestnut hair slight accent introduced herself as the owner of the art hole fits what i've heard 
Wheeze. Excellent. I'd love to catch up with her. The barely concealed venom in her voice clearly suggests that, in fact, she'd hate to catch up with her. Ooh, we got some uh, history behind these two. Lovely, lovely. Yes, it looks like tomorrow night would be very special. But for now, I bid you adieu. And she's gone. Like a bat out of hell. She'll be coming to the morning comes. <laughs> Is there some kind of story between Aisling and Weiss that I should be aware of? Uh oh. Dictionary got updated. You could say that. High Regent Sturbridge once attempted to call for a blood hunt on Weiss. What's a blood hunt? Blood hunt. A punishment sentencing a vampire to final death at the fangs of their peers. Oof. Oof. The code of the kindred and the system for punishing transgression is the law of retaliation. Oh. So I guess she used to... So what? from what I'm reading from this, maybe we should try to retaliate at one point. Hmm. Interesting. I wonder what that was about. Wow. Why? Yeah, I, I kind of want to know that, too. Oh, no. Five different versions. This lady gets around. I've heard five different versions of the story, and all of them seem plausible. Catherine, Catherine's relationship with the city is odd, to say the least. But hush for now. He's obviously trying to kill the conversation, and the appearance of Thomas Archero gives him a perfect way out. Oh, who's this? Mr. Archero? Ah, El Asami. Keep up the good work, eh? F of course. Thomas Archero, an architect by trade. Oops. He's a herald, a member of Prince Panhard's inner circle. An eccentric whose thoughts seem to be ten times faster than his words. So he's an artist. <laughs> it's basically what it is. Uh, Harold, a kindred gossip master extraordinaire, will often trade wisdom for favors or political gain. While harpy originated as an insult, some have taken the term back and wear it as a badge of pride. After all, who doesn't need a friend who has dirt on everyone? Ooh, he might come in useful handy later. Um, take care on your way to your haven, Mr. Arturo. Oh. Haven. A girl has to hide from the sun somewhere, right? Tends to be at Dakota's place for me naturally lately. Nobody likes to randomly stumble upon me when I sleep there. Hmm. So a haven is somewhere where they sleep. That makes sense. Where they live. Oh, yes, yes. He disappears into the night. Well, that was brief. Maybe I should stand in their way. That might force them to properly acknowledge my existence. I mean, you're lucky they said hi to you at all, miss. <laughs> Just saying. You severely underestimate their dedication to ignoring whelps like you. Uh, whelps. Not much... Not much different from than the archaic human usage. Whelp is now is how you refer to your kid when they're fucking up. Kader loves to use it to put me down from time to time. Ah, so it seems like. So that makes sense though. The higher up vampires don't even want to look at her or talk to her. So yeah, actually getting a getting a high or whatever is a lot. So she she does underestimate their dedication to ignoring them. And just in case you're serious. I beg of you, don't. I've been meaning to ask you this for a while now, but uh, never had the opportunity. You really hate Arturo's guts, don't you? Uh-oh. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> More tangled webs that are weaving into this. <laughs> oh jeez. It's one person after the other in this game. Uh, he carefully measures his diplomatic response. <laughs> I have no strong feelings about Thomas Arturo whatsoever. 
Yeah, well, considering you're always listing positives about every local Camarilla representative under the moon, you might as well have called him a cunt. <laughs> I mean, that's basically what he's doing. <laughs> Language whelp. And as for Arturo, I'll share my opinion about him as soon as I come up with one that sticks for more than a week. A group of kindred emerges from the art hole, rushing towards the street. Only a noble-looking woman stops next to us. She's wearing a hijab, but curiously enough, doesn't hide her hair beneath it. Primogen? Primogen? I'm gonna say Primogen. Primogen? If you were rude enough to stare, you'd quickly notice the cloth serves mostly to cover up her horrifying scars. Oh! Wow! Yeah, there's some scars there. She looks she looks cute though. Kadir. Oh, and young Julia. I'm doing my best not to stare, because Samari is one of the few NYC Camaria figures who hasn't been an asshole to me yet. <laughs> oh, dictionary update. Clan Banu Hakim. The Banu Hakim I don't know if I said that correctly, I apologize if I didn't say that correctly called Asamites in the past, but that's basically a slur at this point, are a new addition to the Camarilla, only having joined a few years ago. Before that, they were independent from both the Cam and the Anarchs, and they were used as assassins for hire. Supposed to be very good at that job, too. Nowadays, it looks to me like they've rebranded themselves as Keepers of the Law, which still gives them the occasional chance to hunt somebody down, but, lone, but no longer for payment in blood, as used to be the tradition. Or at least, not overtly. The one member of the clan that I know well, Samaria. Uh, Samira. Samaria. Why did I say her name wrong? Samira. S-A-M-I-R-A. -A. Samira. Wow, okay. I am terrible at this today. I apologize. Uh, Samira is pretty cagey about this aspect of the Banu Hakim. But I've learned from a few other sources that members of the clan have a bit of a drinking problem. Once they taste another kindred's blood, they find it hard to stop. Oh. That's good to know. Their inclusion in the Camarilla seems to have stirred some discontent among the Tremere, as the lawmen also use a form of blood sorcery to boost their abilities and observe different rituals. Some of them clearly religiously motivated, owned in no small part to the fact that the clan has been traditionally tied to Islam and the Middle East in general. Very interesting. Okay. Good to know. Still here. Did the prince require the clan of the hunts council in some matter? Yes. I advised her that no matter how hard she tries, she couldn't expect me to wear a different costume tomorrow night. Oh. That's a lot of words there. She's the Banu Hakim Primogen. Just like the Lasambra, their clan was independent from the Camarilla until relatively recently. However, they negotiated a better deal than we did. They have a primogen, for one. Oof. Bad blood. Quite literally, between them. Hailing from the Middle East, the Banu Hakim are drawn to the practice of justice. The rules must be upheld, and every transgression punished. Uh, they don't have much say in NYC, but the prince often seeks their judgment. It's just good PR. I trust she was... understanding. Those are beautiful clothes. Oh. Either a man of fine culture or he likes her. Interesting. Thank you so much. I'm eager to see the outfit you came up with. And how are you, Julia? Have you seen any lights at the end of the tunnel? Uh-oh. Same old, same old, Samira. Still wandering in the dark, bumping every shin every two steps. Sorry to hear that. I trust you're pestering the prince and your superiors to improve your standing. It's... uh... it's a process. Oh, Julia, Julia. You won't achieve anything if you don't keep reaching for it. Kadir, weren't you supposed to teach her the ropes? I'm trying to, Primogen, but with this child, it's always a process. I can only wish you good luck, then. Good night, Julia. Good night, Kadir. 
Good night. Have a safe trip. The art hole has to be almost empty by now. Ah, <laughs> I called it. I called it. Good work, Julia. You're you're a good one. You know, you know how to spot them. You like her, don't you? Stop with your class clan act, whelp. It only serves to revel deep insecurities or reveal. God, I cannot. I cannot read today. It only serves to reveal deep insecurities. There we go. Wow, that's harsh. It's factual. Were I as harsh as you claim. She did tell us both to call her Samira, but you're still keeping your distance with that primogen primogen shit. Watch your profanity, and don't project your fantasies onto me. I won't give you a lesson about professional boundaries, but I suspect the way you will eventually learn it will be extremely unpleasant. Am I interrupting something, dear folks? Oh, this this guy. Who is this dude? He he looks like I I uh, I just played uh, Miles Morales on PS4 and I beat it in like a week. And this guy looks like uh, I, I forget his name, but he looks like the guy from that game. <laughs> Even though I'm constantly pestering him, Kadir's composure's unshaken. His response comes swift and unfazed. Not at all, Mr. Vander Weed Whedon. Heading back to your office. You know me, my dear Sheriff. Where else would I go? Now, that's curious. Even though Carter Vander Weyden is a primogen as well. Malkavian, to be precise. I don't hear Kadir address him as such. You know, I, I bet you he doesn't like the Malkavian dude. I bet you he, he has very little respect for him, and that's why he doesn't call him Primogen. But because he likes S Samira, he calls her Primogen because, one, he likes her, and two, it's a respect thing. Uh, Clan Malkavian. Oh, wow. This is a wordy, too. The Clan of the Moon has earned its reputation as a place for total psychopaths. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, we're getting into those guys of the Vampire Clan now. Oh, boy. Um, yet there is a twisted kind of reason to the madness of the children of Malkov. Their condition seems to stem from gazing too deeply into the web of connections that govern the world. From learning too much, seeing too much, feeling too much. Blood is how they self-medicate. All Malkavians suffer a mental breakdown following their embrace. Often this is an ex exacerbation of a disorder, or disorders, that are already present, but sometimes it is entirely new. Best described as a unstable, there is no telling when a Malkavian will snap or drop some unexpectedly wise insight. Called oracles, jesters, or visionaries if they're being nice. Madmen, liabilities, <laughs> and lunatics if you're not. Dang. Well, okay then. The voice fits in perfectly then. Hope to see you tomorrow night. Oh, I will absolutely show up. Oh, his voice changed. Oh, well, I kind of like this new one. Provided I can, but just in case, I already apologized for not making it to the prince. Simply drowning in work these days. Oh, it's perfect that... Oh, wow. Wow, he has an interesting voice. The rhythms, tempo, and intonation patterns of his voice are so familiar. Half of it sounds like JFK, the other half exactly like Barack Obama. Just like his appearance, it all feels so fake. Yeah, I can't do that voice, so I'm just going to keep doing what I'm doing. He's old money, of course. Comes from a long line of Dutch merchants who originally settled in the New York region. Runs a wildly successful law office. Rubs elbows with elites of both kindred and kind varieties alike. Oh, kind. Is that the, um, mortals? Ah, that's what I thought. A derogatory way for vampires to refer to mortals. Comes from kindred and kind. Just remember that kind rhymes with swine and you'll get the picture. Ooh, wow. Okay. So we're getting a little bit of, um... Gosh, what... What was that really old movie? Daybreakers. So it's so it's like Daybreakers, the movie with um, William Defoe, where 
basically the vampires in the future they like took over the world and humans are treated like swine or like cattle that they just eat okay makes sense it sucks that i have to wait for this to finish typing out before i start speaking it takes so long uh, he seems perfect in every way and that's why he's so unnerving he's a child of malkov and must be blighted with some affliction but whatever it is he doesn't let it show Hard not to wonder what he's hiding. The celebrations are planned to last all week. Surely you will find the time? I pray I will, my good man. I pray I will. In case you need to reach me, you know where to find me. Have a good one. I guess because his voice fluctuates all the time, I guess it doesn't matter if his voice sounds different every single time I talk him. Okay, that's fine. I'm okay with that. He doesn't even register my presence before leaving. Sometimes I think they're all still hoping I will simply go away. As Carter drives away in his limousine, Kadir shakes his head. I called it. Wow, it's easy to call what happens in this game. Well, for now. I did get a bad end in the beginning. You wanted to hear about which member of New York City's Camarilla I dislike the most? Yes. He shoots me a knowing glance and smirks. Too bad. They're all my dear colleagues, and I deeply respect every single one of them. Ah, you sly dog. <laughs> sure you do. Wouldn't want to blurt out something that could lock you out of Mr. Vander Waden's legal services, would you, you ass-kisser? I do expect to find myself in need of a good defense attorney when my broke, incompetent, and foul-mouthed assistant finally pushes me over the edge. I like their dynamic. These two are fun. <laughs> rude. How rude. Do you still need me here? I still need to swing by St. Patrick's tonight. Don't worry. We're almost done. The prince is coming out. The captain is the last person to leave the ship, huh? And there she is. Oop. Helen Panhard, the big kahuna, as someone I once knew would call her. The de facto ruler of New York City and a self-professed pa patron of the arts. Wow. She looks like it, too. I need a voice for her. Kadir, a penny for your thoughts. You should be pleased to hear the High Regent has resigned her fate, my prince. Mr. Vanden Weeden is decidedly not. I suspect he will be too busy to join the festivities all the week through. Excellent. She turns to me. Miss Sawinski, weren't you supposed to accompany our good sheriff in his duties tonight? There was an unexpected change of plans. Catherine Weiss is back in the city. Catherine is here. Now that's a welcome surprise. But what does it have to do with you, Miss Sawinski? She said she didn't want to trouble you with all the paperwork regarding her arrival, Prince Panhard. It's all been taken care of. Kadir has already been informed of everything. That's certainly a nice gesture, but wait a minute now. Where exactly did you meet her? In a fast food restaurant, my prince. I see. Helen rubs her eyes. <laughs> oh, Catherine and her love for proletarian amusement. I suppose it will be a source of amusing antidotes this week. <laughs> I like how he told her that, and, and the prince is just like, God damn it, Catherine. <laughs> if we want to avoid these situations in the future, it might be a good time to discuss offering Miss Sawinski an office of her own. We'll get to it eventually. There are more pressing matters at hand. The festivities start tomorrow, and there's still so much to be done. Will you make sure the art hold is secure before leaving? Certainly, my prince. Have a good night. Good night, Kadir. Good night, Miss Sawinski. 
We'll talk about your work soon. Don't worry. Of course. Good night, Prince Panhard. A chauffeur escorts her to a limo. There's an awkward silence between me and Kadir until the car disappears around the corner. More pressing matters, huh? A penny for your thoughts, Sheriff? I'm certain an image of a keeper of the Elysium stuck in a fast food restaurant will linger in Prince Panhard's mind. You're far closer to your goal than you were a few minutes ago. I'm pretty sure I've heard you say something to that effect a few times now. And I stand by my words. Rome wasn't built in a day, Julia. As a Camarilla loyalist, don't you think it sucks that the Ivory Tower is so hell-bent on showing disrespect to my clan, they're actually willing to make fools of themselves in the process? We've all had to endure our own hazing rituals, but yes, the, certain, the current situation is not ideal. Whatever. You need a hand closing up the Elysium? I'll manage. It's getting late. Better run. Some shadow in Chicago is probably impatient to get a copy of the reports you've given me. You've pleased one master, now it's time to please the other. Yeah. Here's the thing about working for two masters. Neither of them really thinks of you as their own. Not knowing how to reply, Kadir shrugs. I wave to him goodbye and head for the subway. Oh, that's beautiful. Look at that subway. Not Subway. Cathedral. Wow. I need to get... I need to eat something. I haven't eaten at all today. I haven't even drinking coffee. <laughs> this is... This is embarrassing. I apologize. Um, when I reach St. Patrick's Cathedral, I'm greeted by a voice that grates on me like teeth on tinfoil. Benoit. Oh. Well, well, well. The prodigal daughter returns. Oh my god, no. This is the one thing I didn't want to happen. Julia, please. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Uh-huh. Where's Father Leonard? His clergy duties kept him from getting here on time. He sent me to apologize in his name and keep you company for a few minutes. That's the second thing he ought to apologize for. He just wants his flock to live in unity. I am more than willing to oblige. Why won't you? For the last time, I'm not a part of his flock. We have a purely professional arrangement. I know you see it that way. The Knight Clan's tendency to stick close to the Catholic Church is their greatest virtue. But they still consider this relationship purely instrumental. This is why we need kindred like you to bring the spiritual change to your clan. To make them understand God's precious gifts. The closer they'd get to the light, the greater their shadows would become. Again, with this insufferable sermonizing. Benoit Siegel here is a local nut job and an ex-artist. A degenerate who had some sort of complete mental breakdown in the 90s. To recover, he took to religion for solace and guidance. Interesting. So what do they call a degenerate? Oh, okay. Clan Torador. I thought they were going to talk about degenerates. Uh, the most artistic of the kindred. The Torador draw their ranks from the creative class, ranging from painters to digital content creators. The Clan of the Rose boasts many former famous actors, singers, writers, dancers, and even lauded sex workers. The goal is, of course, only to fill the Torador clan with the best of the best, but its shallow fixation on youth and beauty has caused many hasty decisions. Probably more one-hit wonders under their roof than they care to admit. Also plenty of insufferable divas and influencers. Kadir is one of them, but surprisingly he doesn't show many of their regular traits, maybe other than keeping himself impeccably slick at all times. Interesting! Um, that's... This is so cool, learning about all these different vampire clans. At first, he, he proclaimed his readiness to devote the rest of his unlife to studying Nodism. After a few years, though, he changed his mind and joined the Catholic Church instead. Nodism? 
The religious beliefs and studies pertaining to the origins of kindred and the myth of Cain, the alleged OG vampire. <gasps> the legacy of Cain? As in... Nosgoth? Legacy of Cain series? Guys, can I just go on a tiny little rant here and say that we need Legacy of Cain to come back? We need a remake of the well a total remake of the first game that was on ps1 just a full-on remaster of all like soul reaver legacy of Cain, blood omen blood omen 2 defiance make some new stuff oh i need it i need it so bad I'm, I'm so into that series right now and i would love to see that come back as luck would have it his neophyte's zeal found a major target in me when I first met him, I was stupid enough to tell him I was raised Catholic and still identified as such. Somewhat. He immediately pictured me as some sort of a force for change within the Camarilla and set out to put me back on the righteous path. Now he won't stop preaching to me, apparently, until I become a nun. Jeez. Remember... The darkest place is directly beneath the candle. You turncoats have this unfortunate predisposition to find salvation right within your grasp, and then lose your way in the shadows. Christ, once he starts, he just won't stop. I guess it's time to bring out the big guns. By the way, I was meaning to ask, got any news about Sophie Langley? A painful grimace crosses his face, but doesn't linger. Kind of rude to change the subject, you know. Rude? I'm just looking for a topic both sides of this conversation would care about. You know, like any guide on etiquette says you should. Salvation is a topic close to anyone's heart, whether they admit it or not. And it's pretty bold of you to assume I still care about Langley. I'm... I, I, I do not assume. I'm certain you do. The second she retires from the public eye, you stop acting like Jesus-era Kanye and start acting like Jesus' King-era Kanye. Coincidence? I've never had a Jesus-era. Do people really call it that? Here's how it's going to work. Tell me what you know, I'll tell you what they say. And keep in mind, I didn't know she was your sire till a few nights ago. Hell, I haven't even met her. He winces a bit at me saying hell, but lets it go. Sure. I figure you would have prodded that wound long ago if you knew. What do you care, anyway? Better to let you drone on about your tormented past than to let you carry on with your good missionary shtick. Professional curiosity. Once a journalist, always a journalist. He scratches his head, then exhales at a sad mockery of a chuckle. Fine, then. I'll do my best to make it short. Just like you said, Sophie Langley, every New York's kindred's beloved socialite, was my sire. We first met sometime after World War II. Wow, he's that old? Wow. I left France right before the Nazis went around the Minoy line. I struggled to keep my siblings alive with my art. Watched my brother die during the flu epidemic of 43. I was close to losing my mind. That's when she showed up. She said the sheer torment in my works caught her eye. She became my patron, allowed my talents to flourish, and supported me financially. Eventually, she embraced me. <coughs> oh man, these throat this is not good for my throat. As a well-off kindred, my artistic interests started to naturally deviate from what they used to be back when I was a poor, mortal upstart. I began to see the world the way her social circle does. And that she couldn't forgive. 
Instead of being a fun novelty, I became just another part of the Malice surrounding her. She grew distant, and then stopped seeing me altogether. I've had my share of meltdowns because of this, I won't deny that. I locked myself out of many career opportunities, but it was an important lesson. Don't trust your elders. Oof. Elders. Few centuries of unlife will net you this big kindred milestone. An elder is only considered an elder after outlasting his or her fellow vampires for roughly 200 years. By then they will have learned the rules of the great metagame of Jihad. The vast hidden war ra waged for ages between the ancient undead. Elders are the chess masters. The rest of us are only the pieces, yada yada yada. Yep. Sounds about right. Sounds very close to a, a lot of things that aren't vampir vampiric related. Uh, vampirism affects them psychologically as well. If they take an interest in you, they won't stop until they suck your soul dry and then discard you like a broken toy. For the first time since I've known him, Siegel registers to me as something other than a Bible-thumping nuisance. Is it compassion I feel? Do I find him relatable? How dreadful. <laughs> it's possible he's strategically trying to elicit sympathy. Maybe he heard about my dramatic exit from Lodestar. Or maybe he's just alluding to the way my sire left me here to fend for myself. It's only God who will never lead you astray. This is why I find your act so frustrating, Julia. You're so close to getting it, but you choose sin instead. There's the Bonite Seagull I know. Almost had me fooled. Let's get back on track. What about Langley's disappearance from the city? Her path was a road to perdition. Wherever she ended up, I doubt she's too happy about it. She had plans for the future of this city, wanted to make it her ultimate artwork. She was always the vain one. And of course, you are completely sure you have nothing to do with her disappearance. Please don't tell me you're getting at what I think you're getting at. Everybody says you've been acting like you've been trying to repent for something ever since her vanishing act. And you've got a motive. Of course I'm getting at what you think I'm getting at. Benoit shakes his head. You really have the devil in your heart, Julia. Always testing me. Just asking what everyone's thinking. Are they now? Listen, I'm familiar with a lot of the insults attached to my name in this city. Those aren't exactly compatible with the image of a ruthless killer. Killer, huh? Wow, that's interesting. I haven't said anything about killing. He scrubs his hands over his forehead and collects himself before responding. Stop picking apart every word I say in this completely unpleasant way. Here's a statement if you really want one, Miss Hercule po Poirot. Her Hercule Poirot? I think that's how I say the last name. I do believe Sophie, the way I knew her, has met her end. If she, even if she's still walking this earth. She wouldn't come back here as the same prideful aristocrat. She'd have to undergo a spiritual rebirth. Someone has reminded her of her place. Her former friends talk of her in hushed voices. Even that servant play toy of her went missing. No more Camarilla parties. She's done for. Whatever happened to her, I don't know. I swear on Jesus and his sandals, I had nothing to do with it. That's a very interesting way to swing around something. No one usually brings up footwear into that. But yes, I'm still here, and she's not. And it's not a reason to gloat, but to be more humble. I received a sign from God telling me to re-examine all the unfortunate ways I still resemble Sophie Langley. And I listened. I rejected the pride I shared with her. I renewed my vows to God, recommitted to preaching his greatness. I mean, this is why we're having this conversation in the first place. Right now. 
Wow, he just keeps talking. Right now, when I think of Langley's influence on my life, I'm grateful, because she was a sign that got me here. And, if God wills it, maybe one day you'll look at her the same way, Julia. Mental note. Whenever he circles back to this preachy tone, it's time to intervene. All right, all right, all right. If it makes you feel any better, I think that the only way a wimp like you could have hurt her was by boring her to death with Bible quotes. <laughs> now that quid pro quo, tit for tat, you were saying people still talk about me. I was curious if... Oh, look who's finally here! Stalling for time worked. Father Leonard rushes in our direction, carrying a folder of documents under his arm. I assume it's the one I came here for. Father Leonard? Christ be praised, Julia. Yesterday I was told this is how priests greet their parishioners in Eastern Europe. Forever and ever, amen. Actually, I think we said each other's lines. Never mind. Another long night? Isn't it taking a toll on you? Ah, uh, no need to worry. These days I sleep a few hours a day, short naps take care of the rest, and there's always work to be done. I apologize for being late. At least I managed to get here before you and Benoit went to each other's throats. Good. I was getting worried. Oh, who'd you take me for, father? He takes you for a total bozo, who's about... As effective as at converting people as a documentary about pedophilia in the Catholic Church. He's just too kind to say it out loud. Ouch. Hear what I have to deal with, Father? But uh, don't worry. We'll make a saint out of her yet. Forget saint. For now I'd settle for an adult in the room. Eh. <laughs> That's what you're for, passive-aggressive... <laughs> Passive aggressive much? <laughs> Excuse me. Asking for an adult in the room is not solving a problem. It's abdicating responsibility. Julia, you know exactly what I mean. So please don't get smart with me. Then don't sound like my mother, maybe. An adult in the room, Julia. All I'm asking for. Here. He gives me a folder he was carrying with him, and I pass him the reports I wrote earlier tonight. Among kindred, it is common knowledge that the Catholic Church is one of the La Sombra's greatest assets. Hell, it might even be the main one of the main reasons the Camarilla is slowly warming up to the clan. We are technologically impaired and as such woefully unprepared to face the challenges of communicating in the 21st century. Hard to handle advanced encryption when you can't even unlock a smartphone. This is where the Vatican connections enter the picture. A web of priests scattered all over the world exchange our dispatches between each other, making sure they all reach their destinations in total secrecy. Wow, they they actually have this handled pretty well. Like, surprisingly well. I was told not everyone in the Holy See is friendly to our kind, but the most shrewd and talented usually are. You could say they're like a mortal Camarilla, better than any intelligence agency. Remember what happened to John Paul I when he attempted to uncover the workings of the Institute for the Works of the Religion? Death after 33 days of papacy, rumors of CIA, and Masonic's Masonic involvement. Not that Father Leonard had anything to do with any of this. For a Catholic priest, he's alright. He'd probably have made me stay a believer a few years longer than I did had I known him as a teenager. He's one of the cool people. Uh, Leonard is intelligent, kind, helpful towards his parishioners, treats his superiors with a healthy dose of skepticism, and is not involved in any sort of political church games. That's a cool priest right there. Well, at least not beyond helping me contact my bosses in Chicago every other night or so. Yeah, I mean, you know, that seems like the last thing he needs to worry about. He knows about the kindred, and he knows about the Second Inquisition. He opted to avoid the latter in order to keep the former from oppression, because according to him, it's the right thing to do. What's the Second Inquisition? The philosophy of the war on terror applied to us kindred. Somewhere along the way, some deep state assholes decided the way to handle the existence of vampires was to treat us as terrorists. 
Yet the agents waging these operations against us often have no idea what the hell's going on because some intra-agency collaboration created to hunt us doesn't tell anyone anything unless it's need to know. Among the kindred, the term is most often abbreviated to, uh, to C. S-I. Wow. That... There's some interesting commentary in this game. I'm actually quite surprised. I mean, vampire stuff has always had a, a knack for um, uh, doing stuff and making like social commentary, political commentary. Um, I know there's got to be something wrong with him. Some selfish motivation, maybe. And I haven't nailed it down yet. But it doesn't feel like he's making an effort to hide it, so I'm giving him a pass. By the way, I hope you don't mind. I finally took the liberty of asking how your parents are doing. Thank you, Father, but you shouldn't have. Not a problem. A priest at St. Stanis Stanislaus? Stanislaus Kost Kostka? I don't know how to say that. Is a good friend. He says your parents started showing up every Sunday again. Front rows. Your father's looking better and better. It makes me feel nothing, but I still give him a token nod and a grateful smile. Thank you, Father Leonard. Now, if you'll excuse me, the sunrise is almost here. Yes, be careful, and God bless you. I'm in. Goodbye, Julia. I'll let you off the hook this time, but next time you won't be so lucky, all right? Sure. Just one more thing on my never-ending list of events I'm not looking forward to. Guess it's time to call it a night. Ah! Are we finally seeing, uh, that one that turned her into a vampire? Let's see. I'm home! Dakota? Dakota? Who was da Dakota wasn't the one that turned her. D Who's Dakota? I guess... Did I already give Dakota a voice? God, I don't even remember if I gave Dakota a voice. I'll just give her a voice. Finally! You doing all right? Fine, I guess. Why aren't you asleep? I figured it's finally time for me to become more of a night owl. We've talked about making our schedule sync better. Watch your vitamin D. I'd kill to have your skin. Would be a shame to waste it. Shouldn't have smoked so much before you got bitten, sweetheart. Should have shared your skincare routine with me back when I was still breathing. I can't just be going around sharing my one secret weapon. It's top secret stuff. MK Ultra level. Jeffrey Epstein's current whereabouts level. I'd have to kill you if I told you. <laughs> just go ahead and off me anyway. It would be a mercy kill, honestly. <laughs> Don't talk like that. Anything you want to share? Never mind. I feel a little more self-conscious than usual tonight. Don't. You want me to do your makeup before you go to sleep? No need. No need. Aren't you supposed to have some sort of big party tomorrow night? Heh. <laughs> I was involved in the backstage stuff. What makes you think I was invited? Because you're the coolest, cutest, and most all-around amazing person I know. It'd be insane not to put you on the short list. Believe it or not, most vampires are pretty insane. I mean, that's that's self-explanatory, right? I mean, we just talked about the, the group of psychopathic vampires. <laughs> I like that light thing they've got in the background. It's kind of cool. The, the one on the wall that's blinking. Interdimensional psychic vampire level insane? Because that's how crazy they'd have to be to ignore you like this. Yeah, I would say so. Fuck them, then. Big bunch of posh dicks. They hate you because they hate you. But they'll see. Wow, her voice is hard to do. I am sorry. My throat. I can't do two voices like this at once. Jesus, how do you do it? Do what? You always assault me with so much of this weird, stupid positivity that I can't react to it without completely shifting my mental attitude. How do you do it? Oh, the answer's easy. You remember how I told you we have this spiritual connection? I can sense what you feel and want. You can sense what I feel, too, if you really focus. Yeah, I think I called it a big load of bullshit. Said a girl who talks to ghosts. 
But watch this, aged Scully. I sense you feeling down, and I realize what you need really needed to end the night. She points to one of her drawers. It's the one where she keeps her supply of... Ketamine? Come on. What? No, wrong drawer. We're not meeting demons. We're meeting angels. MDMA? Ding, ding, ding. Took it half an hour ago. Perfect timing thanks to our spiritual connection. Oh, she's thinking about it. Ready to fly away? The note isn't right. I need music. Got a special SoundCloud playlist. Ready to go. Prepared specifically to uplift one Julia Sobinski. Just give me a sign and I'll press play. Jesus, you're impossible. That's why you love me. I hope. Oh. I give up. Come here. Let me have a taste of you. Wait. Is she a human? Huh. That's an interesting thought. Maybe this time the high won't end. Oh. That was night three. I guess we rest. Do, 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 do. There we go. We're on night four. Wow, that, um... That was interesting. I, I wonder if she's dating a human and that's why people... Don't like her? I mean, I, I know I'm making this call a little early, but... I mean, yeah, they don't like her because she's new and stuff, but I wonder if it's really because... Um, she's dating a human, or maybe they don't know that she's dating a human. Mm. I leave Dakota's apartment as soon as the sun goes down. Well, I mean, I would assume so, you're a vampire. Yesterday was fun, but I always feel a little nervous when I spend too much time with her. She never lets me escape from being the center of attention. It's exhausting. At least the less time I spend with her the happier she is to see me again. It's a tricky act to balance, though. I'm grateful for her presence in my life, but never mind. No, I, I understand what you're saying. You're, you, you appreciate having a person looking forward to seeing you come home, but from what we know of Julia, she's one of those people who doesn't like being the center of attention, and she's just kind of that personality where she likes being on her own most of the time. What's on my list of chores tonight? Ah, yes. One thing. Don't show up for the party at the art hall. Oh, no. Well, this is a rare night when I don't have anything to do. Might as well take a trip around the city and see what's up. And maybe fix myself a little drink while I'm at it. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Oh! There's, um... I think there's only one... Oh, no, there's two things to do. Okay. Uh, let's see what we got here. I need to break out of this mood, go somewhere I never visit, see something I tend to avoid. Think, Julia. What is the least you place to go and live a little? Or, in life I wasn't especially fond of parks. Now, as a kindred, I can finally see the appeal. Past midnight, they become a surprisingly good hunting ground. Hmm. Uh, I want to be as less suspicious as possible, but at the same time, I'm curious to see how that would go. Let's go to the park. There's a good hunting ground. Oh, that's a beautiful background. Except for the trash that's just... <laughs> oh, there's even people walking in the background. Oh, that's cool. There's like a little guy on the left. If you look on the very left, there he goes. He's walking back and forth. That's cool. Uh, Van Cortland Park. Funny. I never knew how much I could miss nature until I got stuck in this urban jungle for good. The sight of familiar green surroundings slowly floods my mind with disjointed images. Back from when I just moved to NYC and was still in awe of it. Ah, uh, reminisce. Why not? No, suppress the memories. No, 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 no. Sh sh shake it off. We're a vampire now. I shake the feeling off. This is no time for fantasizing about the good old days. Most of which were probably never that good to begin with. I came here for a reason. A burning heat reaches my fingers. I flicker the butt away and immediately take another cigarette out of the pack before proceeding through the parade ground. 
The faint sound of shoes tapping against the concrete interrupts my contemplative mood. Just what I was hoping for. I hurriedly finish my smoke and take a step back, blending in with the shadows. A lone jogger runs in into and out of the pale lamplight, completely lost in his thoughts. All dressed up in top-shelf sportswear, wiry muscles clearly visible under the skin-tight outfit. And his exposed neck. I get the urge back under control. For now. Back when I was alive, I'd rely on the breathe-in, breathe-out exercise. However, nowadays, breathing costs a premium. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you're a vampire now, so I mean... Just as I regain my composure, the jogger stops by the flickering lantern and takes a glance at his smartphone. His body tenses noticeably as he answers a call. Moving in on him right now would, of course, inevitably involve the caller hearing the assault happen. No reason to make things complicated. I'll take my time. I cautiously get closer and closer till I can finally overhear his words. Should expect the bad news, I know. But Jesus, Tasha, he's nine! He struggles and fails to sound calm. No, she doesn't know yet. I'll tell her when I get home. I, I need to think this through. I notice a lanyard half stuck into a pocket with the Bronx Times logo slapped on it. They, they say there's no cure. Yeah, I heard something about experimental treatments in Ro Rochester? Rochester? Sorry if I said that wrong. Uh, Rochester, but I can't make this decision on my own. I connect the dots, realize what he's talking about, and feel like I was punched straight in the guts. Listen, I, I need to clear my head. Tell Jonah I need a couple of days off. If he starts throwing a fit again, tell him he'd better learn to f write the fucking column on his own. No, seriously. Thanks, Tasha. Yes, I'll give him a kiss from his auntie. The moment he hangs up, his composure goes out the window. He basically stumbles to the nearest bench. God damn it. His faint sobbing stops me in my tracks. I lose my appetite. Feeding on this guy would feel nauseating anyway. Just when I convince myself that I should let basic decency take the reins, he notices me creeping around. Uh oh. He gives me a startled glance, eyes damp, looking absolutely miserable. Busted. <laughs> uh, so what do you say to a guy you were just about to assault in a dark park but thought better of it? Hey, um... He absentmindedly wipes away the tears off his cheeks. You by any chance write for the Bronx Times? His short but genuine grin catches me off guard. He didn't expect to be recognized, definitely not by some random girl in the middle of the night. Y yes how do you know? You don't strike me as a baseball fan. So he's a sports columnist. I put the fakest smile on my face. Time to lie out of my ass. <laughs> well, Julia, uh, we put yourself in a pickle. Let's see if we can get out of it. Well, you got that right. I'm a reporter too. I think I saw you once when I visited Jonah in his office. You work with him, right? Yeah, you might say that. His inner struggle seems pretty clear. Truth be told, I write most of his things as well. Bingo! For real? That lazy bum will never change. If he wasn't such an ass kisser, he'd be out of his comfy seat in no time. Sheesh, it's like you read my mind. Yeah, anyway, don't let me stop you. Keep up the good work. You deserve better. You think so? Glad to hear it. Still, um, I don't mean to impose, but it's late, and this place is not exactly... Yeah, don't worry about me. Someone's picking me up a few minutes away from here. See you around. For sure. 
Oh, and thank you. I notice a change in his melancholic face. He stands up with his back straight, like he has regained some of his lost resolve. He nods and starts running straight back to his problems. I start walking in the opposite direction. Good idea. Even though I might regret the show of abstinence later, what little remains of my humanity inside my shriveled heart encourages me to think that letting this guy go was the right thing to do. I'll need a change of scenery to break out of this mood, and an opportunity to actually get some juice into my veins relatively guilt-free, if possible. Guess that's enough human interaction for one night. Once more to Big Beat Burger, into the last food joint I'll ever know. I'll have the usual... First time I used this line, I wasn't sure it would work, but I've gained enough notoriety among the staff that it does. The cashier just smiles, nods, and charges me for one black coffee. I can imagine them instructing the newbies. <laughs> See that emo weirdo? Here's how it is. She orders or she always orders a single cup of coffee. Nothing else. And she doesn't even drink it. Probably wouldn't take a single sip even if I was still alive. Stuff is just trash. But at least being a buying customer gives me an excuse to sit here for as long as I want to. I wish I could use one of those self-order kiosks to minimize human contact, but touch screens don't exactly like me. Not too long ago, I managed to blue screen ten of them in a row! Oh no! Oh, that's right! Because the vampire, the, the like, tech doesn't like them, that's right. Ah well, the good news is it doesn't look like I have anything to do tonight. The bad news is it's because every kindred who matters is having fun at the art hole right now. It's not like I wanted to go. I just wanted them to invite me so that I could tell them to fuck off. I scan the entrance to the restaurant through my peripheral vision. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Uh-oh, someone coming to talk? Am I naively hoping someone will come and save me from my misery? I guess I am. Please, please, please let somebody come and get me out of here. A prince. A princess. A knight in shining armor. A fairy godmother. A passing huntsman. The big bad wolf. Mila Jovovich. Vin Diesel. Azela Banks. Wait, Mila Jo- Dude, okay, to be fair. To be fair, if they made a movie of this game using certain, like- or even like a show, like a like a mini series where every night is an episode, and they get Vin Diesel and Mila Jovovich and like if they were all in this show or movie, that would be amazing. Just saying. I could be, see Vin Diesel being uh oh god, who who would he be so far? We haven't seen everybody, but like maybe Amir. I mean, they'd have to change his his character a little bit, but I mean that would work. Mila Jovovich could be. Anybody so far. <laughs> Same with Azalea Banks. They kind of cool, I think. Hell, I'll take anyone at this point. Oh no, is it going to be the the Catholic guy? Oh no. <laughs> was it be funny if he showed up. Never suspected you here. Uh, <laughs> visualizing. <laughs> Tapping into the power of my subconscious. Materializing my dreams. Nope, doesn't work. I'm sorry, it doesn't work that way. Only in the movies. Looks like you're eternally stuck being a nobody in the corner of a shitty restaurant, sweet little Julia. Unlife's a bitch, and then you don't even die. I pretend to read a book about psychoanalysis I stole from Dakota for a while. Having found it to be too mentally taxing, I switched to pretending to read a Stephen King book, which I also stole from Dakota. <laughs> what else did you steal from her? Uh, after the terrifying realization that it was written in the last 15 years and therefore contains no amusing drugged out rants about troubled childhood in Maine, I switched back to looking at the entrance. You should read End of Watch. Or that entire trilogy. I don't remember what the first one's called. I think it's called Mr. Merce Mr. Mercedes. Mr. Mercedes, I think the second one's called Peaky Blinders or something like that. And then End of Watch. That is a good series, Julia. Trust me, you'll, you'll appreciate that one at least a little bit. Got me into Stephen King more than I was before, so I mean, hey, it helps me, it might help you. That party must be so stuffy and trashy and boring. 
At this point, I'm no longer looking for salvation. I'm looking for amusement. That's everybody, honey. But it doesn't come. All I get is boring bozos and norm core clothes. They walk in, take care of their business without doing anything to amuse me, and walk out. A few minutes after I lose all hope, a tall, elegant man marches in with a spring in his step. He looks around, impatient, irritated. Then he notices the person he was looking for and reacts with visible relief. He gallantly approaches my table, looks at me, and says, It's Kadir! Yeah! Her knight in shining armor has come to annoy the hell out of her. <laughs> or vice versa. There you are. Now, that's curious. He shouldn't be here. Big but Vin Diesel. Yes! I called it! The game knows what I was thinking. That's amazing. Wait, do we do Vin Diesel or Big Bad Wolf? Or oh, Fairy Godmother? <laughs> oh, God, this is tough. Uh, let's call him Big Bad Wolf. Let's go Big Bad Wolf. <laughs> Careful, everyone. Big Bad Wolf is here. He will huff and he will puff and he will blow our house in. <laughs> Even she looks all smug. <laughs> Why are you stalking me, Wolf? I'll have you know I'm not falling for the grandma disguise ever again. My dumb attempt at self-amusement doesn't phase him at all. He doesn't even roll his eyes. <laughs> He's just... <laughs> it just went right over his head. <laughs> oh, Kadir, you poor boy. <laughs> I wonder what he would have said to Vin Diesel, though. He just stares at me blankly. Grab your stuff and get in my car. Now. His tone leaves no room for doubt. Something... Uh-oh. The plot thickens. And the... The thickening is that something bad has happened. I want to ask what, but whenever he's in his, I will simply ignore all the dumb shit you say mode. I know better than to ask questions. <laughs> Good idea, Julia. Instead, I silently follow him to the exit. He guides me to his car. I just hope I haven't messed anything up. Again. I don't think I have, but have I? Oh, this is cool. Kadir's car. As usual, he gives me the back seat. He's always uneasy when the passenger seat is taken. Doesn't want anyone to limit his peripheral vision, he says. Normally, I'd catch him observing me in the rearview mirror, but this time he's watching the streets, more tense than usual. Something must have caught him off guard. I've got my seatbelt on and my popcorn ready. What's up? The awkward silence feels like it will last forever. Eventually, he finds the right words and speaks up. Ooh, the dictionary updated. Let's read that first before we get into it. The Anarch Movement. Loosely organized sect of political outsiders opposing the modern Camarilla-dominated paradigm. They seek to end the tyranny of the elders, but from what I've seen in NYC, they've just replaced one hierarchy after another, more loosely defined. Uh-oh. Uh-oh, we getting into some political stuff now? Six weeks ago, the prince told me to parlay with the Anarchs in the docks. Remember? Yeah, and you made me tag along so that I could learn something about politics. As it turned out, politics meant something awfully similar to watching my drunken family shout at each other at a wedding party. There was this man who didn't need to shout to make my blood boil. The meanest one in the room, their leader. White hair, a monocle, musty clothes. With this f oh. Boss Callahan. With this fucking Pollack cunt. <laughs> that sounds like his voice. <laughs> Should have given him Scrooge McDuck's voice. I'm gonna try my best to do Scrooge now. That's nope, he's gonna have Scrooge McDuck's voice now. Julie has spoken, it is time. Uh, where are we? Scrooge McDuck. Yeah, how could I forget? A lot of panache, old-timey bravado, and gendered insults flung my way. What was his name? Something British. Made me think of Hollywood. Callahan? Baron Callahan. Douglas Boss Callahan. Ooh, it updated. A Baron. A powerful anarch. Basically a warlord. Oh... Oh, interesting. 
I'm learning a lot about the world of darkness through this. Barons are often up-jumped licks who have strong-armed their way into control over a building or even a city block. In NYC, especially in Douglas Callahan's case, it often seems suspiciously like a form of traditional govern governance to me. Ooh. We're getting into some good stuff. Right. It's 2020, but the man's opinions and ideas were stuck in 1920. Weren't the Anarchs supposed to be the progressive option? <sighs> I never understood why they put up with him. He has his ways of predicting which way the wind will blow. Anytime Camarillo or the S SI, C? SI hit the Anarchs, it was the factions opposed to him that were hurt. The luckiest bastard in the world. Thought you didn't believe in luck. I don't. But it sure looks like his luck has finally run out tonight. Huh. Wait. Don't tell me. The Anarchs got rid of him? Dear, what did you do? <laughs> An evil grin. Maybe. Maybe not. I don't know the specifics. But I do know he's gone. Wow. Gone as in he's dead? Deader than dead? I'm 99% sure the bastard met his final death. How do you know? We've got trustworthy sources in the Anarch inner circles. Looks like all hell's about to break loose. There's an emergency meeting at the art hole. Jesus, and you're bringing me with you? Why? Because you were on the way. Because I could. Because I should. You might not be important to the members of the court, but you're still an asset to the sect. Symbolically, at least. I can justify sneaking you into the party, claiming it's for your own protection. An unexpected alliance between Big Bad Wolf and poor Little Red Riding Hood. Wait a minute, though. The party is still happening? <laughs> of course it is! They don't care! They don't care! I mean, the, the, the Anarch guy is gone. The, what have they got to lose now? I called the prince, told her the best course of action is stopping it, and started listing security protocols I've prepared for these sorts of situations. She interrupted me halfway through and told me we will discuss the subject face to face. Oh, that's not good. That doesn't sound like she's. A... Yeah, like I said, they don't care. If the Anarchs kill each other and stuff, they don't care. They're like, good. He's gone. Less stuff for us to worry about. Although, who took his place is the question. That is a question, though. The party's that important, huh? Politics. Politics is that important. I don't know if he's trying to convince me or himself. And once again, politics sound an awful lot like a bunch of party-loving assholes shouting at each other. Don't worry. This isn't the kind of, how should I call it, governing issue the likes of you and I tend to deal with. And how would you describe the governing issues we tend to deal with? Uh oh. <laughs> yeah, Kadir, I'm curious. After all the crap we've been through in this playthrough so far, what do you call it? Shoveling ourselves out of shit. That is a... Mm, you know what? Kadir, you make a good point. That sounds very relatable, too. Very relatable. As usual, he seems a little embarrassed for cussing, or for being too honest. Either way, it's cute. No argument here. And that's where the conversation ends. We stay silent as the car rides off toward the unknown. Oh, God, Scrooge McDuck. <clears throat> How does he sound? He's Scottish, right? I can't do it. I'm sorry. I, I can't do a Scottish accent. I could try. It's not Scrooge McDuck. Let me see. I'm... <laughs> oh, my throat. Uh, no, you know what? I'm just going to go back to what I had. I'm not a New York City baron. The baron of New York City, if you please. Once more, a memory of an old douchebag who thought he could rule the world crosses my mind. Well, it looks like the world's left him behind. Sayonara, asshole. And, he and here we are, the only place we didn't expect to visit tonight. The art hole. Guessing by the sounds, the inside seems lively. 
even if they know it's an emergency, they simply don't care. I mean, I kind of called that last time, though, so... What are you standing around for? You still need an invitation? No idea. Do I? I think the bouncer will let you in. There's a bouncer? Yes, and he's standing right in front of you. Just start walking, whelp. And here I am, among partying elites. It's as stuffy and boring as I expected, but hey, at least it's exclusive. The title Panhard came up with for these yearly gatherings is called Celebrations of Power. An invitation to re-examine the relationship between our undead bodies and the spaces they inhabit. The week-long event is packaged as a sort of performance art piece to make the kindred who are involved celebrate their potential instead of despairing at their monstrous... Wow, I read that weird. So basically what they're saying is these these clubs are for bringing um, people who are important to come to these parties and celebrate their own potentials instead of despairing at how they're vampires. Where like, they're like, yeah, vampire, being a vampire kind of sucks, but look at all the stuff we can do. Okay. We need to counter-program the omnipresent images of tragic vampirism with images that remind us we have inherited the Earth and are now free to remake it in our image. That's exactly what I just said. Exactly. Thank you, Prince. Um, to this end, she organizes a series of exhibits, concerts, fireworks, parties, business meetings, etc., etc., etc. Of course, the parties and business meetings are the most important. My prince. Kadir, finally. A saint with angelic wings, a holy patron of New York City. I take a good look around. Half of the figures here are dressed like they're attending a masked ball. The other half are religious figures, either demonic or saintly. I have to admit, I don't fully understand the theme here. I know Panhard based it on psycho magic, a sort of shamanic psychotherapy using the power of art. Simply put, it's a holy mass and a unholy mass in equal measures. A set of rituals meant to m make the participants wholeheartedly accept they're both the worst and best this earth has to offer. Put on this mask at the very least. You're standing out. Here. Well, that is a cool mask! I'm digging it! Man, this party this seems awesome! I would love to go to one of these. Here. I heard the aesthetic basis for these parties is the black mass in the film Eyes Wide Shut. Some think this decision means Panhard's tone deaf, but it's quite the contrary. She knows the Anarchs are constantly looking for ways to undermine her through art and rhetoric that point out glaring contradictions in her theoretically benevolent rule. But instead of denying pressing aesthetics designed to criticize the elites, she embraces them. Instead of taking a Streisand effect, she effectively defangs the opposition. The resistance becomes a part of the system, and both the Camarilla and the Anarchs get the same message. Don't think of it as a pathology. Think of it as the new normal. I'll collect the key advisors. They've already been told to come here. I don't think there's a need for us to hold the meeting in a particularly secluded place. We'll just do it over there. Are you certain? Absolutely. Wait, is that Miss Sawinski I see behind you? Let Kadir talk. Let Kadir talk. No. I'm afraid so. I collected her on my way here because of her role, role as a La Sombra representative. Just say political hostage. You people have made it perfectly clear what's going to happen with my parents back in Chicago if I go against you. Oh, God. I realized she might become a target and decided to hide her at the art hole. Putting all my eggs in one basket will make my job easier. I'll look for a safe place for her to spend the night. Oh, is this the guy that we saw earlier? Is this the guy that we saw earlier that was weird or is this a different guy? Let her stay with you for now, Lalas Asmai. Time is of the essence. I didn't notice him sneak up on us. 
Nice getup. Are you absolutely sure? Wait. Wait, 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 wait. Is Arturo the guy th that I thought was hilarious? Where's the, um... I don't remember. All right. We'll just see what happens. Ah. But of course, everything we say here is going to become an open secret in a matter of minutes. Prince Panhard has already come up with the appropriate messaging. Out of the corner of my eye, I spot an elderly vampire guiding a young, fashionable human girl toward the basement, led like a lamb to the slaughter. Best not to think too deeply about what's going on underneath this place. Yeah, it's probably a good idea. Before everyone gets here, I'd like to secure the perimeter. Easy now, all of us, my. All of the appropriate security protocols for you are already active. Me and the prince have already pulled some strings as well. The situation is mostly under control. Mostly under control. Never let anyone sleep any easier. Ah, as my. I know that as the prince's sword, you're aching for blood. But you have to accept that, like most weapons known to men, you're most effective hidden in the sheath. Was that a backhanded compliment? Or a threat? I don't know. Listen here now. It looks like a fascinating po philosophical discussion in the making. But sadly, I'm forced to interrupt. Prince Panhard. All of a sudden, Samira appears between the two men, her calm and collected voice completely changing the atmosphere. As expected for a self-professed protector of the peace. Good for you. Samira, I hope you're enjoying yourself. To be quite honest, I feel out of place. She nods and smiles at me, probably us to signal she takes solace in not being the only person in the room who feels like a fish out of water. Especially now, seeing as I heard this meeting is meant for those of greater stature than mine. Nonsense. We have a delicate matter to discuss, one that might require severe judgment down the road. I think you- ah, crap. <laughs> Oops, hang on. Uh... I think you understand why I wished for a child of Hakim to be involved. Oh, okay, so she was just saying, like, oh, okay, no, 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 you're important. Of course. What is that ex- what is with that expression on your face, Kadir? He quickly collects himself. Look who's joining us. The High Regent of the Chantry uh, oh, of the Five Boroughs, Lady Aisling Sturbridge, walks up to our group in an outfit I would have never imagined her in, pretending everything is par for the course. Prince Panhard, the Sheriff, the Harpy, the Bano Hakim protege. Are we still waiting for someone? He's almost here. Shining even more brightly than usual, Aisling. I adore your outfit, Samira. Wish the Prince allowed the same amount of effort for me. I, for one, am glad she didn't. I particularly love those horns. Thank you for reminding me. I put them on at the prince's behest, but I believe she's had more than enough fun. No? Not yet. Ah, well, this will do for now. But you're not off the hook yet. I paid a costly price to see you like this. Both Kadir and the prince's voices are strained whenever they attempt humor. Their minds are obviously elsewhere, and it's not a happy place. Arturo, on the other hand, seems calm. Well, of course he is. <laughs> We all celebrate our power in different ways, I suppose. Now, what is all this about? Just a moment. Over here, Addison! The Camarilla's infamous spokesman approaches, pushed toward us in a wheelchair by his servant. Helen, everyone, I certainly hope this is something important. What a commanding tone. Seeing as Pine can't communicate normally, his servant really relays his words to us instead, and he's posh and snobby enough to make me believe I'm listening to his master's voice. Carter won't be joining us. He gave me fair warning he might not make it tonight. I've messaged him the details. Hmm. I'll have to find time to meet him later, then. Finding time, searching for lost time. I swear it's all I do nowadays. And there's never enough. I guess now you understand why I insisted that this event must last all week. 
So many esteemed guests, many of them from out of town, each deserving at least a few hours. The figure in the wheelchair waves his hand impatiently. Yes, yes. Let's just cut to the chase now, shall we? That might be the wisest course of action, my prince. Arturo. My prince. Everyone. Let me begin by stressing these important points. The situation is largely under control. The negotiations are underway. And the situation is more tense than dangerous. We are safe. Let me repeat. We are safe. And with that out of the way, here's the big news. Baron Callahan, de facto leader of Anox in New York City, met his final death in his office tonight. Ooh. Ooh, everyone's thinking about that. How did you find out? We have a good friend near his office. Their intel is as accurate as it gets. We've also established a negotiation channel with the Anox. They gave us all the confirmation we needed. Was our court involved in his destruction? I look at her in disbelief. So does everyone else. Not that the same thought hasn't passed through my head, but to simply exclaim it like that. Oh, spare me the virtue signaling. I thought we were being transparent here. I don't give a damn if we took care of Callahan or not. I just want to have a clear idea of what I'm dealing with. Yes. A clear answer. I need that too. To my knowledge, none of us present here ordered his destruction. Nor did we participate in it. Unless someone wants to confess, it's now or never. Of course, nobody speaks up. Arturo pretends to clear his throat. That's our official position as well. The Camarilla's ruling body had nothing to do with it, and for all intents and purposes, his Anarch contenders had more interest in removing him than we did. That interest is sure to manifest in one way now. His former enemies will prop him up as a martyr for the cause. Yes, which is why we sadly cannot just leave the Anarch to their own devices. As much as we'd like to avoid recognizing their sect in any way, We've offered to assist them in an official investigation. Addison Pine's wrinkled face contorts slightly. Let me ask you one question. You do realize those curs have no respect for our traditions, yes? Ooh, traditions. What are those? I know what they are, but still. Actually, no, it's probably different in the world of darkness, now that I think about it. The six traditions, oh, there's six, form the basis of modern kindred law. The first tradition is the masquerade. Thou shall not reveal thy true nature. Don't let anybody figure out you're a vampire. Considered the most important of the bunch, but it's loosely interpreted pretty often. The second tradition is domain. Thy domain is thy own concern. All others owe, owe thee respect while in it. I'm too much of a nobody to own a domain, so this one doesn't apply to me. Oh, so basically they're saying that if, if you're a vampire that's, like, actually important, if you have a house and they enter your house, they have to respect you. That's nice. Uh, the third tradition is progeny. Thou shall only sire another with the permission of thine elder. Basically birth control, but for vampires. No new bloodsuckers unless somebody, or like the prince, agrees to it. The fourth tradition is accounting. Those thou create th are thine own children. Their sins are thine to endure. If I fuck up real bad, Karen should face some consequences in theory. Okay, so basically if you make a new bloodsucker and they do something stupid and you, it's your fault that they did something stupid because you're responsible for them. Okay. Um, the fifth tradition is hospitality. Honor one another's domain. Without the word of acceptance, thou art nothing. In New York City, this is usually understood as don't hunt on somebody else's turf, but in a city that houses over 8 million mortals, enforcement of this one's pretty lax. Yeah, I think that more has to do with, like I said, like if someone owns a, owns a domain and you enter the domain, just be responsible and respectful. Okay. Uh, the sixth tradition concerns destruction. Thou art forbidden to destroy another of thy kind. The right of destruction belongeth only to the elder. So you don't get to kill a vampire until the prince gives you the go-ahead. And as Sheriff, Kadir has the implicit go-ahead. So if Kadir... Okay, so that means if Kadir thinks someone needs to die, he has the okay to kill them. 
Everybody else, though... Okay, that's good to know, actually. I'm, I'm learning. I'm learning things every time I play this game. We do, Addison. But as a veteran politician, you should be deeply familiar with the words controlled opposition. Yes. For now, it's impossible to fully contain the Anarch threat in New York. For now, our only option is to prop up a candidate who will offer the least resistance to our future plans for the city. We extend our hand to the most promising contender, giving him a way to present himself as a diplomat, a man of reasonable compromise. The rabble falls in line. The, per the purists grow angry and alienated. We've already contacted the best possible person in their sect. He will oversee the investigation, and it's in his best interest to show he's able to resolve the situation calmly. Is that good enough? Addison ponders the question for a while, then waves his hand again. It is. Proceed. Funny thing, nobody's paying any attention to me right now. That's good, though. Well, to be fair, Julia, you're considered not important to them, so... At least for now. Keep in mind, Mr. Payne, our man's people will still barely tolerate us, and the situation is volatile. The other factions within that sorry excuse for our sect might still try to escalate the conflict. I will do my best to solve the situation as fast as possible. How so? Kadir is momentarily taken aback by his question. I volunteer to coordinate the case with the Anarchs, of course. I refuse. You have more important duties to focus on. Once more, Kadir is stunned. All due respect, Prince, but if you don't consider me capable of tackling this issue and attending to my usual duties at the same time, I think you gravely underestimate me. Your penchant for working yourself to the bone is well known and appreciated by everyone in this room, Sheriff. But so is your perfectionism. If we do grant your wish, and that you investigate while still fulfilling your routine obligations, can you guarantee you're going to give both of these tasks your best? I can guarantee something very close to my best. Close to your best doesn't cut it, alas, my. Not when the vultures are out in force. Callahan's destruction is sure to cause unrest among the Anarchs, and there's an obvious outlet for the pent-up rage. I want to make this perfectly clear. The celebrations will continue as planned, no matter what. This is why your presence here is absolutely necessary, Sheriff. We rely on your constant protection. Of course, my prince. We must be on constant vigil for a few days. Alas, my sword must be constantly pointed at the enemy surrounding us. Oh, he doesn't like that. Ah, oh, she took the horns off. <laughs> Good for you, Aisling. She got tired of him, probably. The timing of the Baron's destruction is impeccable. The Anarch leaders are sure to point to at us and claim we're shamelessly celebrating his end. Does anybody believe it's just a coincidence? Murders are messy. Almost as messy as politics. It's impossible to reliably predict the outcome of any violent action. I think it'd be wise of us to brace for a lot of unfortunate coincidences, Aisling. In any case, the rabble can't get the impression that their power struggles are of great concern to us. But they also can't think we have something to hide. Which brings me to my point. We do need a symbolic gesture, one displaying expertly measured intensity. My best bet is a humble diplomatic envoy, a low-level official acting as an investigator of sorts. I implore you, Prince. Kadir. He bites his tongue and struggles to collect himself. I rarely see him lose his temper, at least where the Camarilla is involved. What's going on? I wonder about your suggestion for this rule. After all, it's not particularly prestigious, but carries a lot of responsibility. We're still talking about a Camarilla representative. Oh, I think there's a very obvious candidate. Both he and Kadir look at me simultaneously. Everyone else in the room does too. Wait a second, he can't- oh, he does, Julia. You've just been nominated for one of the worst jobs right now. Miss Julia, once again, your full name eludes me at the moment. Am I allowed to speak? Or maybe I should wait for permission? Before I make up my mind, the sheriff sighs deeply and speaks up. 
Sawinski. Miss Julia Sawinski. Right. I understand you used to be an investigative journalist before your embrace. Uh, that's correct. Among others, the Banu Hakim Primogen insisted that you are worthy of greater privileges and should be given a chance to prove yourself. Samira measures Arturo with suspicion. Uh-oh. Oh, that little bastard. Oh, I know what's going on. So basically, Samira thought about putting in a good word for Julia. Like, yo, Julia does really good work. I think she's worth more to us than you guys think. And they're using this as an opportunity. Oh, those bastards. Man, vampires are the worst. <laughs> They are the worst. Wow. Yes. Do you still think she's capable? She looks me deep in the eye. I swear she's telepathically trying to tell me, please, please, please don't fuck this up, you dumbass little white girl. <laughs> of course. Good. And I'm sure that you, alas my, have no problem with your protege embarking on this mission. Save for the pain a mother feels when watching her child leave the nest whether i do or don't is not particularly important right now is it it absolutely is panhard's backing of arturo momentarily blindsides him prince panhard i if arturo's plan is reckless i want you to tell me i need a simple yes or no answer is the girl capable now he knows he's left with no choice I wouldn't entrust her with all the responsibilities I have if she wasn't. He exchanges glances with me, but his look is different than Samir's. It's as if he is trying to apologize to me. Yeah, because this job sucks! This job's terrible. Like, of course you're going to be a mad at that. Like, they're basically telling her, hey, person who we usually don't give a shit about. You're only useful to us if you act as a spy. Like, vamp. Wow, that sucks. This poor, ch this poor girl's just trying to do her job, and she's doing decent at it. And now all of a sudden, like, she's. Oh, that sucks. That sucks. This guy, these vampires suck. It, pun intended. Here we are then. A recommendation from the Banu Hakim Primogen and the sheriff. To tell you the truth, I was just throwing out ideas, but with this backing, I, I can't doubt the Ninth Clan's representative will get the job done. I'm certain each of us feels the same, Mr. Payne. The atmosphere in the room mostly suggests people are glad they don't have to discuss the topic further. A shrug here, an averted gaze there. Yeah, they all know that this is basically a middle finger. This is, th they, none of them wanted to do this job. So they threw it on the new person because if she messes up, then it's like, oh, well, they're, they're fine. It is as you say. I will watch the way she handles the situation with great interest. Well then, Miss Sawinski, looks like you've got your chance for a big break. Big break doesn't mean much by itself. All I see is a big responsibility being placed on my shoulders. What do I stand to gain here exactly? Even though I'd normally jump at the chance to be useful, I play it cool. All of a sudden, not only everyone acknowledges my existence, but believes I can handle solving a tense criminal case. Something seems too good to be true. Be vulgar now. You stand to improve your standing at the court. Yes, we can discuss the particulars based on your performance. Yeah, they don't plan on giving me shit figures. <laughs> well, of course they weren't going to give you shit, Julia. I mean... You're expendable, so they're not going to help you out at all. It's not like I can refuse, but this is something I need to take into account while taking care of the case. I need a bargaining position if I want to get anything out of this. Yeah, I'll do it. Just point me in the right direction and tell me what to do. Excellent. That leaves us with only one more matter, which I hope we can agree on. I don't like how he put on his mask. <laughs> I don't like that. Uh, Prince Panhard signals someone with her hand. The figure emerges from behind the corner. 
Oh, it's her. It's Catherine. Interesting. So she's been here the whole time. Catherine, what a pleasant surprise. Nobody informed us you were in town. Addison, looking healthier than ever. <laughs> what does Weiss have to do with it? We need an impartial observer who everyone respects. And, as it happens, Catherine always knew how to make friends on both sides without angering either. I beg to diff... I'd be grateful if just for once you decided against throwing a tantrum about me, High Regent. A painful grimace crosses Aang Aisling's face, but she's quick to interpret the taunt as an invitation to a game she can't possibly win. Damn, Whis. Throwing fists already. <laughs> she just got there. As long as she can prove herself useful to the proceedings in some way. If half of what I heard about her from Mr. Vander... Vander Vieden? Vander Vieden is true. She should be able to. And what did poor Carter say about me this time? Nothing specific. One always has to read between the lines with him. But it was mostly envy. <laughs> Miss Weiss gracefully agreed to meditate between the Anarch representative and the La Sombra representative, ensuring mutual cooperation and mi mitigating, mitigating potential conflicts. That felt like a f oh the Freudian the Freudian slip. Aha, ha ha ha! Now we're getting somewhere. Yep, uh huh. That's what I figured. The Sombra representative, not Camarilla representative. I e, um, someone who can be catapulted from the sect without much damage to the ivory tower. Yeah, yep. That's what exactly what I figured. What was going on? Is there a meeting set up? Arturo looks at the clock on the other side of the room. In less than an hour. You'd better hurry, then. Well, what the hell. All this is happening so fast. If the situation is indeed under control, I will drive her and oversee the situation. Out of the question. You've got your orders, Sheriff. Attend to those. You fool. The girl needs guidance. And we need yours. Nobody knows what might happen next. But it's not as if the Anarchs have a lot of love for you, Alz, as my. You're too efficient in your duties for them to tolerate you. But a spare Miss Sawinski having them see you two together. Oh, he didn't like that. Oh. Hmm. <laughs> Do you think my guidance of Julia would be lacking, Kadir? Never said that. So. Do you have any objections to putting her under my care? He lowers his gaze, but seems reassured. None whatsoever. That's all I needed to hear. We'll be going then. Wasting no time as usual, I see. Have you at least tried the apparitifs? Waiting is an old person's game, Helen. I still feel young. Remember, if there's anything you need help with... Probably not. But I appreciate the thought nonetheless. Have a great night, everyone. I'll catch up with you later, Addison. I certainly hope you do. And so we leave in a rush. Funny, considering what she told me about being in a hurry yesterday. Ah, uh-oh. The back spiraling things. We're here. She thanks the chauffeur and lets me out of the car into a quiet neighborhood somewhere in Queens. Seemed like you were in a rush. Couldn't stand the crowd. She has a nice house. Holy crap. If this even is her house. She's honest. Probably per performatively so. Just to get into my good graces. It's working. <laughs> I mean... She's one of the few vampires that isn't giving you shit, so yeah, I would I would assume so. And why is that? In my experience, gatherings like those always enable a boring pack mentality. All the familiar lies we tell ourselves to justify lusting for more. 
repeated ad nauseum. Oh. And what lies are you telling yourself? Oh dear, I probably shouldn't have said that. Her aura immediately turns colder. Oh dear, I shouldn't have said that. You have bigger issues to worry about, sweetheart. Ah well, at least now I know how familiar I can get with her. That I do. Back at the art hall, you said something about guiding me, but I have zero idea what to do. None whatsoever. I had a few necessary arrangements to make over the phone before we got here to ensure your pretty little head stays attached to your neck. For now, anyway. I don't like that for now. I'm grateful, but I still feel way out of my depth. I need to know what to do. You used to make a living as an investigative journalist, did you not? Investigate the murder. In a TV shows where an investigative journalist gets too close to the heart of a politically incendiary case, it rarely goes well. A cat's head on their porch, a bullet to the head. So, are you afraid you might be a pawn in a game you don't understand? That your elders consider you a disposable asset? That a single wrong move might cost you everything you hold dear? Sounds about right, yeah. Well, by the sound of it, you understand your situation perfect damn. <laughs> Shit. Well, at, least she's, at least she's honest, right? I mean, of all the people we've dealt with, she seems like one of the more honest ones. Don't belittle me. I need advice. Be anything you want. But don't be boring, Julia. If I wanted to belittle you, I would have drowned you in platitudes long ago. Know thyself. Believe in your strength. Trust no one. Act confident. Turn the chessboard around and read your opponent's mind. Read Sun Tzu and quote him incessantly. Say, do you feel any better now? Can I ask you something? Seeing as me is still not here, of course. Do you know who killed Baron Callahan? I haven't the slightest idea. Were you emotionally impacted by his death? Not at all. Did you know him? Only passingly, I'm afraid. I expected him to perish sooner than later, so I never bothered to improve our relationship. Why are you helping me? Am I? <laughs> that remains to be seen. What do you mean? I like how I just noticed her eyes turn golden when it's like a very serious or like response to something. That's very interesting. You do not want a painfully honest answer. But I do. She stares me down. Her irreverent tone makes it impossible to guess what she's feeling even more so than the mask. Uh-oh. The thing got updated. Let's see what that says first. Oops. Wrong, wrong one. There we go. The hunger. Vampires urge to feed. It overpowers all needs. And trying to ignore it is said to be the easiest way to prime the beast. The dark, always blood-hungry passenger that accompanies oh, excuse me, every vampire's unlife for a hostile takeover. Oh, so that's like um, in... Werewolf the Apocalypse, they have um, rage. That's like their deep down dark thing is the rage. So I guess that's that's about the same as that. Okay, that makes sense. When I look at you, I see someone pitiful. Someone whose hunger is purely biological. An animalistic rush. When I saw a burgeoning plan to put you in a situation that is way beyond your capabilities, I offered my help. I was curious to see your true colors reveal themselves firsthand. When everything is said and done and Callahan's killer is pointed out, will you be a whimpering animal or a victor taking the spoils? 
I cannot wait to find out. Oh, God. She is playing us just like the, the Primogen and Prince people are playing us. Oh, dear. I don't know what to say. She's probably... No, she's not provoking you, Julia. She's giving you literally the honest answer that... Yeah, you're fucked. Whatever way this goes, you're fucked. Mia should be here any second. You have time for one more question. Oh. Who was Mia? She shakes her head, half disappointed, half amused. Really? How boring. Look behind you. There's your answer. I should have went with why are you important. Or the other one. Damn. A woman around my age emerges from around the corner of a street. Oh, I like this one. I like her jib. Nice. I never met her before, but if I had to describe her in two words by her aura alone, I'd guess those words would be permanently angry, even more so than your Anarch. You must be Catherine Weiss. And you must be Mia Morgan. Pleasure to make your acquaintance. Pleasure's mutual. This year, girl. Julia Sawinski, the La Sombra Primogen. La Sombra Representative. I correct her automatically. At this point, it's a habit. Good. If you were Primogen, I might have tried to kill you here and now. Is Tork still on the site? Nah. Told him I'd take it from here. By the end of tonight, he needs to look like a natural candidate for the leader of the NYC Anarchs. It's going to take a lot of driving around and negotiations. How did he react to finding Callahan's remains? Hasn't exactly elaborated on his feelings, but I expect he reacted the same way every true believer in the cause did. It's this complicated mess of all the possible feelings under the moon. So he was the first one who took the murder site? Oh, so you're already calling it a murder site. The ivory tower knows something we don't. Oh dear. It's not the official position, but I expect a lot of them to think it's Torque who stood to benefit the most from the boss's death. And it sounds like he's quick to jump on new opportunities. You don't know him. Yes, but I'd love to meet him and ask him some questions. Especially if he's the one who found the body. Well, if you're meeting Tork at all, it won't be tonight. He's too busy. I was assigned to investigate. I won't be able to do it properly if I'm not able to question a key witness. I'll arrange for him to meet you this week. This week? Aren't the tensions a little too high for delaying an investigation like this? Well, Tork's work is our best shot at making sure they don't they won't get higher, so boo fucking who. I'm his right-hand woman, though. Got any questions, direct them to me. <laughs> oh, dear. This is gonna get interesting for sure. Right-hand woman, huh? Hmm. Okay. Maybe the two of you should just head to Callahan's office. The, the discussion here does not seem to be going in the right direction. Nor in a particularly interesting one. You're not coming? Tork and you are the, not the only ones who have their work cut out for them tonight. I trust you can take it from here. And Mia, be easy on her. In slightly different circumstances, I expect the two of you would have ended up on the same side of the barricades. Uh-huh. Take care. Heads back to the vehicle. Well, follow me. I'll show you his place. Ooh, this is cool. Oh, there he is. Oh, wow. He's Yeah, he's definitely dead. Wow. Is it just going to keep going around the room? Yeah, I think so. It's a 19th century style office. Classical, wooden, smelly. The stuffy air of books, old furniture, and dust covers much of the fragrance of decay, but not all of it. This is the first time I've seen the remains of a vampire who has met his final death. I heard stories of really old kindred crumbling to dust, but that's an exaggeration. At least, it didn't happen here. When kindred die, a time catches up with them. 
If you offed me right now, I'd probably turn into an ugly, leaky corpse. But Callahan was well over a century old. It's like looking at a dapper mummy. A desiccated body in a heap of musty clothes. All that is left of the mighty boss Douglas Callahan, Anarch Baron of New York City. If that's really him. Needless to say, it might be a little hard to establish the time of death or the cause, especially as his garb doesn't have any obvious damage. What a great place to start. Have you already found anything suspicious? Nothing you don't see in front of you. Uh-huh. This door is the only point of entry to the room, right? Yes, unless you count the windows. But nobody except for Callahan knew how to operate those, and they don't let air or light through. Metal blinders on the windows facing east. The only modern element of the room sticking out like a sore thumb. They look automated. Was the door open when Torque got here? Well, that's the one suspicious thing. It wasn't. It's as if Callahan locked himself in from the inside. A closed room murder, huh? There's some glass scattered on the floor. I point at it. Could that be from the window? I checked it from the outside. Perfect condition. So what's the glass? No idea. Why does it seem like she has her suspicions, but is remaining uncooperative just because, uh, fuck off Camarilla scum? <laughs> I mean, do you really blame her though, Julia? Do you really blame her? I checked the next point of interest. A wall safe. Surprisingly large. I play with the lock a bit. What's the combination? It's Callahan's. What makes you think I know? At least I tried. A desk with nothing but an envelope on it. Nothing inside. I check all the drawers. Every single one has been thoroughly emptied. I don't know what I expected. Is this how the Anarchs go around securing crime scenes? Were these emptied before Torque arrived? I don't know. But I wouldn't accuse him of tampering with evidence if I were you. Well, thank you. <laughs> the decor of the room is pretty minimal, so there's not a lot of points of interest that could illuminate the case. I start getting nervous. I point to the painting on the wall. Of course, you have no idea who that is. Callahan's ancestor, I guess. I'm out of ideas. Everything I look at feels like another dead end. I'm frustrated. I feel as if I failed this investigation before it has even started. There must be something more. I start walking around, trying to find a single clue. Mia just watches me indifferently. Give me anything. Anything, goddammit. Anything. Any... Oh, it's a ghost. Oh, dear. A shadow blinks in and out of existence near Callahan's remains. Uh-oh. I freeze in place. Are you trying to help me? What are you mumbling about? In case you missed it, I'm not particularly fond of your sect. Doesn't seem like Mia noticed it. Give me just a moment more. She groans under her nose and goes back to messaging someone on her phone. When she does, the shadow appears again. Oh, there it is. Once again, blink in, blink out. Could... could something be there? I approach the clothes and start searching them for a clue. Maybe they missed something. Getting desperate, huh? Fuck off, Mia! <laughs> We're investigating a murder! I mean, the, the 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 best thing you can do is look at all possible angles. Like, seriously. Screw you. We're doing our job. Just being thorough. We've searched the bastard, like, three times. He had nothing of interest on him. How about this? A small card... Barely noticeable, looking a bit like a shopping list, is shoved deep into an almost invisible hole in the fabric. I take it out and show it to Mia. Huh. You didn't plant that there, did you? No. 
did you? Shove off. What's on it? A list of four names. D'Angelo, Hope, Agathon, Tamika. Hmm. Any idea what this is about? Bates May. She's lying, but I don't care. Tomorrow night, I'll meet up with Kadir and ask him to help me figure it out. I think I'm done here. Don't let the door hit you on the way out. Yeah, and don't let the door hit you where the good lord splits you, Mia. <laughs> Guess she sees me as nothing more but an enemy agent. When will I get to meet with Twerk? If, and that's a big if, he will agree to meet you on a one-to-one -one basis, Catherine will let you know. Probably won't let a loyal Camarilla lapdog like you see him without her oversight anyway. A Camarilla lapdog, huh? It's a risky play, of course, and might backfire, but maybe I'd benefit if I put my loyalty to the court into question. Yeah, why not? A Camarilla lapdog? Please. Well, aren't you? Trust me, I'm not the type who bites the hand that feeds her. But the court's favorite pastime's leaving me starved. Ah, so it's like that, huh? Yeah. Ooh, I got an achievement. Who am I, really? I think it's because I did something. She studies me carefully. I will keep that in mind, depending on how the situation unfolds. Good. In the meantime, have a good night. You too. It's getting late, or early, depending on how you look at it. Once I leave Callahan's office, I head straight to Dakota's apartment. Holy crap, we actually made progress. We've started the investigation, ladies and gentlemen. And we have a list of names. We uh, put the, the Camarilla's court into question. And, uh, yeah. I think we're gonna find some very interesting info by the time this is all done. I try to sneak... Bye to my bedroom, but she's up waiting for me. How was your night? Shit. Tomorrow. What happened? You look like something the cat dragged in. Tomorrow, I promise. But I'm worried. Don't be. Tomorrow. She gives me a concerned look, then closes her eyes, slumps her shoulders, and frowns. All right. You're the best. I reach my pitch black room and throw myself on the bed. The responsibilities, the stakes, the way I always feel too slow to react properly in these situations. I don't want to think. I want to turn off my brain. I want to drift into the void. The void. Into the void. Into the void. Oh, I got another achievement. Oh, I think it's because night four is done. Yes, child, come to the void. The in-between shall serve you donuts and coffee. Blood coffee. You've received your first trait. Oh, we got a skill. Uh, some choices in the game will push Julia towards different ways of thinking, which will have a lasting effect on her throughout the story. You'll see a brief pop-up on the screen anytime you receive a new trait. You can always view any unlocked traits in the log screen. Okay. Remember that ruthlessness... Ruthlessness is the mark of a true Lysambra, but you might walk another path before reaching that destination. Interesting. Oh, there's Dakota. I always told you you'd make it big. Get real. These assholes are just using me as a pawn in some stupid fourth dimensional chess game. As opposed to just keeping you off the chessboard. Don't be a glass half empty buzzkill. Watch them make me a scapegoat or something. That would be exciting. I could write a book about living with a 21st century Lee Harvey Oswald. Come on. Don't even joke like that. I haven't killed anyone. Julia, honey, neither did Oswald. Yeah, uh, right. I keep forgetting. Stop wriggling or I'll mess your face up. Sorry. I'm always obedient when she's busy working on my makeup. Oh yeah, because then she doesn't look super pale. It's hard to take care of your appearance, especially your face, when you can't even see yourself in the mirror. Not that I've ever been particularly good at it, but... Dakota doesn't seem to mind. I'm her goth dress-up doll. 
Interesting choice of words. Her presence in my unlife is one of the few things that my sire provided for me before fucking off to Chicago. <laughs> Normally, I'd be told to find myself a ghoul, but many of our clan, myself included, finds the idea of ghouls distasteful. Hey, I know what a ghoul is, but just so that we can get everyone up to speed here. A ghoul is what you get when you give a mortal your blood, your vampire blood, without draining theirs first. They become an underling, a toady, a thrall. The clan doesn't like to use them. Hell, Karen thought the very concept was beneath her and refused to explain it. So yeah, basically, um, in the World of Darkness, a vampire, if you feed a mortal your blood for three different nights, doesn't it could be in a row, it could be different nights in total, um, they're like your undevout, loyal, right-handed henchman or henchwoman. And they'll do whatever you say, they'll think whatever you want them to. I mean, they might have opinions on things, but yeah. Oh, that's an interesting way to put it. We're cat people, not dog people. We don't want mindlessly faithful servants. We want companions who rely on us, despite having, in theory anyway, the free will not to. The kind of relationship I have with Dakota would normally be a breach of the Masquerade's rules, but the rules are different for kindred who are Camarilla. Adjacent. Even losers like me. <laughs> Simplifying here, but my sire made it clear that her child would not own slaves, and that was the end of the discussion. <laughs> to be honest, I think the court mostly agreed to that request because they wanted one more thing to blackmail me with just in case. Yeah, probably. What would you do at my place? If I had to investigate your elite's wrongdoings? Yeah... I'd probably look for those rich fucks' pedophile rings. Look for the assholes who mention pizza suspiciously often. See who has powerful friends in Manhattan jails. Stuff like that. Oh, come on. Nah, I'm serious. Search for the deep rot, and a lot of smaller crimes will get solved in the process. What is it with you and conspiracy theories? What do you mean? You just told me your bosses have eyes wide shut parties, and suddenly you don't believe in rich people's pedophile rings? I don't know. I don't know if I want to know. My point is, you act as if all the conspiracy theories are real. Like, you can't possibly believe all that shit. Half of it doesn't even make sense. Well... You want an interesting answer or a real answer? Oh dear. Oh, gosh. Uh, Julia, do you, are you really sure you want to open up a can of worms like that? <laughs> the real answer should be the more interesting one. She removes her brush from my face to gather her thoughts. Everyone's lost nowadays. Just look at the world. It's drowning in facts that fail to cohere into a single convincing narrative. Or story that resonates. The corporate media wants you to believe in empirical thinking, but it always fails to deliver moral or metaphysical truths, and the people desperately lack those. So what do they do? They turn to conspiracists, and suddenly they're able to navigate the world. And why is that? Because conspiracy theories give them emotional truths that serve as a compass. Is Bill Gates trying to insert satanic microchips into my prop body? Probably not. I hope not. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'm sure we all hope. <laughs> now, is he a terrible person? No idea, but there's ample evidence that might be the case. It's in his ruthless business strategies, the company he used to keep, the philosophies he follows. People look at him and they feel he's fishy. So when the media present him as a genius or a savior, and I post that he wants to put the mark of the beast in my body, they choose to believe me. Yeah. And, and, and this is the, the reason, too, because it makes a moral, emotional, metaphysical sense to them. If it resonates with, with you personally on that kind of level, 90% of the time... You're going to, you might not believe it, but you're going to at least listen to it and think about it.
So, and ultimately, as, as Dakota says, that's what matters the most. <laughs> wow. I'm sure... I'm 99% sure this is complete bullshit, but I'm buying it. I mean, it totally misrepresents most conspiracy nutjobs I knew. But it's interesting and fun to think about. So I don't really give a damn if it's the truth. See, that's the idea. You get it. You came up with this monologue by yourself? Oh no, I read it on Facebook. Figures. But just to make sure, vaccines are okay? Well, as far as I know, they don't cause autism. Good to hear. Anywho, I'm done. You're the best. Yeah. Considering how many times I've put and done makeup on a dead body, I probably have enough job experience to be a mortician by now. Now that sounds like an exciting career. But in reality, it's probably the most boring thing under the sun. Yeah. I like my corpses talkative, pouty, and self-loathing. Shut up. This carcass will be leaving now. It's got a job to do. Go get him, tiger. <clears throat> okay. First thing I need to do, meet up with Kadir tonight and report to him. I hope he knows how to guide me out of this mess. You should have time for me in an hour or two, but in the meantime, I suppose it's time to find someone... What's the most dehumanizing word I could use here? Nourishment. Vi vi what is that word? Vita? Ancient term for blood. In my experience, it's rarely found outside of dusty textbooks and pompous camarilla speeches. Oh, okay, he's just talking about blood. Kadir told me I'd need to quench my hunger less often if I didn't smoke. It kills you, he said. But to start killing itself, your organism must pretend it's alive, and that uses a precious vitae. Like vitamins. But I love cigarettes. The way they smell, the way they burn, the way hot ash falls from the top, the sound of the lighter, the way they kill you, <laughs> and I guess some tactile connection to who I was back when I was alive. Okay, New York City, guide my steps. Show me which one of your children I should drink up tonight. Oh, there's three here. Bunny as a reporter. The note left at my old dead drop point reads, Bunny as a reporter. Shit, could it be Woods? Long time no see. What does one do when the ghost of Christmas past knocks on the door? Slap on the wrist. Samira is asking me to meet her. If not for the ongoing celebrations, the pat pat patrician would prove an odd choice for a secret rendezvous. Here's hoping she can provide me some useful insight. Diva's Delight, a fitting name for a kiss addict audacious enough to openly pitch her unique taste to those in the know. I'm not in a clubbing mood, but since I need to feed, may as well give that rumor a shot. Um. Hmm. I think it. I think the slap on the wrist. Th this sounds like it would be thorough for the investigation. A clean cut step. Look at that painting on the back. Huh. It's kind of cool though. A clean-cut staff member, dressed in an impeccable company uniform, smiles at me as the elevator door opens. Good evening, ma'am. Meeting someone? I dismiss this question with an apathetic shrug. He sizes me up for a brief moment, visibly questioning my fashion sense. However, his professional acumen quickly trumps his discontent. Very well. This way, please. NYC's Novio Rich seem awfully starving for a gourmet soup this late at night. The patrician is packed almost to the brim. Concierge points me over to the last vacant table, conveniently situated in the far-off corner of the main hall. I nestle in the chair, letting my elbows rest on the ornate tablecloth. Watch out, obvious, white, oblivious white collars. There's a black widow in your midst. Well, I'm here. Might as well just kick back and die of boredom. Yeah. I really, really need something to occupy my mind. <laughs> hmm. We could figure out why Samir asked. We could have a smoke and examine the place. We could call the... Let's figure it out. As I'm waiting, 
I rack, oh, I rack my brain for any idea why the Banu Hakim Primogem wanted me here tonight, instead of out there working my case. The obvious possibility, and the one I'm counting on, is that she has some sort of lead she wasn't comfortable sharing at Elysium. Almost certain that that's a false hope, though. This whole investigation still feels like a joke being told at my expense. While I'm trying to figure out how I feel about this, somebody finally takes notice of me. The concierge quickly closes in on me, dancing habitually between tables and addresses me before I can even utter a single word. Excuse me, ma'am. Are you Miss Sawinski, by chance? As soon as I nod, he hands me a carefully folded memo and leaves. The note reads... The manager of this establishment insulted the Camarilla's authority with his negligence. Even though it's minor, his transgression must be penalized. I would like you to assist me in this manner. Uh-oh. Oh. We gotta kill someone. Uh-oh. Oh, 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 that's not good. <laughs> Such a display of goodwill on your part would surely improve your standing with the higher-ups. Choose an appropriate, non-lethal punishment. Well, this is disappointing. <laughs> yeah, seriously. It was a high order to expect any help with the investigation, I guess. Instead, it's just another chore. The best I can hope for is that this really is just a friendly request and not a deliberate attempt to derail my work this early in the game. Uh, damn it. Might as well get it done, since I'm already here, so I can move on with more pressing stuff. I swiftly approach the manager and tap him on the shoulder. He furrows his brow as soon as he notices me. I'm afraid I'm busy. One of the waiting staff should be able to... We have something to discuss. The VIP lounge. Now, if you please. His face loses color. Maybe it has dawned on him that I'm even paler than the other more blue-blooded guests. He immediately becomes compliant as I escort him through a side door. Uh-oh. Oh, he's screwed. He, Someone's gonna die. That cup of coffee looks nice, though. The room isn't empty, but its guests are just leaving. Nobody pays me any attention. The manager is as polite as he can be as he sees the patrons out, but I can see he's clearly losing his shit. <laughs> he quietly asks one of his staff to give him five minutes in the lounge and gingerly closes the doors behind him. Then the pleading starts. Listen, I know I screwed up. I shouldn't have let him in. How could I know he's not one of the pro proper clients? I don't give a... Listen. Hey. I, 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 whatever. I, I implore you. I, I have children, for Christ's sake. Uh, th there must be something, an arrangement, a way uh, to... He just goes on as if I'm not even here. With each subsequent whimper, he becomes more and more irritating. Just, just shut up for a goddamn second. My outburst finally makes him hold his tongue. I light up the last cig in the package and take a slow puff, trying to compose myself. Poor Julia. See, she deals with so much shit. I have no use for your explanations and justifications. I don't know what sort of transgression you've committed. I should never have let this sensorik guy in. And truth be told, I don't give a shit. It'll never happen again, I swear on my mother's grave, just... I am not that good a judge of character. But him pleading with his arms out really makes him look like a biblical wayward son, swearing to change his ways. I grab his hand in a tight grip, palm up, and take a puff to rekindle the burning tip of my cigarette. He doesn't fight back. You and I both know they will want proof that I gave you a lesson you won't forget. So I hope you realize this is mercy. I put my smoke out in the palm of his hand to the accompaniment of his muffled screams. His eyes become watery, but other than that, he takes it like a champ. If I have to come back to this shithole, the next one will go right here. 
I look him in the eye and ca ca crassly flick his eyelid before taking off. I didn't know I was capable of this sort of cruelty, but here we are. Karen warned me that something in our bloodline finds sniveling weaklings detestable. Is that what triggered me? But that's a conundrum for another occasion. I did what I was asked, and I'm sure as hell wasted enough time here. Time to move on. Okay, we got one more choice here. I don't know what we're going to do. The reporter one sounds interesting, but this Diva's Delight thing sounds very interesting as well. And since our guy, our girl Julia needs to feed, let's just go do that. Sounds like fun. Ah, we're back here. No blood, no matter how exquisite, is worth suffering through this noise. Something terrible must have happened to the previous DJ. It had to be sudden and unexpected for them to hire this amateur under the wire. Zero ability to read the crowd. No sense of flow. As if that constant flashing wasn't migraine-inducing enough by itself. But people look like they're having fun, though. Not that I remember how an ordinary headache feels. I know the hunger, though, which is why I'm here tonight. A purple-haired girl bumps into me, head down, tears flowing down her cheeks, hands trembling. Uh-oh. As I think I know what happened here. As much as I'd understand it, I don't think it's the guy at the turntables that made her like this. Oof. Oh gosh. I'm so so sorry. I That's <laughs> there we go. <laughs> That's the voice. <laughs> We're gonna do that. Uh she bolts before I can say a single word. Well, who am I to blame her? Tactical retreat probably felt like a good idea. Ooh. The trace of cheap booze in every potential vessel is faint, but ever-present. At this point, the smell is all I'm getting. Come to think of it, I can barely remember how alcohol tastes. Ooh. Vessels. Polite slang for a source of blood, usually bipedal. <laughs> Jeez, okay. Maybe I should remind myself. Nah, that's dumb. But the bar's pretty much free of people at the moment. Hmm. I get closer and take a peek at the drinks. There are some goofy fucking names, especially from a kindred's perspective. Oh gosh, I wonder what kind of alcohol they have here. Turkish Delight, perhaps? Or E... Order the Vampiro, the bloody, the bloody Margaret, put the menu back. Let's do the Vampiro. Actually, no, Bloody Margaret. Let's try that. The bartender brings me a large glass garnished with a celery stick and filled with something that looks more like a veggie shot than a gin-based cocktail. Oh, so it's like a Bloody Mary. Far from f thrilled. Fuck it, here goes. I chug it down in one go. Tastes like canned tomatoes someone opened and left rotting for a decade. Something tells me I'm going to regret it soon. Oh god, I'm probably going to get sick. Oh dear. The music abruptly stops just as I step away from the bar. I can't see the booth, but the crowd's reaction tells me all I need to know. We have a new DJ. The vibe improves. Hallelujah. <laughs> But pleasant maneuvers moments never last. Some well-worn dude on the wrong side of 40 decides to hit me up. Our eyes meet for a brief moment, slightly too late for me to outmaneuver him. Strangely, there's no lust in his gaze, and yet he seems like a predator closing in on its prey. Shit, could he be the rumored diva's delight? A kiss addict clocking me as a bloodsucker? Oh, look at this guy. How come you're here all alone, sweetheart? I don't know why that's the voice, but ah, we're gonna run with it. I can't pinpoint exactly what it is, but there's something irksome in the way he carries himself. As he approaches me, I begin to feel fatigued, like there was a sudden drop in atmospheric pressure. Uh... Let's tell him to piss off. My unsure voice thwarts any attempts at sounding imposing. Can you bother someone else? I'm not in the fucking mood. He, oh gosh. He seems unfazed by my words, just tilts his head a little like a hound dog catching a scent. 
I feel spiders. <gasps> Is he a Garu? Oh, I wonder if he's a Garu. Oh, that'd be dope if he's a Garu. Is there something wrong? Here, let me... Hands off, asshole. Uh-oh. Make him go away or twist his wrist. Potence or dominate? Dominate. I can barely focus on his eyes, but he freezes in place for a moment. Hey, Stallion, how about you go bother that guy? He struggles with my chaotic command and gives me an unsettling look, but in the end seems to do what I wanted him to do. He approaches some meathead who immediately turns hostile. The first punch breaks the guy's nose. I don't wait for the second one. As if meeting that guy didn't strain me enough, an acrid feeling rises in my gut, instantly making me- Oh, because I drank the booze. I barely make it to the nearest empty lounge before I begin violently throwing up. For a minute straight, I spray the couch with the remains of that wretched cocktail. It's not a pleasant sight. I get a hold of myself as soon as my stomach empties. Shit, Julia, your life has had more than its fair share of avoidable embarrassments. Is it necessary for your unlife to follow suit? Oh, poor Julia. Oh, don't say that, Julia. You're okay. Time to bail and not look back. Right before I reach the exit, the purple-haired girl from earlier bumps into me. This time I know it's not coincidental. Wait, please. She seems startled, but gives me a pleading look. I saw what you did to that man. Are you, uh, are you one of them? What are you talking about? Who's them? She bares her teeth and taps the side of her neck. Oh, I get it. So you're the diva's delight? She blushes innocently like I just caught her stealing cookies. Yes, I know it sounds silly, I know, but I thought... I thought it would attract some of, um, you know, some of your kind. I don't like where this is going. <laughs> I don't like this. I've always been told I taste good. Would you... Would you like to try? No. You're being creepy, lady. Oh, God. She's one of those people. Oh, gosh. She's one of those people who likes getting their blood drained. It's like a drug to them. Oh, she looks at me the same way a junkie who hasn't had his hit for a while looks at a syringe. You know too much. There's no way you don't have a patron of some sort. Her eyes tear up again. I do. But maybe I don't. I don't know anymore. He shows up whenever he wants, then disappears for weeks. I don't... I don't even know his name. We were supposed to meet here tonight, but... I guess he didn't show up. <laughs> of course not. The girl keeps talking. Now that she's found somebody new to open up to, any instinct she might have had to remain secretive is gone. Makes you wonder who thought it was a good idea to breach the masquerade for her. Before him, I used to have a caregiver. She was one of the divas too, but she was exceptional, noble. I think she cared about me in a way, always complimented the way I taste. Would you like to try? She clings to my arm like I'm Jesus Christ and Kurt Cobain at the same time. Descended from heaven exclusively to turn her misery to bliss. <laughs> That's an image. <laughs> Can't help but feel some disdain. Please, I promise you won't be disappointed. I know I won't be. Too hungry for that. But I also like to pretend I'm something better than hungry from time to time. Feeding opportunity. Yeah probably should. The hunger gets the better of me, but somehow I don't mind. This is what she wants, isn't it? A quick look around. Nobody's paying attention. Why would they? We're just two random girls seem to be into each other. I gently grab the back of her head and put my lips closer to her neck. She trembles with excitement. Uh-oh. As I bite down, her body softens. Then I drink, savoring each sip. She really tastes incredible. 
like an unfulfilled promise. Sweet, sweet innocence. But she is not innocent. How dare you? As soon as I am done, she loses her footing, weakened but undoubtedly relieved. I help her sit down on the floor. She smiles at me, joy glinting in her eye. Thank you. That was... I really needed that. My name's... Don't talk. Just rest for a while. I leave her alone in this state of bliss. She doesn't seem to mind. Looks like I did the right thing, right? I leave the booming sounds of the club behind me and get on with my night. It's about time to see Kadir. Mighty kind of him to arrange a meeting in the place that's most convenient for me. Oh, of course! Oh, this is a cool shot. Whoa! That's cool. I, I really like the artwork in this game. D'Angelo. Hope. Tamika. Agathon. Suppose that's better than nothing. But no evidence? Really? Honestly, it felt as if someone had already cleaned up the most egregious stuff before I arrived. Sounds like the Anarchs. I'll definitely try and check that place again, but I feel like I need some sort of expert to accompany me. An advanced investigator who would show me the ropes. Someone tall and handsome, maybe. Yeah, if you don't mind a diplomatic incident, I'll go with you. <laughs> oh dear. Any better ideas? Actually, this very note gave me one, but I will need to set it up first. I'll get back to you about that. You know these people? I've had passing contact with each of them. Part and parcel of the job, you know? I suppose. Can you help me out with this? The way I tackle it would be look at one person on the list every night. Ask around. See what they know if you do manage to meet them. If I manage to meet them? They're not particularly easy to get a hold of. Always preferred to be a little off the grid. But nowadays, they're all practically in hiding, if not MIA or dead. Funny coincidence? Not my job to speculate. In other words, he knows something, but is not at liberty to say. Of course. Guess I'll find out anyway, if I do meet them. Why one each night? Shouldn't I investigate every loose thread till we're satisfied? In a perfect world, you'd have all the time you needed. But this is not a perfect world. They'll try to brute force a solution to the case as soon as possible. I suspect... Four nights from now, once the celebrations of power are over, they'll ask for your findings and that will be all. Oh, so we got four more nights. Okay. Fucked up. To be brutally honest, my focus wouldn't be on solving the murder. Instead, I'd focus on not embarrassing yourself. Fucked up. This is part of why I didn't want you to get involved. You couldn't possibly think Arturo had you get involved out of the goodness of his heart. The entirety of your investigation is just for show. You were meant to be an unwitting actor. Which is what we assumed anyway, so meh. Maybe I really should just call Mia and be like, you know what, fuck these condescending ivory tower clowns, I want to work with you. <laughs> but then again, if I was with the Anarchs, they'd probably delegate even shittier tasks to me. And if, and that's a really big if, they didn't think I was some kind of inside agent in the first place. Better stick to Camarilla. But if they're hell-bent on stabbing me in the back at every opportunity, maybe it's time to think about how I can repay the favor. Play dirty, no matter what Kadir thinks of it. After all, from where I'm standing now, there's no other way but up. I mean, you have a good point. That is a very good point. A penny for your thoughts. I take a drag from my cigarette. After the last few months of hazing, I didn't expect a random act of kindness. 
this kind of bullshit as well. Just how the Camarillo works, isn't it? More often than it's necessary, I'd say. But this time it's a risky play. In my experience, if one simply displays some cunning, they can unexpectedly turn a situation like this to their advantage. The court... Part of the court assumes that you're unable to surprise them in this regard. But if you do, by the end of this investigation, you might as well pull yourself out of the ditch you're in. That would be a night to remember. So, uh... Where should I go first? You should go with me. As it happens, I'm only out here because I was ordered to drive Aisling to the art hole. And guess the name of her protege. Oh, so that's how Agathon is. Or was. Nobody knows. It's a complicated thing. You'll see. I'm on the clock. Let's get a move on. Lead the way, big bad wolf. Still not done with this bit? No. We will never. It was either Vin Diesel or Big Bad Wolf or Fairy Godmother. The Big Bad Wolf suits you just fine. Not while it's still bothering you. I'm leaving you behind if you don't keep up. Oh. Oh, shoot. There was probably something there and I, I totally missed it. Shoot. As I already told the Kadir numerous times at that... I have no idea what happened with Agathon. Ooh, this is a cool Chantry. The Broadway Chantry, part of the Chantry of the Five Boroughs, is Aisling's usual hangout place these past few nights. She's in a hurry and not willing to talk. Do you have any idea about his connection to Kindred going by the names of Tamika, D'Angelo, and Hope? I don't. I made it a point to keep our relationship strictly professional one, and never meddled in his personal affairs, unless they influenced our work, that is. But it only happened one time. Ah, uh, yes, the infamous Juno case. Hmm... Yeah, any conflict. That sounds like a good question. Were you two in conflict about anything? Something that might have, you know, driven a wedge between you two? A pause, which is slightly too long for me not to get suspicious. Ooh, we're getting somewhere. Ooh, hoo, hoo, we're getting somewhere, guys. Nothing I can think of, but I did take offense to one thing. It was quite rude of him. Not to give me a proper warning before he departed. Still, this line of work is not particularly favored by folks with a perfect grasp of Savior Vire. Viver? Viver? Vire? I do hope his search will bring him back right where he started, begging me to take him back in. The boy is talented, and I did put a lot of time into mentoring him. If he doesn't, well, que sera, sera. No skin off my back. So, you won't even entertain a possibility that he found himself in harm's way? I know an answer to that one. Researcher's mindset. She doesn't think it's worth considering the worst-case scenario seriously and just takes things as they come. Precisely. If, for example, the climate change scientists didn't operate this way, most would have put a bullet in their own head long ago. That's a cheery thought. I'd like to search the Chantry for Agathon's whereabouts. Our good sheriff already did that long ago. You'd just be wasting your time. And ours, for that matter. Didn't you say Helen was waiting for us, Skadir? Give the girl 15 minutes, Aisling. A minimal support for an ongoing investigation. And besides, she has a pr proclivity for finding things everyone else has overlooked. <laughs> Ten minutes. And if you attempt to pass this door or that one up there, I can't guarantee you'll walk out of here alive. Thank you very much, High Regent. Just get on with it. Ooh, this is cool. We're back into that weird thing again. <gasps> Sip Moon! My time here is practically up. 
and I've found nothing of use. Seems Agathon was completely dedicated to his work, even if his personal headquarters are as barren as it gets. No personal touch whatsoever. Nothing I could go by. Research, research, research. Seems like such a bore. Focus, Julia. What would you do if you were a warlock workaholic? Where would you leave clues to your whereabouts? What would you do if you found yourself in mortal danger and wanted Dakota to know? <gasps> the ghost! It's loose. Was that... Yeah. It was facing this way, huh? I approached the place where I saw the shadowy silhouette appear. It's a brick wall, and... One of the bricks is loose. Kandir and Aisling are in another room right now, still discussing the party. It's not that bad. You ought to learn how to find humor in the little things. It's demeaning, Shadow. That's all that is to it. It's time. I work the brick loose until I can grip it. Then I tug it as silently as possible, revealing a hole in the wall. Inside, there's a book. I browse through it quickly. Agathon's diary. Bingo. Your ten minutes are up. So are your fifteen minutes, in fact. Are you done here? If I could just get five more minutes, I still feel like I could stumble upon something here if I could just look a little more. No way, Julia. Time to go. Fine. I put the brick back and take the diary with me. It did look like Agathon left it, so that someone in the Chantry could find it. Presumably the High Regent. But my investigation takes priority for now. I bid Kadir and Aisling adieu and start looking for a secluded place to read the diary. Ooh, this is cool. This place right here should be secluded enough for me to browse through the diary in peace. I start quickly skimming the book, singling out sentences and paragraphs that look interesting, trying to get a general idea of what kind of person Agathon was. Uh, or is, I hope. Oh, that's such a cool picture, too. Man, such good art in this game. Uh, the more I read, the clearer the image of the person becomes. He's been working under the High Regent for 15 years. There's an underlying shame in the way he talks about Tremere magic. He always describes himself as too slow on the uptake, too late to learn something, too much of an amateur. He was really into tying his self-worth to his wisdom. The entries beginning in 2012 are terrifyingly regular. The handwriting is extraordinarily neat. The author's absolute dedication to his studies is palpable. If there's anything to his unlife besides work, it's his relationships with the three important women he holds dear. The first is his master, Aisling whom he reveres for her knowledge, stoicism, and willingness to experiment. I was hoping to find some details about her secretive work here, but no dice. Looks like he was willing to risk some someone finding all about his inner life, but not anything that could harm her studies. Well, yeah, because he holds her in high regard, right? So that makes some sense. A good pupil serving a mentor. I'm jealous. Whoa. But maybe it's just excuses? He strikes me as the kind of person who spends most of his time inside his head. Doesn't sound like someone you could have a fulfilling romance with. Alright, let me just make sure I didn't miss anything. Oh, I did miss something. Shoot, I missed a lot. Um, a good pupil serving a good mentor, I'm jealous. The second is another warlock, his ex-lover, Juno. Oh, the Juno incident! Uh, whom he feels guilty about. They had a conflict in which Aisling was involved. Having to choose between the two, he chose Aisling. According to Agathon, there was never real love between him and Juno. First, it was just shared interests, then a growing disconnect and ultimately guilt, which made him feel responsible for her. Huh. Interesting. Wow, I missed quite a lot. Uh... Oh, she's thinking about it. We can dwell on it a little bit. 
Oh god, Julia, this is not the time to revisit the time you pettily perceive as ground zero for your fucked up mental state. I mean, it, it was worth a try. Anyway. Last but not least, Agathon's mortal grandmother, Sylvia. She is the light... Uh, she is the light of his life and the person who took care of him after her, his parents died in a ritual murder. Not quite what I expected. Wow, this guy has a very... Interesting backstory, doesn't he? Jeez. I, I'm, I'm kind of, like, intrigued. And I still want to know what the decision between Aisling and Juno was about, because that actually might be very interesting. Um, where were we? Here we go. Family used to serve a cruel vampire in Mexico City, and it was retribution for their escape. Interesting. Hmm. She was the lead Tremere. She was the lead Tremere used to track him down, actually? Oh, wow. That's interesting. Wait, wait, wait. So, are they saying that the vampire in Mexico City was the one who was trying to track him down? Or was the grandmother originally the one? I don't know. He was keeping her alive for a long time, but a few months ago, her heart gave up. Agathon blamed his insufficient skills. The kind of man who carries the entire world on his shoulders. Oh, that's why he went full on into work. He felt guilty about his grandma's death, the Juno incident. Left alone with Aisling, he drowned himself in work and eventually burned out. But it doesn't sound like Sylvia's death was the only event that triggered his depression spiral. There was some kind of incident back in 2019. He doesn't cite specifics. Another thing he was worried about writing down? It's all vague mentions of a person who made him fly too close to the sun. Ah, an Icarus reference. I appreciate that. I'm a man of Greek mythology myself. I appreciate a good Greek myth from time to time. Whatever happened, it had the same effect as his grandma's death. New York stopped feeling like a home to him. It became alien, empty, grotesque. His words. I checked the first page. There's a recent photograph of him glued to the inner side of the cover. He's facing away from the camera, only showing his profile, and striking a rather dramatic pose. At first, it looks kind of poserish to me. However, upon closer inspection, it seems like a goodbye photo. The final melancholic glance he throws in your direction before disappearing for good. There's also a single black feather. No idea what that means. Something's written next to the photograph with a lot, lot of flourish. It looks like a poem. More than annoyed. Sad. More than sad, unhappy. More than unhappy, suffering. Oh, this poor guy. More than suffering, abandoned. More than abandoned, alone in the world. More than alone, exiled. More than exiled, dead. More than dead, forgotten. The Sedative, 1917 by Marie Laurenson. Looks like he wrote it down recently. It might have resonated with his emotional state over the past few months. More importantly, it seems to confirm his intent with this diary to me. The general idea seems to be, his research will outlive him, so he doesn't even detail it. Still, he wanted some kind of tangible memory of who he was left for posterity. But that's not all. There's still a mystery to be solved. Quite a few of the pages toward the end are missing but it doesn't look like they were necessarily removed to redact information. They were torn off in a way that makes it clear the paper wasn't ever used. What's more, the preceding pages are empty as well. Ooh, now we're getting somewhere. Okay, so let's recap here about what we just learned about this guy here, right? So this guy that we're reading about, he made a journal to talk about 
who he was as a person and his feet. He basically had a thought journal, right? There's a thing um, that a lot of people do when they feel like really high anxiety or even like a depression or some people just really don't have those problems and they just need to really get certain things under control mentally, psychologically, whatever. They write down a memoir. They write down a diary, a journal, whatever. And here it seems like this guy was so focused on his work because he had all this crap happen to him in his life. Like we, we just read how his parents were killed in a ritual murder. His grandma and him escaped. He lived in New York with his grandmother and tried to keep her alive for as long as he could. At that same time, you know, he, he started working with Aisling and then Juno happened. And then Aisling and Juno had made him choose between the two of them and he chose Aisling. And might be connected to the mysterious Juno incident, but we don't really know right now enough. So... After all that happened, and this other thing that happened in 2019, supposedly, he also lost his grandmother, which made him spiral into a depression. So he really felt like he needed to just disappear. Felt like everything he did didn't matter. He felt like his work will outlive him as a person, but nobody's going to remember him as a person. So he left the journal for someone to find so that they could remember him as he was and not the man who's tied to whatever it is that he's doing. However, now we're finding that there's these torn pages, which makes it clear paper wasn't ever used. And it makes me wonder if he took the pages with him to write something down. Maybe the there was something on the pages, and I don't really know what's going on. But I think that's a general idea of where we're at right now. God, this is getting so interesting now. Could it be that... That's when it happens again. I notice a bizarre shape in my peripheral vision. Bleed. I turn to catch a glimpse as fast as possible, but it's already gone. If my heart could beat faster right now, it would be jumping out of my chest. It's discomforting. I've been seeing these apparitions ever since I turned into this. The worst part is, I feel they were always there. Even as a mortal, they were there sometimes in the corner of my eye, disappearing when I tried to look directly at them, making me think it was just my mind playing tricks on me. But when you're part of the Night Clan, there are times they don't disappear. There are times they talk. Times they try to force you to do their bidding. And worst of all... No, I don't want to think about it right now. Still, in my experience, they aren't exactly, I don't know, consciously mal malevolent. This one in particular was trying to... help? I open the book on the first empty page and look around to make sure nobody's staring. Then I cut myself using a razor I keep in my pocket, just in case. It's not a deep slice. Just want to let a, f a droplet of Vita fall onto the... Gosh darn it. <laughs> fall onto the page. There we go. Gosh. I know what the word was. I just want to make sure there's nothing else. That's when the letters appear. Oh, there's the ghost. I saw it. Oh, it's this guy, Callahan. Look at me, a trick clown. No longer confident that any of my people can be trusted. I turn to a f spick. A Camarilla spick at that. Reserved contempt. Oh, it's Agathon. Oh, I like his jacket. What are you waiting? For boy, laugh at me. Ridicule is all I di- v Nothing. Was he mute? I wonder if he was mute. Come on, don't just... Like an idiot. You want to say something? Say it. Oh. Interesting. What the hell? This is the last thing I expected to happen. This diary's haunted. Oh, more skimming through. A series of quickly changing sentences and images composed of shadows and blood give me a window into another reality. It's not an objective view. It's like scattered remnants of emotions, similar to a half-remembered dream, full of holes, 
but an honest expression of one's mind. Might it be interacting with me? It's just a hypothesis, but I don't know why else it would show me Callahan. And was that Ellis Island? Right. This time, I don't even look in its direction. The voice makes me feel oddly confident about what I need to do. I pick up the feather that was in the diary and dip it in my Vita. Then I write down... Contempt, compassion, confusion. Try con let's try contempt. Let's try contempt. Oh, we need to give him a voice. You sold out your ideals long ago, old man. You're a shithead. A coward. A bigot. A failed leader. Hated by everyone serving you. Of course I have nothing but contempt for you. <laughs> Good. Fine. Some honesty. Now we could talk to each other like equals. It doesn't feel like this is the way these events took place. It's more like a way to explore Agathon's emotional truth about the way it all unfolded. In any case, the diary's reacting to me, and some shade of the truth is better than nothing. It's a handy tool, and if I use it right, I might find some clues that could aid me in my investigation. Do not overuse this diary, Julia. That's not good. I, I don't trust it. This reminds me of the diary from Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets. I don't trust it. Don't, do not trust it. At all. There are a few thoughts floating around in my head, like alien entities trying to make their way out. Is that also an effect of the diary's power? Let's try... Death... Destiny and dream. Say like destiny. I'm curious. What is the destiny you see in front of you? There are two paths I see laid out in front of me. The first one is freedom, bought with a horrible price. The set is utter and complete debasement. But you haven't decided on one of these paths yet. No, but I'm a f choice might have already been made for me. God damn it, what are the two of you talking about? Why did you meet? Let's try Ella's Island. Why did you pick this place to meet anyway? It's secluded. And in the air here that makes all the blood magic go haywire, which is especially important. Because of me. You're still afraid I might be the part of the experiment? No. Because... Devil woman. Blood running cold. Uh-oh. All the scribblings disappear and another set starts taking their place. Ooh, we're getting somewhere, guys. We're getting down to the murder mystery. The diary conjures an image of a completely different place. I instantly get a feeling of deja vu. I process the space differently. The atmosphere is different, more familiar, homely. But this is unmistakably the Tremere Chantry I visited earlier tonight. And standing there is just the person I'd expect. Uh-oh. Looks like that's it for my meeting with Callahan. God damn it. But what if the person he was talking about and eliciting a strong emotional reaction from was Aisling. The diary awaits my next command. Let's try why. Hi, Regent. Why? Why? You can't be serious. These exped resources, and I wouldn't be able to provide all the needed materials in a reasonable time frame all by myself. It's quid pro quo. And it's not like my research isn't helping all kindle it in a run. I don't feel comfortable being a part of this at all. I always thought we were busy with science, not politics. These are the words of a child, I get. Science has always relied on politics, and politics on science. Not like this, High Regent. Don't embar- Me, Agathon. Not like this. The moving scribblings disappear again. 
I hastily let another drop of blood fall on the page. What appears this time is another familiar face. Oh, it's this guy. Ah, yes. Agathon. What is that you wanted to tell me? Oh. Oh, you goddamn rat. You goddamn rat. I beg your pardon? The harpy vanishes. Yeah, right. As if I could ever gather courage to say this to your face. But the least I can do is try to stab you in the back. The diary ends here. Gosh darn it. Oh, we ran out of leads. The diary page ends here. I spit a little more vitae on the page, but it no longer works. I suppose that's it. Still no idea what happened to Agathon. Is he alive? Is he dead? Maybe Dakota's right. I've been a glass half-empty buzzkill too often. I will brace for the worst, but hope for the best. The way he left his diary for someone to carry on his work, hints he strategically left inside it. He's got this all planned out, no doubt about it. I choose to believe I will see him again one night. Maybe I'll even compliment that jacket he has. Yo, you should. That was a cool jacket. That was a cool jacket. In any case, I think it's time to pay a visit to the art hole. I know Arturo tends to leave the Elysium quite often to take in some fresh air and, mes and message people on his Blackberry, so I just wait till I see him. The tactic works. He's surprised to see me. Miss Winsky, shouldn't you be busy with your investigation? I am, actually. Which is why I've come to see you. That's peculiar, because I'm absolutely sure I have nothing to do with this case. Aren't you barking up the wrong tree? That's what I'm here to find out. I assumed you'd want to see I'm um, thorough. Yes, sure, I suppose it's commendable. What is it then? I have reasons to believe that in the last few months, you, the High Regent, Aisling, Sturbridge, and her child, Agathon, were involved in a secretive scheme. His expression changes ever so imperceptibly, but the difference is palpable. For the first time ever, he looks at me as a person. Up until now, I was just an amusing diversion. Now I'm something more, and he doesn't like it. What gave you this idea? Not at liberty to say. If you really want to know, ask the sheriff. Of course, Kadir doesn't know anything. But he's the only one in the court that Arturo has repeatedly failed to influence. He'll think twice before approaching him. I failed to see how this matter relates to the task at hand. Oh, you little shit. It definitely it does. <laughs> you son of a bitch. We got you now. We got you on something. I have every reason to think Baron Callahan was involved, and that he might have had grounds to fear for his life because of said scheme. He's tense now. Do I have the upper hand? Oh, those three were in cahoots doing some secretive shit. And now it's coming back to haunt them. Ah, uh, I can't, I, I'm, I'm super stoked to see where this goes now. I'm actually hella excited. He's tense now. Do I have the upper hand? Miss Sawinski. Please, answer the question. The delicate matter you're speaking of has absolutely nothing to do with Baron Callahan's grim fate. It's a strictly confidential affair. It would be wise of you to stop pursuing it. It would be wise of you to fuck off. <laughs> yeah, you tell him, Julia. I can't be an investigator if I'm not allowed to properly investigate. This matter's unrelated to your work and should be treated as such. I am 100% convinced Prince Panhard would agree. If you insist on pursuing it further, we can take it up to the Prince and see if her stance differs from mine. But I think you aren't as naive as to waste your ti her time this way. And besides... She'd certainly want you to present the basis for your discovery to the court. Could you handle it? I have no response, goddammit. This is his for this is his revenge for invoking Kadir, isn't it? I thought so. Is the High Regent inside? She is, but don't worry. 
I'll make sure to tell her not to waste your precious time, Miss Sawinski. So that's how you're gonna play it, you bastard. Well, I guess you win this round. A strategic retreat is my only choice here. I don't have a full deck of cards yet, but just you wait. In a few nights... In a few nights we're gonna get you, you little shit. Hmm. I'll take my leave, then. Yes. Do that. And if I may be so blunt, focus on the investigation avenues that aren't, that aren't utterly imbecilic and suicidal to pursue, miss. I bid you adieu. I curse him out under my breath as he disappears inside the art hole. Guess this avenue really is cut off for me, at least for now. Three names left on the list. I still have some leads to go by, but for now, it's getting late. I should go to St. Patrick's and file my report. Oh, we're back here. When I reach the cathedral, Father Leonard is already there. He's not exactly the most punctual person, so I always feel relieved to see him from afar. Time to move in and move out before I'm noticed by Benoit. Will this be all? I guess so. I rattled off most of it in a hurry on the way here. I'll come up with a more exhaustive report tomorrow night. Busy? Looks that way, Father. Our wayward girl's finally been recognized by her superiors. Here we go again. Of course he had to sneak up on me. If even you heard about that, I guess that means every single kindred in the five boroughs knows. I know you're an expert when it comes to knowing who's saying what and where. But the last time we met, you promised to share that knowledge with me. Yeah, I was kind of lying. That's the Ninth Commandant Broken Father. Shouldn't you scold her? <laughs> don't, 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 don't involve me in your silly games, Benoy. The way you fall for obvious lies stems from your biscuit failing in communication. And that is... You only pay attention to the what that's being said, and not the how. That's... Booyah, motherfucker! <laughs> Suck it! Annihilated with an absolutely flawless diagnosis. <laughs> oh, poor Father Leonard. He's trying so hard. Don't, don't make me regret siding with you. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry, Father. It won't happen again. Especially if you promise to keep verbally destroying that clown. You're in a strange mood tonight, child. Go get some sleep. Yeah, we'll continue this tomorrow. I'm not showing up here tomorrow. Yes, you are. Stop breaking the Ninth Commandment. See you around, Julia. He says my name in a sickly sweet way that gives me the creeps. I bow to Father Leonard and do my best to ignore Benoit. And head for Dakota's place. Dakota's place. Finally, my haven. Hey! Hey! Another tough night? You don't know the half of it. You want a drink? She points to her neck. I manage to summon a faint smile. I love to, but you know we can't do this too often. Maybe tomorrow. You want to talk, then? Yeah, I guess so. Just not about work, okay? I sit down next to her. Not about work. Got it. Well, what's on your mind, then? Uh, the past, I guess. Meaning? How spotty our memories are. And how, despite that, that's what we build our convictions on. Sorry it's so banal. I'm just tired. And frustrated. Well, let's talk about something more specific then. What do you remember about the time we first met? The time we first met? Yeah! Shit. <laughs> Not a lot, actually. Those were gloomy, anxious days. I think I subconsciously replaced most of them with blank spaces. I remember you trying to paint your hair black. 
Ouch! Don't take out my trauma now, okay? I remember that when we first talked, we talked about... H H Hausu? Hasu? I don't know. Don't say Hasu. It's low-key racist, I think. Okay, good to know. I don't know what that word means, so I will take the game's word for it. Nobody ever knows what you mean by house. Ah, uh, that show with the asshole doctor? No, the Japanese haunted house horror film that feels like it was written by a seven-year-old with ADHD. In the best way. In the best way, duh. We were arguing about which characters from the movie both of us are. Wow, that voice hurts my throat. Ugh. You were Kung Fu. I ended it up as proof, which was rude. You were dressed up like a total nerd. Not my fault. What was the deal with that suit? I liked that suit. Yeah, it was okay. I remember helping you out with graphic design whenever you needed it. Funny. I remember you needing help with writing as something that tended to happen far more often. Yeah, we develop a fun, shared aesthetic with similar surface concerns. And it bonded us together even before we made sure we were fully compatible deep down as human beings. Hell, I'm not still not sure we are. Especially now, with me not being a human being anymore. Well, duh. But hey, at least we both agree that this bedroom feels super comfy. Wait a second. Is there a ghost in the room? You guys saw that too, right? In the left corner, by where the flashing little light is. Where the lamp is, on the left. Look, there it is! Uh-oh. Uh-oh, that's not good. I remember always feeling left out of your social circles. Always knocking at the door from the outside. Oh, forget it. My social circles were full of out-of-touch, snobby assholes. Yeah, but it felt weird how much they avoided me. And there was that one time with Isabella. All of a sudden, one thing Isabella said at that one party flashes in my mind with startling clarity. After midnight, in that kitchen, without context, she just walked up to me and... She'll isolate you. She will suck you dry and she'll move on to the next target. That's the only thing she knows. Ugh, don't remind me of Isabella. She always resented me. It's been so long, and it's all baseless conjecture now, but what if... What if she really did isolate me on purpose back then? Uh-oh. Nah. Glass half full. Past the Schrodinger's cat and all that. Better to believe in the positive version of events. Come to think of it, friend or foe, if you don't believe they're on your side, they will know it one way or another, and then it's 100% certain they won't be on your side. Maybe optimism really is the way. Yeah, forget Isabella. L let's just drop this talk. I'm frustrated enough. I, I, I need to reset. Sounds like a good idea. Off to sleep? Yeah... Gotta get ready to go back to hell tomorrow. All right. I'll, I'll get back to work. You're working remotely again? Yeah, my office is going insane for so many reasons. And I'm getting cabin fever, too. Get some sun. It'll be good for you. <laughs> Look, who's <ta> <laughs> Look who's talking. Good night, sunshine. Good night. Hey, we finished another day. Time to rest. Oh, oh, oh. Oh, there's new stuff happening. A few minutes after I wake up, I see a message slipped under the apartment's door. Kadir? Yep. Looks like he's got a short window to meet me in Queens a few hours from now. Will its point? A single suggestion. Get ready for action. Fine, then. I will. Best way to do it would be to clear my head. Just walk without thinking. Reset the framework. Some fresh air should do it. Maybe a chance meeting with someone could get me out of this mental rut. Let me look at the world from a different angle for a while and improve my mood. 
Although, when it comes to improving one's mood, nothing beats some crimson red pouring down my throat. Not to mention these cigarettes taste best with a full stomach. Let's -a go! Oh, hide and seek for dummies. I'm being tailed. Last thing I need right now is a weirdo stalker following my every step. Did I take this investigation too far? Or, that's my table. No place like home, and I need a little piece. Big beat burger. Here I come. Wait, who's this loon? Ooh, we got a vampire and some weird and some other guy. Hmm. Hmm. Well, uh, I think... Well, that... Hmm. I mean, it'd be interesting to see what the stalker guy does, but the thing with the table... Hmm. Yeah, let's go to the table. And again, I find myself at the entrance to my sanctuary. Current vibe? Not exactly an embodiment of Joe de Vere, but unburdened by my usual self-loathing. All in all, a pretty decent frame of mind. Beware, Big Beat Burger. Something wicked this way cometh. And poof! Just like that, my mood is ruined. All it took was a single step through the door. What the heck? Some swivel-eyed loon took my seat. Her legs are crossed over the table, dirty shoes staining my chipboard altar. Oh, come on! Her clothing style is obviously meant to look eccentric and patchwork, but comes off as tragically derelict. There's nothing coincidental in her table choice. And it's not just because there's plenty of free spots tonight. She oogles me with those beady lies, daring me to come and try her. Oh, boy. Oh, what joy. I give the guy at the till, Benny, I think his name was, a quick glance. No response. Unsurprising, he's a veteran. He knows better than to get involved. Is this supposed to be a message? Long shot, but a reminder of the Camarilla's watchful eye, maybe? Everything about this lady... Her hairstyle, mannerisms, lipstick smeared nowhere near her actual li lips... Screams lunatic. Oh, great. I'm not the type that fights tooth and nail to get the other bats out of her cave, but I'm not going to just sit back down for no good reason either. I quietly take a seat right in front of her and wait. Yeah, you crazy-haired weirdo hag, I can be patient too. We spend the next five minutes in silence. She just sits there and glares at me without blinking once. Oh dear. She does look frantic. Another few minutes go by. Dragging on indefinitely. She's chewing some red bubblegum with a wide-eyed grin that makes Jack Nicholson's trademark smirk look like Mr. Rogers' beaming smile. Not gonna lie. Chew. That munching. Chew. Is getting chew on my nerves. Keep your cool. I'm perfectly aware... All this theatrically serves only one purpose, to get under my skin, make me act against my better judgment. It's chew. Surprisingly effective, I'll give her that. But I'm not an idiot. I will just take the chill pill, try my best to remain in control. She uncrosses her legs in a strangely seductive motion. In her mind's eye, it probably looked like Sharon Stone in Basic Instinct, but in reality it had all the grace of a tracksuit slab squatting. Ugh. Geez, it seems we're going to be here a little while longer. I pull out a cigarette from my crumpled package and light it casually, as if I wasn't bothered at all by the invader. Before I could take a single puff, the nut job snatches the cigarette out of my mouth. Oh, what kind of voice are we going to give her? <laughs> Don't mind if I do. We'll do that. Who do you... She cuts me off mid-sentence. Shh. No talking. You need to get back to your happy place. I try to hold the impetus to rip her face off. She picks up after a few seconds. I don't like you. Uh, I don't hate you either. Uh, not yet, at least. Sheesh. I'm a good judge of character, but yours still eludes me. Get to the fucking point. She flicks the ash off the cigarette in a fluid motion and takes a long puff. No exhaling. The smoke comes out of her mouth. While she speaks, like her intestines caught on fire. My special friend asked me to note your every step, to, to judge your every move and to count your, uh, your every failure. And believe me, 
when I started this job, <laughs> I thought there would be a lot less counting. Who is she talking about? Panhard? Kadir? Torque? She tilts her head in an upsettingly canine manner. Oh god, wait, is she a, is she a Garu? Uh-oh. I thought she was a vampire, but is she a Garu? Oh. Oh no. That, um... That, uh... Mmm. Mmm. Mm hmm Yeah, uh, no, that's scary. If she is a Garu. Little girl, I run all sorts of charts and graphs on you, and they all pointed to the same result. Useless hussy. Can you help your sister out and illuminate me as to what all the fuss is about? Oh, 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 oh boy. You know, every time I always say that things are definitely getting interesting, but this, this is starting to get a little weird, right? Ever since we cornered that one guy, all of a sudden she's being tailed, and people are keeping an eye on her. It's kind of weird, I gotta say. Oh god. D don't want to help? Come on. I if you're a good little doggy, you might get a biscuit. That is fucking terrifying. No, <laughs> I don't like this at all. <laughs> I don't like this. I don't know why, but a part of me is like, I want to feel like she's a Garu from Werewolf the Apocalypse. Oh, actually, she could be a ghoul, though. Hmm. 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 So, as if all that bullshit wasn't enough, she taps my nose like I'm some fucking puppy. Oh, no, you did. Oh, no, you didn't. Mm -mm -mm. You want to get nuts? Okay, let's get nuts. Uh, dominate, lash out, or calm down. Let's try dominate. Get the fuck out of here. I try to bore into her mind like I did with people before, but my body suddenly twists and stiffens. Oh god, we failed. <laughs> Shit. <laughs> oh no, we failed. Forcing my limbs into a bizarre state that's not unlike rigor mortis. She seems elated by my state, sending a meaningful smirk my way. The kind of expression that says, you fucked up. Bark, bark, little pup. In a last-ditch attempt to subdue her, I peer into her eyes. But all I can see is that smile and her sable eyes. The stars of black. What the fuck? Where are we now? What? Yeah, that's what I, Julia, that's what I'm saying. What the? There's dirt under my nails. Are those leaves? Why are there leaves in my hair? What's that awful taste? Pleh. Adding to my bewilderment, the thing that drops from my jaws is a grimy femur. It falls straight into a hole in the ground. One that I must have dug by myself, judging by the state of my hands. Oh, because I tried to mess with her, she turned me into a puppy. Oh, I get it now. I'm covered in mud from top to bottom. My clothes are crumbled and torn in a few places. How much time did I spend on all fours? Fuck. I rarely expect to keep a good thing going, but I really looked like I was in for a decent evening. No dice. All I can do now is clean myself up best I can and make up for lost time. Shit. I feel spiritually tainted. If any cat cafe was opened at this time of night, I'd go there to recover. Let's move on. Time to get back to work. I step inside the subway and head for my meeting with Kadir. Oh, for fuck's sake, I thought you were kidding. Nope. Couldn't reach her. But I know for a fact Hope is here. He's pointing in the direction of a double spiral. B oh, shit. Double spiral. Oh, no. Well, it was going to happen eventually, guys. It was going to happen eventually. And what is she doing there? I understand she's the current leader of the company. Acting CEO, to be exact. 
No, 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 no. You're pulling my leg. Of all the places in this city. The company that brags about creating IT solutions for the future. Always surrounded by rumors of monstrous workers abuse. All sorts of ethical violations trading information with governments. And ending the career of a certain promising journalist and professional fuck-up who attempted to investigate them seriously. You might be able to ask her both professional and personal questions. Two birds with one stone. I don't get it. Last time I checked, the company belonged to Sarah Montgomery. I'm told she quietly took a sabbatical a few months ago. And it looks like the kind of sabbatical you don't come back from. <laughs> Corporate backstabbing? Not a single corporate shark is as good as drawing blood as a patrician kindred. Pretty sure there's bigger powers involved. Ooh, what's up? What's that? Clan Venture. Ooh, real Wall Street type motherfuckers. The name of the game with the Venture is Power and Wealth Bar None. The historical leaders of the Camarilla, they hold more position of power than any other clan, and that won't be changing anytime soon. They believe in lineage above all. Who a sire chooses as child can make or break her position in the clan. The Venture often aim to embrace well-connected and those at the apex of their industries. A common criticism is that their goal is nothing less than domination over all kindred, no matter what the cost. Whispered nicknames you might hear behind their backs include Little Lords, Borgias, Borgias? Borgays? and Tyrants. While more respectful ones would be Blue Bloods, Patricians, or Warlords. Unsurprisingly, Prince Panhard is one of them. Perhaps partially due to the fact her sire was Prince up until her untimely demise in 1999. A lot of them hate the Lasombra with a passion. Ooh, maybe that's why Prince Panhard was okay with us taking this mission, because they don't really like Lasombras very much, so she's like, well, if the Lasombra fails, who cares? But if she succeeds, at least she was useful. Interesting. Oh boy. I remember I was shocked when I first learned that one of my nemeses back in my old life was a vampire all along. When I realized her position made her untouchable, I was beyond mad. Well, whatever happened, it couldn't happen to a nicer person. What about her brother, Jesse? You're asking me? Last time I checked, you were the expert on this company. I just handled the basic intel for you, even though I shouldn't even really be here. Yeah, and I hope you realize I'm grateful. <laughs> you better be. Yeah, you know, Julia, I hate to say it, but I agree with Kadir here. He's really sticking out his neck for us. So is Horp just another corporate shark? Well, she is the child of Carter. A theatrical pause. He smiles as he sees me wince. But very much unlike him, he took her in for her particular multifaceted talents related to the internet knowing he's hopelessly behind the times in that regard. I uh, hear she's been unruly, though. Well, unruly is good. I can work with unruly. You're telling me she might not be a stuck-up startup bitch? Language. As I've told you a few times now, when it comes to the internet, just assume I haven't the slightest idea. I'm getting there myself. I haven't been able to check my email for five months. I have no idea what the kids at BBB are talking about most of the time. Oh my god, am I be getting old. <laughs> don't worry, the moment you realize you don't give a damn about most fads you would have cared about years ago is a liberating one. Been there, done that, at the beginning of the 20th century. Old. Yeah, he is old. Wow. 
He is very old. Anyway, you'll probably hear Hope's story straight from the horse's mouth. I don't have much time, so I'll get straight to the point. You shouldn't be looking at anything in the main building. It's just a front. Ignore it. What you want to do is use the elevators to get to the lowest floor of the building. Psh! I heard stories about the double spiral basement, but I had no idea what to make of them. Every source told me a different rumor. Did any of them tell you a rumor about an army of underground ghouls? No, but I'm all ears. I am too. I actually would like to know what we're getting into. Especially if, uh, you know, things are going to be happening and uh, I best uh, be prepared. And all that. Double Spiral employs an army of ghouls as a cheap workforce. They work and live underground, away from prying eyes, with lesser rights than regular keen employees. Perfect for business. Wow. I'm actually speechless for a second. I had profoundly low expectations at that company, but every time I learn something new about what's going on behind the scenes, I am still surprised at the level of scumbaggery at play. I'll leave the moral judgments to you, expert. In any case, you need to reach room 507, where the CEO supposedly resides. And then? Get hope to answer your questions. His old-timey flip phone vibrates. Speaking of... If you've got any left for me, it's now or never. I'm needed at the art hole now. Best approach. How should I approach the building? I've told you everything I know. Just do what I do all the time. And that is? Scout the situation and then decide. Right, I forgot that's what you do all the time. You mean scouting? No, stating the obvious. <laughs> the phone vibrates again. Well, that's it for me. Arturo's pestering me to show up at the Elysium five minutes ago. Tell him I kindly suggest he should go fuck himself. He fucking should. Fuck that guy. Not in a thousand years. Good luck with your mission, soldier. With a mock salute, he disappears inside his car and drives away. Nothing left for me but to head in. Still, I'm anxious. There are two approaches to choose from, and whichever I pick, I will have to stick with it. If I force my way in and assert my authority bad cop style, that should make an impression. Bad bitch coming in with the entire court behind her back, bluffing her way to victory. Sneaking in and politely asking for cooperation seems like the less disruptive, more me option, but it's not like being me has taken me anywhere thus far. Shit. Kind of wish I was still stuck in my routine where I didn't need to be doing things like developing a personality. Bit of a coin flip, honestly, but I gotta make a choice here. How do I approach the double spiral? Time to be aggressive. Ooh, a trick got updated. Yeah, being covert hasn't exactly been working out for me. Time to show them and myself, I guess, who's boss. As far as I'm concerned, out of all the companies in the world, this one deserves to be thrown out of gear the most. Time to be a bad cop and finally get somewhere. Alright, let's do this. Oh god, here we go. Oh boy. I enter through the front door. There's a guard watching the security cameras. He stands up, expecting me to state my business. Shut up! I'm expected. It's not hard to fuck with his mind. He gives me a confused nod, slumps in his seat, and zones out. Yeah, dude, probably for the best. I enter the elevator and press the button to the lowest floor. I pump myself up a bit as the elevator descends. Hello, Double Spiral. Time to make a mess. Oh, shit. What the hell? Whoa. This looks crazy. When I leave the elevator, I immediately head into the corridor in front of me and announce my presence. Yoo-hoo! Anybody home? Big bad kindred out here! Better answer before I start making a mess! A pink-haired girl emerges from one of the corridors, looking quite angry. Probably one of Hope's ghouls. 
Oh, it's there. It's her. It's her from the club. Stop right there. Who the hell are you? Julia Sawinski, the La Sombra representative for New York City. Who the hell are you? I'm Nastia, Double Spiral's head of security. I'm gonna have to ask you to leave. Wrong! You're gonna have to make me leave! I walk past her. She tries to catch me and stop me, but evading her grasp is child's play. Ghouls, I swear to god. Boss, we got a problem. Some lunatic waltzed right into the office floor, claims she's a lot. Uh, the door at the end of the hallway is made of reinforced glass. I focus all my strength and kick it in, interrupting the girl. Tell her I'll be right there. She's the only one I want. Oh, damn. <laughs> well, that went well. <laughs> damn, Julia. You're doing great so far, girl. Uh, I reach the double spiral offices where, just like Kadir said, hordes of ghouls are slaving away for their company. Deep learning, spyware, social media manipulation, yada yada. The important thing is, they don't even turn away from their displays as I keep sweeping gadgets off their desks onto the floor, making Nastia matter and matter. Don't make me use force. Oh, I'd love to see you try, ghoul. Even if you manage to put me down, I'd love to see you explain it to the sheriff, my direct superior. Listen, lady, I don't know what it is you want. I've already told you, stupid, I want your boss. She's not here. Sarah Montgomery is taking a sabbatical. Don't play fucking games with me. I want to see... Hope. Hey, you. Goofy-looking glasses guy wearing an anime t-shirt. Well, she's not talking to me. <laughs> Where can I find room 507? He raises his hand listlessly, pointing me in the right direction, prompting Nastia to kick his chair in frustration. I head that way and eventually reach the corridor I was hoping to find. Whoa. Oh, that's right. Because she's a La Sombra, technology doesn't work well against her. That's actually a cool image. Uh, I slowly walk to the end of the corridor. There it is, room 507. The door looks harder to take care of than the other ones. Probably won't be able to take care of it the same way I did the others. The door to the office of the current Double Spiral CEO. This fucking company... I get pissed off, but I'm trying to control it. There's a camera by the door. If she knows what to look for, she can probably see I'm on her screen. But just to make sure, I knock on the door. Hope, I'm a Camarilla detective and I will need you to answer some questions. Hope, I know you're in there. Open the door. I will not leave until you do. I am here on the behalf of the Sheriff of New York City. Hope... I keep pounding on the door and calling her name. After a minute or so, a voice rings out on the intercom. Is this thing on? I guess it is. All right, I got your message loud and clear. I'll meet you in the offices. Be right there. In the meantime, please refrain from making a mess of our offices, will you? Knowing poor Nastia, if she was due for a heart attack, she would have had it by now. Thank you for your cooperation. I'll be right there. Oh, she looks kind of cool. Oh, shit. What's up? On the one hand, clothes you could reasonably expect to find in any CEO's wardrobe. On the other hand, body covered in tattoos, flashy jewelry, dyed hair, and wild makeup. The thought she might be, yet another CEO playing the nonconformist crosses my mind. But she strikes me as someone who's more than happy to live in her own little bubble. Still, I won't be fooled. She is the boss of Double Spiral. So, uh, how did you find me? Sheriff Kadir al Asmai did. You'd have to ask him. I take out a new cigarette without thinking. 
You can't smoke in here, lady. Let her. Don't treat me like I'm your enemy. I come in peace. Peace, my ass. A deep, relaxing drag. Not my fault you couldn't handle me. I had at least five opportunities to subjugate you. I just chose not to because I had a hunch the boss might benefit from seeing you. You trust your hunches that much? Hunches have gotten me every job I've ever had. Hunches saved my life any time I got into a messy situation. These days, the reality is too complicated to rely on anything else. Can't find a better head of security than Amnastia, and her hunches are the main reason why. They're like a sixth sense. Uh, hmm. Don't I know you from somewhere? Corporal. Wouldn't take you for a brutal enforcer. I mean, duh, that's the idea. You want to be an unexpected threat. I mean, the whole rebel aesthetic versus the whole bloodthirsty corporate dog thing. Is that meant to be a disguise? Eh. Uh, always been into alternative shit and hating the system. And I've been dressing like this for a long while. Long before I got a taste of hope. No moral confusion about it? Nastia shrugs. Lady, in this city, we're all corporate dogs one way or another. I just cut out the middleman. More money for me. More time to pursue my own thing. So you're a sellout? Please, check the bio of any alt-music icon who presents themselves as a radical. Their parents? Always these rich fucks. Military, CIA, predatory loans, old money, whatever. They never own it. Always squirming anytime someone asks about the position of privilege they've used to sell their maverick image. Me, I have to get my own hands dirty to get anywhere, so I will. Quell surprise, I actually get her. That cynical attitude is too tempting. A kindred spirit, no less. Lovely chat, girls, but I'd love it if you saved it for later. I'm CEO now. I have a lot of duties I must pretend to handle. I just need to ask you a few questions. Sure, yeah. Call me if you need me. I've got a weird hunch about this one, too. What gave you that hunch, Nastia? The way I made a mess out of the entire floor you were supposed to protect? Tch. We'll talk security later, don't worry. This shit happens. For now, take five. Nastia leaves, and I'm left alone with Hope in the corner of the office. Feels funny to be standing here in front of you. Oh, and, uh, why is that? You people had me fired from my job before I was embraced. Ah, I see, or that, um, uh... Sawinski so girl from Lodestar. Yep. Somehow I never put two and two together. So you're the La Sombra rep for the city now, huh? As she's talking to me, she keeps tapping at her phone with terrifying speed. I don't feel like I have her full focus and it's getting on my nerves. Just so you know, I have no idea why you've taken Sarah Montgomery's place, and I doubt you tell me, but the bitch deserves to burn in hell. Hell yeah, she does. Oh, damn, she agrees. <laughs> Even Julia's like, oh. Oh, uh, okay. <laughs> I guess we're in agreement then. <laughs> 
Did you just admit? <laughs> Hold your horses. No. Jesus, this is why normal CEOs pay for PR people to talk for them. I only agreed that she's a horrible person in every way that counts. Nothing more. Does she know that's what you think of her? Why did she let you take her position in the first place? What? I will just cut through the bullshit, okay? Miss Lodestar, I uh, guess that this is about Jesse and Sarah covering his creepy ass. You've spent months on this case and you'd like some closure. Pretty much. <laughs> I mean, it'll be, yes. Yes, that's exactly what we want. Well, here's your closure. Double Spiral has severed practically all ties with them. They don't work here, they get no company money, and they probably won't ever show up here again. The company's not their circus anymore, and the workers are not their monkeys. I am in charge now. So yeah, if there's anything you'd like from me, I'm all ears. Wow, she's being very, um, cooperative. It wasn't just Jesse and his sister. This company has ingrained structures of abuse and immoral... I've ordered internal investigations and audits. Everyone related to these illicit activities was disciplined. Legal actions, firings, rebukes, all depending on the severity of their misdemeanors. I don't have a stomach for all of that creepy corporate shit, so I'm trying to steer this ship in the right direction. Don't know what else I can tell you. You've told us quite a lot, even if you're lying. For fuck's sake. <laughs> No matter how I look at it, it seems like she's done everything I hoped to achieve. The Montgomery clan is over. The queen bitch. A symbol of everything that's wrong with tech CEOs is gone. Jesse, that perverted embezzling son of a bitch, is gone. I should be glad. So... Why is there a pit in my stomach? Because you didn't do it, Julia. That's why you feel this way. Because you didn't get to do it. Someone else beat you to the punch. And I understand where you're coming from, but just let it go. Uh, you should make amends. That's capitalism. This doesn't feel right. Hmm. Hmm. You should make amends. Someone must take responsibility. Listen, I get why you're mad, but this is a corporation. Diffusing responsibility is what it does. Everyone who worked here was guilty. So were all of Double Spiral's clients, shareholders, etc., etc. I hated Montgomery, too. I took the company from her hands. As an outsider, now I'm the only person on a power trip here. All the... Ah, crap. Hang on. Let me, uh... No. No. Shoot. I keep going forward. No, stop. There we go. Let me... Let me keep going. Sorry, guys. I, I hit the wrong button. Uh, where were we? I took the company from hats as an outsider, and now I'm the only person on a public. All the fuckheads who disgusted me are gone. You want to hold me accountable? Sure. But hold me accountable for my own actions. Hell, these would be more than enough to put me away for life. The biggest case in my professional life... Solved by some weirdo who fucked Sarah and Jesse over in presumably underhanded ways. It doesn't get more anticlimactic than this. Fucking hell. I want to ask her how she did it. But why would she tell me? All I can guess is she's an outcast who decided to get her hands dirty and obtain power to do something she considered good. Something I have always been afraid to do. Alright, sorry that I missed all that. Let's go back to where we were. Anyway, I feel for you, but I have a lot of work to do. So, uh, if this 
wasn't it just a trip down memory lane and you have any other questions speak now or forever hold your peace okay i feel like a car just ran me over but i need to keep my shit together right <clears throat> a few days ago the anarch baron was found dead in his office are you familiar with the case douglas callahan of course i'm familiar Every kindred online is talking about it. And what are they saying? They're accusing everyone. <laughs> I mean, it is the internet. Are they accusing you? Why would they do that? I found a peculiar note in Callahan's remains. Had your name on it. Huh? What can you say about this? Nothing. I never met the guy. I've never even seen him. He wasn't my crowd. Then why would he have a note with your name in his pocket? Why were Walt Disney's last written words Kurt Russell? No clue. I watch her closely, but nothing suggests she's hiding anything. You know... I wonder if perhaps he had her name on a list because he saw her as a threat, right? Because if, if, if Callahan did dealings with Double Spiral, which I'm sure he did, then it would make sense if he was starting to find people that he considered threats and wanted to take them out. Or, or, the other side of it, maybe there were people he wanted to put in power. Interesting. Well, the note actually contained three other names and nothing else. Agathon, D'Angelo, Tamika. Ringing any bells? Her- Oh, shit, we found something! Ooh, 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 we got her. We got her on something. Her finger, which hasn't stopped moving across the touch screen since I first saw her, freezes. Yeah, it kinda does, actually. It's a short list of promising, unaffiliated kindred that was making the rounds in NYC a few months ago. In case anyone needed a hero for hire. Oh, I was right. Kind of. Huh. I didn't know Callahan had it. I know Sophie Langley did, as well as a few primogen. Not sh really sure about the Anox. Who could have prepared this list? One of the local informant brokers. A short but telling pause. Anonymous. How anonymous? Sort of anonymous. Oh, here we go. We're getting info. We're getting some clues. God damn it, it took us this long, but we're getting a clue. Uh, she's obviously conflicted about whether she should tell me. Or... Maybe she's pretending so that I, that I worm it out of her. Making a mess of her office has worked, so might as well put on the tough guy act again. I have nothing against them, Anonymous. Or, it's in my best interest to hurt them, Anonymous. Because if it's the latter, we might be in business. <laughs> she... <laughs> She briefly considers her options and says, Oh, well. <laughs> oh, shit. It's her sire? Whoa. That's a bombshell of info. It's my sire, Carter Vanderweeden. Oh. He's brokering information? Everyone knows that becoming the Prince of New York is his ultimate goal and that he wants to make friends in all the high places. 
sharing useful intel is a pretty effective way to achieve that. So you're telling me that he, a Malkavian primogen, sold this list to an Anarch Baron? Sure looks like it. Why would he suggest his own child to somebody? To have a person on the inside. Just another... Another way to further his information web. Wouldn't they realize you two were close? The story going around is he left me alone and I hated his guts. Well, <laughs> at least half of that is true. She's talkative. Probably sees me as a way to undermine Carter. Let's see how much further I can push her. Huh. I was wondering how someone like you could control a company like Double Spiral. I suppose a friend in high places would explain it. Yeah, lucky me. Hmm. Not happy about being rich, not happy about being boss, or not happy about ruining Montgomery. Not happy about being boss. Not happy about being a girl boss? Leading one of the biggest IT companies in the country? A boss, huh? Whoa, that's cool. She stares at dozens of displays on the wall in front of her. Do you remember the Y2K era internet? Jesus, I barely remember the internet at all. My people can't really use it. But yeah, I guess I sort of remember. Forums, GeoCities, Browser Wars, all those handmade amateurish web pages. It was a golden age. Everyone was welcomed to freely express their creativity and obsessions in this abstract new frontier. No formulated rules. Every site was a distinct new universe to explore. You know, as a kid, for some reason, kept saving every web page that moved or changed me in some way. I don't even know why I did it, but today a folder with these is one of my greatest treasures. Fast forward to today, I'm the boss of a company that has one overarching goal. Steer the online narrative in every possible way that benefits the Camarilla. And because the online world is so fucked right now, I can do it using only five websites or so. Every day I deploy thousands of believable sock puppets to force some belief on the masses. Right now, they're being managed by these ghouls. Soon, they'll be partially managed by AI. Basically, an all-American version of the Chinese 50 Cent Party. A new pattern of public opinion guidance. Ever since I was a teen, I've pretended to be different people online for fun. Aping the posting patterns of others was something I turned out to be horrifyingly good at. I became even better at it after the embrace. Something about the voice of Malkav in my head, and after several years I became a one-person internet empire. I could impersonate anyone. At I Dream of Tulips, a humble florist from Chattanooga, who strives to share positive energy with their audience using photos of beautiful bouquets, motivational quotes, and the occasional The Office gif. Vulva Hufflepuff, a single mum from Brighton who reckons all these trans women must be bonkers and spends seemingly every waking moment of her life having a row with anyone who disagrees. Polygon Classicist, a 19-year-old kid from Utah who keeps posting Y2K 3D renders of poorly proportioned, scantily clad ladies and telling his audience to remember what they took from you. Somehow this talent got me here, where it's no longer fun but work. Work I 
usually entrust to these ghouls because of all my duties. I want out before my entire fucking mind gets monetized. But Carter won't have that. So I'll keep doing my best for both him and Double Spiral's investors. So that's why she wants me to look at him. I assume most of your operations focus on New York City. A lot of them, yeah. How do you imitate a New Yorker voice with these sock puppet accounts? Living in Manhattan and being, uh, mentally unstable makes a shit easy. To a normal, well-adjusted person from outside the city, everyone here seems mentally unstable. Ever watched the 9-11 Howard Stern show? No. Check it out someday. It's educational. Ask anyone in NYC about it, and they're like, It was a great bonding moment. He was helping us make sense of everything. Kept saying what we were all thinking. Then you listen to it, and it's everyone yelling that we need to nuke something, maybe the entire world. Get rid of all the Muslims. Fuck human rights. No investigations. Take their oil. Cheery. You watch it. You study it. You witness that specific brand of humor in the face of tragedy. And you understand that nothing outside of NYC really exists for the people who live here. Or the vampires. A foundational text, really. Whenever I need to get in that New York mindset for work, I let it play in the background. Works like a charm. Seriously, give it a shot sometime. Someday I might. For now, I think I will confront Vander Whedon with what you've told me. Or is it what you haven't told me? What's the story? Me? <laughs> Of course I haven't told you anything. You're such a good investigator, you figured it out all by yourself. And if he asks, just tell him Kaiser sold you the info. That should do the trick. I see. Thank you. Wow, so it really shows that the, these vampires, no matter where you're from, no matter who you work for, they will always try to stab each other in the back. <laughs> what for? I did nothing. Let Nastia show you the way out. And if you don't know Van der Weeden's address... Just ask her. Here we go. Oh, we are back on the train. Oh, okay, well, that was weird. That was a weird transition. Oh, that was just a show, I think. Thank you for having me, Mr. Van Der Weeden. Oh, it's this guy again! Yes, I've been wanting to, I was wondering what happened to this guy. No need, no need. I'll be happy to assist your investigation in whatever way I can, Miss Sawinski. I freaking love this guy. I just I, I don't know why, but he just he looks he just looks amazing. That sickeningly sweet smile and this office. Spacious but oppressive. A man who knows how to subtly unnerve people. But does he even realize it? And I'm sure the presence of the esteemed Addison Payne will guarantee you I'm totally transparent. Am I right, Edison? Oh god, <laughs> it's him. He looks pissed. Oh god. Oh no. Oh no. This is not good. Looks like I've interrupted a friendly meeting. Yeah, we did. In a far corner of the room, I spot glasses of blood and two spittoons. Vices and follies of the rich. Are you sure I'm not wasting your time? Oh, this guy. Not at all. Busy as I might be, I can't say I'm not curious about the findings in your case. Yes, my thoughts exactly. So, how are you handling your newfound responsibilities, hmm? I'm managing. I'll start by asking the obvious. Where were you the night Douglas Callahan met his um, untimely demise? Vander Weeden raises an eyebrow and then lets out a restrained chuckle. 
<laughs> you, you, you hear that, Addison? I might be suspected of foul play. Exciting, isn't it? Carter, no antics, please. Just answer the question. Uh, of, of course, of course. Mm. Well, uh, well, I was right here. Just like I told Prince Panhard, as much as I love to celebrate my power, sometimes one has to celebrate the amount of work piling up on their desk. So your alibi is you were right here. Alibi? <laughs> well, yeah, I suppose. Can anyone back up your story? Well, I did make a few business-related phone calls as I was working, so there's that. That doesn't really answer my question, does it? Ooh. Ooh, we're getting somewhere with him. He regards me with a stare reserved for a troublesome child. Oh no. Miss Sawinski, this right here is my private little fortress. A space specifically designed to make me focus. I don't really let people in to break that focus. Aside from mm, occasional esteemed guests such as yourselves, of course. And a few wonderful Mexican women responsible for the cleaning duties. So you don't have an alibi. <laughs> the look at his eyes screams, Why won't you at least pretend to try and get on board with my program, kid? Wow, he... Okay, he's clearly... We're, we're definitely going to find something from him. I can already tell. I can already tell. There's something going on with him. I suppose, but <laughs> why would that matter? Because I found something that belongs to you on the victim's person. Ooh, here we go. Pardon me. Took the words right out of my mouth. We're not talking a murder weapon or something of that caliber, of course. No. No, it was a short list of four names. Unaffiliated kindred whose services could be useful to anyone interested in toppling the current power balance in NYC. Tamika, Hope, D'Angelo, Agathon. Uh, excuse me, Miss Sawinski, but uh, <laughs> I'm afraid I don't follow. Um, how is that something that uh, belongs to me? I have it on good authority that it's a short list you've been shopping around to anyone interested in NYC, be it the Camarilla or the Anarchs. Addison tenses up and his host is not happy about it. Th this is just preposterous! I'm calling your bluff right here, miss. Nope, the bluff is coming right now. Mr. Vander Weeden, if you want to voice concerns about the information I have, how about you voice them to Kaiser, not me? Addison, oh gosh, here we go. Addison's in on it too, I think. Addison turns to Vander Weeden, clenching his lips and gripping the wheelchair armrests tightly. Oh, the, the smile is gone. Oh no. Oh no, we hit a nerve. Oh no. Oh no. That was the face of a broken man. Oh no. For a brief moment, the ever-present smile on Vander Weeden's face goes missing, and the expression that replaces it reminds me of a horrifying void. Oh no. This... <laughs> wow. Wow, we really got somewhere with that one. Wow, okay, cool. Like a sneak peek into what's really going on in his soul. He quickly collects himself, but the image is burned into my retinas. <laughs> to, to think these sorts of unsavory rumors are circulating around me. I, I should be grateful you let me know. So you're denying it? Of course I'm denying it. Categorically. You can bet your life savings on it. I certainly hope that it's nothing more than an unfortunate blunder. Et tu, Brute? Come on, Addison. We've known each other for years. Yes. And what about it? I will... 
Sweet Jesus, Addison. I'll get back to you in a second. Any more questions, Miss Sawinski? Any of the names on the list sound familiar to you? No, I, I mean, yes. That, that is my long estranged child on your list. But, but that's just another reason why I'm flabbergasted that anyone would consider it mine. Hmm. I see. Well, I hope you understand why I'm considering you a prime suspect now. Yes, and I swear to clear my name as soon as possible. Scout's honor. Any more questions? I'm good for now. Sheriff Alice Mai will probably contact you later. I will get in touch with him myself. ASAP. Uh, once again, thank you for your work. He extends his hand toward me, practically forcing me to shake it. Then he puts his hand on my shoulder to lead me to the door. All too eager to see me off? Out of sheer curiosity, Mr. Vander Weed, nah, I have one more question. Might be a bit random. I really didn't need to ask it, but I wanted him to die inside for a moment. <laughs> oh, jeez. This poor guy. Well, actually, he might not be a poor guy. He might be a total ass hat. We don't even know. But of course, my dear. His slightly strained tone suggests I may have succeeded. You seem like a person who couldn't live outside of NYC. By chance, have you listened to Howard Stern's talk show after the World Trade Center fell? A tad unsure, but once again, carefully controlled chuckle escapes his mouth. <laughs> Jeez, that, that, that is random, uh, but well, uh... New York, born and raised, just like you said. Of course I did. Your opinion? Same as everyone else. It was the spiritual guidance we needed that day, coming from the unlikeliest of places. A visceral response that verbalized everything we felt. A beautiful moment of unity. Not that I'm into low-brow jokes about Pamela Anderson and the typical shock value that the show tended to offer, but eh, as far as I'm concerned, Howard did an indispensable thing that day. Why are you asking? Eh, no particular reason. It might give me some insight into the kind of person you are. Well, it's the kind of person I am. Just your average New Yorker. So it seems. Well, then I'll leave you and Mr. Payne to your plans of conquering the city. Conquering the... <laughs> now that's spicy. Addison, I love this girl. She's gonna go far, I'm telling you. She's got that spunk, that glint in her eye. Goodbye, Miss Sawinski. I wish you a pleasant respite and a swift success in your investigation. Good night. I make it a point to bow to Addison's servant, not the man himself. Doubt he even noticed, but at least these invisible displays of rebellion make me feel a little better about myself. <laughs> All right, the faster I leave, the better. Wow, we have really made a lot of progress in this investigation since we found that book and we went to go talk to that person. Julia. Father. How are you holding up? I'm fine. Stumbling around and hoping for a miracle to happen like always. No better place to ask for a miracle than behind these gates, you know. So I hear. As I pass him the report about Aisling and Agathon, I look around, but Benoit is nowhere to be seen. Finally a one-on-one -on -one chat. Ignore his absence. Uh, let's ask where Benoit is. So, um, where's that clown? You mean Benoit. You're the one who said it, not me. <laughs> <sighs> In another parish, taking care of a personal issue for me. Thought you might appreciate that. God, I really do. <laughs> Listen, can't you think of something to placate him? Placate him how, exactly? But no, it won't accept anything less than me joining a, con a convent. He's like a worried parent. A basic gesture here and there, showing up in church from time to time, pretending to listen, would get him off your case. I mean, I've been through the song and dance before with my own worried parents when I was a teenager. 
wandering in the forest till mass was over, not even being able to smoke because they pick up the scent. Not the best moments of my life, you know? And a part of the reason I'm distancing myself from them. I don't need this fake energy in my life, and I'm honestly weirded out by you asking me to lie. I'm not asking you to lie, Julia. Let me ask you this way. Are you a spiritual person? I guess I am, kind of. Always was. Suddenly being able to see ghosts did not change a thing. I mean, that's true. That's a good point. I think it's mostly because seeing the world as purely material seemed boring to me somehow. You are and were raised Catholic. So can't you find a way to express that spirituality in our church? I don't see a way right now. And why is that? I sigh. Too many people who think my soul needs to be saved because I live with a woman, for starters. I don't know, there's a lot of reasons. Like the sin of drinking blood every other night, or feeling some primal fear whenever I walk by a clergyman whose faith seems to be actually genuine. That one sounds like an excuse. It's about your relationship with God, not other people. In theory. Yes, but back in the old country, I've heard my share of homilies that felt com like complete condemnations of my kind, and none that would condemn hate toward people like me. And, you know, when church-adjacent people try to stir shit around every existence every few months, some minimal support would be appreciated. Sorry, all you can count on is silent complicity. I get it. I know there's a lot of work to be done, and a lot of undeserved hurt going around, but... Listen, I don't want to talk about it. I fucking hate the tone I use when I talk about it. I sound preachier than those preachers, and my biggest dream is just not to give a shit. But I remember things. Like this story about a guy from my hometown. Most macho guy around with a jaw you could sharpen a knife on. He became an actor in Warsaw. Very successful, deservedly so. The capital might not be NYC, but it's still big city. And big cities go to the heads of bumpkins like us. In his case, it resulted in a dream of coming out to his parents. He was surrounded by all these stories of openly queer people. Played what even. So he thought he had a chance at making it work. So he goes back to his town, tells everyone he's going to live his truth. His dad, a ruling party adjacent businessman, curses him. His uncle takes him into the bushes and starts to destroy him physically. It's so bad he gets put in the ICU. His face and jaw get ruined for good. Fast forward a year or two. With his career over, the guy is stuck in his parents' rustic house. With no other path to follow, he turns to God, who tells him to forgive his kin. Everything's fine again. Angelic choirs sing of divine mercy. A kind-looking priest talks about protecting our families. A man sits in the front row of the church, a disfigured smile on his face. But that story alone didn't drive me away. One time when I saw how blissful he was, I could swear he was actually able to hear God whispering to him. He looked like a saint. It fucked me up so bad I left. Wow, that's pretty heavy stuff. I feel nauseated now. Maybe I'm still reeling from hearing about Kara and Jesse Montgomery. Now, if we could never talk about it again, that'd be great. I know that I tend to sound like a loser who loves to pontificate about shit I can't change, but at least I keep trying to change myself, damn it. I mean, at least there's that. <laughs> I mean, at least you have that, Julia. I won't offer empty platitudes, but I think I understand what I was meant to understand. I hope I haven't insulted you in any way. Whatever. I've learned not to hold people responsible for what the rest of their organization is doing. Would be hard looking in the mirror otherwise. Not that there's much to see in the mirror right now. I'm just wondering about one thing. There's always a cross on your chest. I like how it goes with my outfit. 
Is it just a fashionable accessory to you? Oh, 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 we could tell him or we could not tell him. Oh, how about we go with, uh, you know what? Let's talk to him about it. It's, uh, it's a memento reminding me of a broken promise. That's all. I won't inquire further. Good. Have a good night, father. Oh, it's back. Hello, male or female ghost. You look female, so I'm going to call you female for now. I found her sitting in bed, scrolling through Pinterest on her phone. So how you doing, detective? I fall on the bed, bury my face in the pillows, and scream. Oh, yeah, you... You have a right to scream right now. That was a lot you had to deal with. That bad, huh? I don't want to tell her about Double Spiral. I still have to figure out how I feel about it. I'm just not cut out for this. Oh, shut up. If you aren't, who is? Sherlock Holmes? Hercule Poirot? Columbo? Mad Milkin Milkelson's boyfriend from Hannibal? Oh, Mads. Whatever his name was, I don't know. Someone who can actually put two and two together? You can't fool me into believing you're incompetent, you dumbass. I've read your articles. Don't pretend you suddenly forgot how to do your job. I haven't. But I've got no evidence, no witnesses, no promising leads, nothing. I just stumble around, assuming things, talking big. Bleh. So you're like, I don't know, Jack Nicholson in Chinatown. And he actually solved his case. And then he wished he never took it up. Was that supposed to cheer me up? I'm just saying that it that the situation you're in sounds an awful lot like Chinatown. Deprived elites, big plans for the city, blah blah blah. Yeah, and that's depressing. It is what it is. I just think you should approach it this way and look for a solution to your problems outside the box. Not as a mystery, but maybe like a trap to escape. Eh, maybe. I throw myself on the bed again and lie there for a bit, just staring at the ceiling. Then I approach Dakota from behind and tug her sleeve to draw attention. Psst. Hey. Hmm. Put the phone away. Now? Come on, Jules. We can't do this every night. I've got my own work. I need to worry about anemia. You said so yourself. Besides, I was just looking for inspiration. I rub against her clothes with my face like a cat. You're impossible. Haven't you noticed what's going on in the news? People are going absolutely insane about this virus. Canceling trips and orders. At Pretty please. I can't, honey. I have to replenish my stash. Besides, I'm worried about overuse. My brain's working a bit too slow. My balance is off. I was just thinking about how I miss meditation. She's giving me clear signals. She just wants an excuse. And even though it would be the responsible thing to do, I know she's insatiable. She's usually the one who takes the initiative. Let's try a pu final push. I bite her ear and whisper in it. No drugs tonight. Let's do this raw. Um. Oh, God. Julia, why? Why you gotta be like that? She throws her hands up in the air. Victory. Jesus, you're greedy these days. Always have been. Haven't you noticed? Hey, we got an achievement for something. <laughs> I don't know what it was. Oh, maybe it's the end. Of, maybe it's the end of a part. Maybe. If they're giving us that achievement. Yep. Okay. Rest. Do, 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 do. Night seven? Must be night seven. Oh, you're up early. Yeah, told you you've got work to do. I stretch. Wow, that's a... 
Very interesting thing to say, Julia. That's, mm, all right. That's admirable. Reminds me of that one quote we always used to throw around. A lot of people say you can't smoke dope and get drunk when you got kids. And that's not true. You can, but you still gotta get up in the morning. That's being responsible. That's the one. I never understood why it was so hilarious to you. Neither did I. I just accepted the mystery and made it my personal credo. I'm a responsible person. Are you planning to have kids? Not in a million years. By the way, you've got mail. An envelope by the door. It's from Kadir. Uh-oh. Kadir. Inside is a message saying he won't be able to make it tonight, but will rendezvous tomorrow to meet D'Angelo. He wants me to lay low until then and to stay in this apartment if possible. Apparently, nobody knows where Tamika is. They only know she's in trouble and he doesn't want me near it. Well, what is it? Uh, yeah, let's not involve her. Um, uh... Uh-oh. Sorry, it's the uh, top secret. Shit, almost caught myself putting you at risk. Phew! Uh-oh. <laughs> anyway, I should get going. It would be fun to spend some more time together, you know. Dakota, you know this is important to me. I know, I know, but... I'd like to know I'm important to you as well. Uh-oh. We must make a choice. That makes two of us. Just a few more days. I'll find the killer, kick his ass, get a promotion, and we'll do something we've never done before. Like what? Good question. I'll, uh, I'll think of something. For now, catch up with your work. Uh, I need to get going. Fine. Good luck. Stay safe. You know it. The place is weirdly empty tonight. Ah, oh, well. I love the usual. I feel there's a big, what are we doing in this relationship talk coming if I don't change my ways. Um, yeah, I mean, no offense, but y y you should have just stayed at home like Kadir told you. It might have helped. Honestly, I'm kind of surprised it hasn't already happened. But most of the time, Dakota has seemed happy enough just listening to the stories of my own life. Even if it's all boring and normal to me, it's exotic and engrossing to her. Guess I have that going for me. Ah oh well. I have no idea what to do tonight. So I'll just do the obvious thing and wing it. These vagabond shoes are longing to stray right through the very heart of it. Or however it went. Time to lose myself in these busy streets and pray that the answers I'm looking for are out there. And if they're not, maybe I'll at least find some amusement or blood instead. Oh dear. We got two things. The Prince of Cats. I need to resolve this thing with Dakota. As if I'm going in round in circles on behalf of the court wasn't stressful enough. Maybe a visit to some quiet neighborhood will help clear my head. Or... No, I don't want to be a part of your goddamn interview. Look, can I not be bothered for one goddamn second? You're not even listening. Uh-oh. Let's do the Prince of Cats. That sounds kind of interesting, actually. The Prince of de Gatos. There it is. That distinct vibe of Manhattan's residential area. Sniff. <laughs> and an unmistakable scent of casserole enveloping the surroundings in a heavenly aura? The atmosphere of desolation makes it feel more like purgatory, though. There's not a single soul in sight. And... I don't know the voice, so... Ah, crap! Looks like I'm not alone after all. Some guy exerts himself, climbing a nearby tree. I instinctively take a step into the shadows to remain outside his line of sight, but I can barely see anything from where I stand. I stay low for now. Better to curb my voyeuristic impulses and keep my head down. For a good while, all I can hear is heavy panting. Come on, dude, this oak isn't even that tall. Sure looks like it's the first time the guy's ever tried climbing a tree. It takes a long time for the mysterious trespasser to steady his breath and carry on. At this distance, I can barely discern his features. He sizes up one of the longer branches. 
It seems sturdy enough, and nearly reaches a narrow window on the second floor. Still, the guy is hesitant. Alright, no biggie. Just, <laughs> eyes on the prize. He moves a few steps along the branch, his feet slipping every other step on his way to the window. By some inexplicable fluke, he manages to keep his pellets. Once he makes it far enough, the branch slowly bends under his weight. He kneels down, probably calculating his chances to make it over to the windowsill. My guy, if you pull this off, it will be a legit miracle. I can't help but cheer him on. <laughs> the trespasser scouts his surroundings one last time, making sure no one can see him. Then he reaches into his pocket, pulls out what looks like a marble, and zeroes in on the window. Okay, here we... here we go. He tosses the marble with the grace of a baseball pitcher. The clink of the glass is subtle, but it proves effective enough to alert whoever lives inside. A few seconds later, the window opens with the creak of a wooden frame, followed by the muffled but undeniably happy voice of the girl inside. Prince, how did you... I told you, this is too dangerous. My dad... Oh, fuck him. You can't let him make this choice for us. You know how I feel about you, don't you? I... I do, but... Just let me in, baby, I promise. We'll figure something out. Oh, all right. Just come in quickly. And just like that, Prince throws away all of his doubt and eagerly jumps inside, straight into the arms of his forbidden lover. It actually makes me smile. My peeping eye scores another victory. What a story. Heartwarming. Nostalgic. It's just too bad it's too cliché to steal for my writing. What, Julia? You don't write anymore. Yeah, but it's not like you can simply stop thinking like a writer. Eh, gotta use that energy elsewhere somehow. But for now, let's just start heading downtown. All of a sudden, the world ends. Everything stops. I'm lost in the darkness, and there's not even a heartbeat to guide me. It's like sleep paralysis, except it feels as if I suddenly woke up from reality instead of a dream. Instinctively, I react to it, the way I used to react whenever I woke up in the middle of the night, aware but not able to move or speak. I just wait for it to pass. What is going on? What the hell is going on here? But instead of slowly regaining control, I just see a bizarre room emerge from the darkness. What the heck is this? Just look at her. Fresh, refusing its fate. It is, 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 oh god. It is not the one you were looking for, is it? What the fuck? What the hell is going on? He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep is silent before the shearers, he did not open his mouth. Oh god, I have to think of a voice for this one. There is none righteous, not even one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks for God. All who have turned aside together, they have become useless. If anyone curses his father or mother, he must be put to death. Raging waves of the sea, foaming up in their own shame. Wandering stars for whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. But we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities. What the hell is this? Against powers, against the ru- I can't do all these voices. Against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. And in those days shall men seek death and shall not find it and shall desire to die and death shall flee from them. Oh, whenever I become one with the darkness, there's always this nagging fear that it might be impossible to become the normal me again. That instead of the shadows returning to normal, I would let my consciousness be dragged somewhere else. Somewhere between the worlds. Somewhere like this. Wherever this is. Yeah, where is this? This is the first time that fear has come true. Are you afraid? It's a bad idea to answer. Don't do it. Yes. <laughs> Excellent. 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 I think I need to sit in this chair. I think I need to sit in this chair. Oh, God. I do not like this. 
I don't like this. I'm getting very uncomfortable vibes from this. This is very... Like, guys, no joke. I am legit uncomfortable with this. This is actually kind of terrifying. I sit in the chair. Still in the lean years and unworthy of joining the rest. However, the path is open and it is a path of obligation, liability, a debt that will be repaid one day. And when she asks you what brought you here, let your response be a scent of death. Suddenly, I feel my mind beginning to drift away from here. I'm slowly starting to regain control over my thoughts. No, you aren't. Yes, I am. Fine. Think whatever you want. What the hell? I find myself in a dark corner, leaning against a wet, cold brick wall. I think I'm conscious again. Back from wherever it was. Awake, but in an unfamiliar place. Let's just hope it's still New York City. I emerge from the shadows to see where I am. A source of light above my head momentarily blinds me, causing me to instinctively raise my hand. As I do, I hit some sort of garbage bag with my hand. It falls to the floor, letting loose a metallic din. What the fuck? A woman. I feel her hand grabbing my clothes. She brutally drags me closer. With one of my hands already above my head, I raise the other. Easy. Peace. I, I mean you no harm. How long have you been there? I don't know. I've got no idea what I'm doing. Here, or in general, really. It's it's like sometimes the forces I can't control figure out how to control me. What are you, a junkie? No. You're a kindred. Yeah. Keep your shit together, damn it. I'm Julia Sawinski, the, the representative of the La Sombra in New York City. Camarilla? Uh-huh. I'm a Camarilla investigator. Well, if you came here to catch me, you're going to be sorry you tried, M Miss La Sombra. No, 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 no. Stop right here. I wasn't ordered to catch anybody. I'm just investigating. I'm just investigating Douglas Callahan's death. This surprises her. She loosens her grip slightly. Callahan is dead? Nothing left but a rotten carcass and a musty robe. Well, I'll be damned. I've been off the grid f for too long. What brought you here? A memory from a different world pops up in my head. Yeah, I think I know the right answer. A scent of death. She lets me go. I rub my eyes and finally get a good look at her face. Whoa! Wait, have we seen her before? I don't remember if we've seen her before. She's gorgeous. And judging by her nomadic clothes and particularly fierce aura... She's probably an outlander. What's an outlander? Oh, God, she's a gang girl? Oh, no, that's awesome. Clan gang girl is made up of those who have fallen through the cracks of society. They call the cruelest neighborhoods home, and they consider this a point of pride. They hold few domains and follow no prince. This clan embraces from the ranks of those who have already spilled blood and had their blood spilled who have survived the harshest conditions, who have fought against horrible odds and still come out on top. Prison gang leaders, vagrants, any other kind who has seen the darkest sides of the world. Occasionally, I'm told, you'll see one who breaks this mold and pursues knowledge or influence instead. Among the gang girl, respect is everything and is always earned, never given. Commonly referred to as wolves, ferals, and outcasts, or if you really want to piss them off, savages, strays, and animals. Wow. That's awesome. Hell yeah. We'll have a talk, you and I. Sure. What's your name? Tamika. <gasps> That's Tamika? That's Tamika. Oh, that, mm-hmm. We're going to get answers. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Pass me a smoke, will ya? If only it could, my heart would skip a beat right now. Tamika. I guess, once again, someone out there led me to the proper path. Uh, yeah, sure. When I pass her a cigarette, I realize I'm standing in something wet. Something that smells... tasty. I look at my feet and see a puddle of water mixed with blood. Oh, I get it. 
Were these guys first light? That's a cool shot right there with the two of them. The high-powered guns and expensive-looking outfits, flashbangs, tasers, all chosen specifically to combat the undead. I recognize that equipment from some horror stories I've heard. First Light, SI, Usacom, whatever they call themselves, they all bleed out the same. Usually before I have a chance to ask them a single question. Government-funded inquisitors. Some claim they're connected to the U.S. government. Some claim they're supported by the anti-kindred faction in the Holy See. Some have even wilder theories. My goodness. My goodness, things are getting crazy. They are absolutely getting insane, and I am loving it. Now we are getting... I mean, gosh, we figured out that Vander Weeden has no alibi. He's a prime suspect. And here's Tamika, out of nowhere... You did all this by yourself? Have you seriously seen nothing? Nothing at all? I shake my head. Believe it or not, I have no idea how I got here. Just kind of let the shadows guide me. Is that a... La Sombra thing? Never actually talked to any of you. No idea what you guys can actually do. Still learning the ropes myself. Go with the flow and all that. My embrace was just a few months ago. Huh, so you folks are with the Ivory Tower now? Last I checked, you were with the Sabbat. The Kamis wouldn't forgive all the trouble you've caused them overnight. Ooh, the Sabbat. Yes, I know of the Sabbat. An extremist sect that fully enjoys their predatory tendencies and doesn't think highly of mortals. Largely believed to be embroiled in bringing about an eschatal... Es eschatological, I think? Vampire. On vampire conflict. Known as the Gena War. They were driven away from the from the West over the last few decades. I've heard that New York City used to be Sabat controlled until 1999. The La Sombra, my clan, used to be the thinkers behind these wackos, but we've since thrown our lot in with the Camarilla. Ah, that's why they don't like them. Again, I'm practically still a neonate. N neonate? Whatever. I just know there's a lot of bad blood between my clan and the others, and that I can expect at least one glare of pure contempt whenever I visit Elysium. So a neonate, what's that? Oh, okay. A teenager in kindred terms knows more than a fledgling but still relatively newly embraced. I'm one, and it'll be a few decades before I grow out of those shoes. Huh. I see. We smoke in silence for a short while. Hmm. Is there a large SI presence? Let's do that. Is there a large SI presence in New York City? The kindred are classified as a terrorist presence. There's no other American city that was hit as hard by terrorism as this one. All secret agencies need symbolic victories. You do the math. And you're still taking on these guys on here, of all places? As you can see, all around you. Aren't they extremely dangerous? Almost got me for good last year. Took me a few weeks to get back in action. Then why are you doing this? Oh. Those motherfuckers have an unfortunate tendency to hurt people I care about. My brothers, my sisters. I see. I don't know how it is in other cities, but here, funny enough, they only seem to target marginalized and radicalized kindred. Ones that could theoretically pose a threat to the current order. Meanwhile, the establishment in New York City hasn't really changed ever since... Sis Calibrus? Calibros? Celebrus? Step down. Quite the opposite. Every SI raid in this city has only strengthened the old paradigm. Almost makes you think that their goal is something other than protecting the citizens from the blank body menace. 
Tamika throws her cigarette into the puddle, unfinished, and crushes it under her heel. Look at that red moon. Oof, beautiful. That's a beautiful moon. She obviously has difficulty smoking. It's like she's only ever tried it a few times. I assume she saw me carrying a pack and decided to try it to calm her nerves after the battle. Or, maybe she just wanted an excuse to make our conversation less awkward. Who knows? So, are you planning to snitch on me, Shadow Girl? Why would I do that? get this straight. You really think I'm dumb enough to believe for one second that a Camarilla investigator would just so happen to stumble upon the alley where I just killed a bunch of SI motherfuckers? If so, you're the one who's dumb, sister. Looks like I need to show her I mean business, just like I showed Nastia yesterday. <laughs> Look! I wouldn't give two shits whether you killed one, or a dozen, or a thousand SI operatives. Whatever! Do your thing. But I do think you might have been involved in a murder that actually concerns me. Callahan's murder. What? What are you talking about? I found this on his body. Well, what remained of it. I show her the note. She tries to grab it to read it, but I don't let her. Aside from your name, we've got Hope, Agathon... And D'Angelo, you know them. Passingly. Any idea why Callahan would need a list of all your names? I might know why. Yeah. Do you? Absolutely. Do you know a man going by the name of Torque? Huh. Of course I do. Do you know about his connection to Boss Callahan and by proxy? To this list and me? No. I'm all ears. Oh boy. I think we're about to indul be indulged in some juicy information. Ah, goddammit. <laughs> it's too bad. <laughs> too bad. Classified intel, sister. What do you mean by classified? Not free. Oh, great. As if I were in the position to, or could afford, any sort of quid pro quo. But I'm fine, let's hear it. What do you want? She motions toward the bodies. Uh oh. I've killed too many of these assholes. They've ti they're tightening the screws. As it is, New York City is no longer safe for someone like me. Well, not that it ever was. Oh, man. Bracing for something unreasonable. What I need is a way out of the city. You offer that to me, I give you the intel you need. Oh, would you look at that. I. That's something I can handle, actually. Yeah. She raises her eyebrows. That's a surprisingly confident answer for a practically still a neonate. I'm something of an... Immigration officer. Psh, gotta say, you sound awfully close to a cop. Almost as bad. A bureaucrat. I know of a secret pathway that would lead you to the West Coast. 100% safe travel, and if you took it, you'd be untraceable. Sounds too good to be true. What's the catch? Wait until you see how much it costs. The only reason I know of this route is because a certain Nazi criminal group reached out to me on account of my position and offered me a mutually beneficial deal regarding illegal kindred travel. What's a Nazi? Oh, the Nosferatu! Clan of the Hidden. The untouchables of our world. Lepers. Sewer rats. Carnies. Scabs. Orlocks. Embraced by a Nosferatu results in extreme disfigurement. A nasty side effect by their blood. Their grotesqueries can mimic birth defects, cancer growths, or horrible injuries. But the Nosferatu are, by default, the most compassionate of the kindred, probably due to the humiliations they suffer on a daily basis. To blend in, some call on the blood to wear the borrowed faces of their victims or to vanish altogether. 
Others get very, very good at stagecraft. Prosthetics, costumes, and makeup. Interesting. Cool. Normally I'd refuse, but they offered me the only thing that can buy me. A ton of cash. I mean, that buys a lot of people. Ah, fine then. Money's not an issue. Now that's something I never had a chance to ever say at Ernest. Yeah, I feel that. I definitely feel that too. Wish I could say that. Okay then. You should assist me first. Then we'll figure out how to transport you out of the city. Hmm. Hell no. Is this really the extent of your negotiation skills? Why would you think this is... Why would you think this kind of line would work? Well, I'm an optimist. Trying to be at least. <sighs> but yeah, we do need a way to open this deal. That would satisfy us both. Hmm. You met Tork before? In the course of your investigation? Or before? I wanted to. But on the Anarch side, I only managed to meet Mia. And she wasn't keen on the idea of the two of us meeting. Ah, uh, yes. Mia. Her expression betrays she's got some vicious stories to tell. But it would be beneath her to divulge them. Too bad. Maybe it could be a bonding experience. Oh, I'm... I'm, I'm now I'm curious. So, here's the thing. A few months ago, Torque and I were together. A lot of things happened. And long story short, I no longer feel close to him. But from what I know, he still feels close to me. Back when I thought there might be something between us, I gave him a ring that has a lot of sentimental value to me. And since these days, sentimentality is all that keeps me going, I want it back. So my suggestion is... Tell Torx people I sent you to get inside his base of operations, meet up with him, ask him your questions, and convince him to give my ring back. You get to interrogate him. Then I get to have my ring back. Then you hear my side of the story. Then I get to leave the city with your help. Everybody wins more than once. They'll really let me in because I tell them you sent me. They will. Trust me. Sounds too easy. What caused the two of you to drift apart? Irreconcilable differences in worldview. Well, I assume so. But that's a diplomatic answer. If I'm going to involve myself in the relationship drama of two ex-lovers, I'll need something more to go on. Will you? Yeah. She picks her words carefully. Uh-oh. That's, that's a big sentence. I realized I had become an element of his carefully crafted, protected image. Having me as a radical partner allowed him to present himself as a mediator while paying lip service to revolutionary ideas. A mediator. That's the 21st century for you. Everyone wants to be a middleman these days, and nobody wants to do what's right. You serious? Whenever I hear about Torque from the Encia, they talk about him like he's the second coming of Mao. If he ever seemed that, it's only because from time to time, people like me pushed him into doing an uneasy thing. Ever heard of the Southern Wolf and the Northern Fox? Both of them want to eat you for dinner, but only the Southern Wolf makes it immediately obvious. The tricky northern fox makes eyes and allows you to pet him before taking a bite. Torque loves to surround himself with northern foxes. They talk of compromises. They seem reasonable compared to the opposition. But at the end of the day, they have eyes on the same prize. Power. Hearing this gives me a foreboding feeling, but I can't quite nail down why. Alright, tell me where to go, and I'll tell you where we'll meet later. Oh, I'm just chilling at Torx when suddenly a shrill, loud voice pierces my eardrums. And what the hell are you doing here? Oh, yay. It's the pissy lady from Torx Inner Circles. 
I'm here to see Torque. I figured as much. You should have gone through his security first. Get out. And what if he tells me to stay? Fat chance. Move your ass before I throw you out. I thought you'd be more open to cooperation after our last talk. Not when you're trying to make deals behind my back, you bitch. Oh, Torque looks cool. Look at that guy. Mia, Mia, it's okay. This guy looks dope. What the heck is he wearing, though? There he is, walking through the door. One of the most infamous New York City barons, or as some people started calling him, the moment Callahan met his end, the Baron of New York City. Torque, we've talked about this, she... The situation is a little different now. Tamika Center. What? Bullshit. I wasn't able to track her down for weeks. Well, I did. And guess what? It took me one night, you clown. I've had enough of bitchy henchwoman for this week, so I can't help but put her down. She shoots me a hateful look, but Torque gestures at her to stay silent. This is a reason to celebrate, not to get mad. Now, you allowed the two of us a private conversation? No way. I want to keep an eye on her. You will keep an eye on the exit, and that will be enough. Please. He puts down his best authoritative tone, and it works. No protest this, this, these time, this time, this time. Mia leaves the room. When talking to Mia, you mentioned cooperation. First, I've heard about it. I tried to make friends with her so that the investigation would go more smoothly. Looks like it wasn't appreciated. Sorry about her. She can be overzealous, but usually that's not a bad thing. Yeah, sure. So has she told you I've been trying to reach you for a few nights? I don't think so. Have you? Well, I'm the dumbass, the court ordered to investigate Callahan's final death. So considering your connection to the case, I thought it would be prudent for us to talk. Ah, so that's you. Yeah. Now, I know you're probably anxious to hear about Tamika. Surprised to hear you two know each other. We actually met through this investigation. Anyway, as I was saying, I know you probably can't wait to hear about her. But I'd like to ask you a few questions first. I understand. Do your job. Did you know Douglas Callahan? Of course I did. We were both barons. Kept having professional obligations to meet each other, but that was it. What was your private opinion of him? Same as everyone else's. A racist clown, mentally stuck in the 18th century, who spent too much time keeping the Anarchs down. I'm glad he's gone. You mean you're glad he met final death? Well, you know what they say. Hate to see you go, love to watch you leave. Weren't you the first kindred who saw his corpse? I was, but it was his ghouls who found him. By the way, we've established that some of them tampered with the crime scene. They were properly disciplined for that. Convenient story. Let's move on. What's your alibi for that night? None. I was running around town the entire night taking care of various issues. Unrelated to Callahan, but I don't intend to divulge them to someone from the Ivory Tower. So you have no interest in proving yourself innocent? My official position was made clear. It's the Camarilla who are to blame. Your job to prove me wrong. Kurwa Mac. At least for once, can I face a problem that can be solved with pure logic and not politics? Any findings on your side I should know of? Ask Mia. She's the one who handled the murder scene. I'm not privy to all the details. Hope D'Angelo Agathon. Any idea who these people are? Can't recall. Sorry. The evidence I found suggests a potential link between Callahan and Tamika. Any clue? I knew both of them well, but as far as I know, they've never met. That's it. 
Oh well. Not sure what I expected. He's the kind of guy that could only be pushed to talk if I had something concrete to push with. Time to move on. Well, regarding Tamika... Fun. I'll cut straight to the chase. She wanted to inform you she'll be skipping town for a while. The SI's hot on her trail and she needs to lose them ASAP. Oh, for... I've told her countless times. If she's in danger, I will always be there for her. Does she think she could find a secure way out of the city in this situation? She's safe. So you say. She's got some other friends in high places. She'll manage to get out. Gotta admit, that's not what I wanted to hear. Or what I wanted to hear. Why did she decide to contact me? She wants the ring back. His aura changes in a blink of an eye. Uh -huh. I see now. So that's why she didn't show up herself. Wouldn't even face me when delivering the final insult. Uh oh. Looks like I stepped on a landmine. She said the ring was a symbol of the trust she put in me. No way in hell I'm going to give it away. Not until she gives me the chance to explain myself. I need that ring to get Tamika to talk. But the way he's acting, it doesn't seem likely he'll be willing to part with it. Might require me to act shitty, but maybe... Time to change my approach? Oh, God. Um, uh... Ah, uh, f... We... Uh, we... Well, we got... Need, we need that information. Let's see what happens if we lie. Lie through our teeth. Listen, uh, this is none of my business, but I think you've got something wrong here. How exactly? She still loves you. Poof. He's only doe-eyed for a short moment, but it's obvious I hit him where it hurts. You said you just met her. How would you know? We fought an SI patrol together. That won me her trust. And then, we had an unexpectedly honest talk, woman to woman. Glad me is away. If she was still in the room, I'd be far too embarrassed to let this shit escape my mouth. The torque just nods, prompting me to go on. She's conflicted. She understands the painful realities of this world, but wants to hold on to her ideals. That's why it's hard for her to stay close to you. Even though, deep down, she resentfully respects your slow, steady work, she still wants to give her own approach a chance. Oh my god, what am I doing? <laughs> what? <laughs> it's, so, it's, a, it's, it's okay. You're figuring this out. D d you're figuring this out. You're slowly winning his trust. It's working. Then why would she want the ring? To me, it's an obvious message. I was wrong to put my hopes in you. It's punishment. She wants it to remember you by, and to have the symbol of those hopes near to her, to remind her there's always another way. Look, I know this is hard for you, but you gotta give her time and the benefit of the doubt. It'll pay dividends in the long run, slowly make her realize her misconceptions might have been wrong. I was thinking about it. He's thinking about it. Ah, a realization slowly dawns on him. Oh my god, he's actually buying it. <laughs> I'm dying inside. You know, um, side note, what is the thing supposed to be on TV? Is that supposed to be an actual movie or a TV show? If you guys know, please let me know. I'm kind of intrigued. He takes the ring out of his inside pocket and passes it on to me. Go. Tell her I'll be waiting, and that my feelings haven't changed. Of course. Should Mia lead you out? No need, no need, I'll manage. As I leave, I feel very self-conscious about the pace of my walk. I feel like I just got away with murder. If he relays what I said to Mia, she'll probably see through my bullshit at an instant. But ah well, won't be my problem at that point. Time to meet Tamika. I find her already waiting in front of the Jewish Museum. 
How did it go? She raises her eyebrows as I put her... As I put the golden ring into her palm. Wow, there's a couple... Um... Couple typos. That's okay. I'm quite surprised, to be honest. Didn't think you'd succeed. Turns out I'm a talented diplomat. Pfft. From my experience, that usually means a liar. She looks at the ring with a gentle gaze, then stores it safely in her pocket. Or has he really changed? Who knows? I just met him for the first time in my life. On life. Anyway, I've kept my end of the bargain. Of course. Time to keep mine. Last... yo, oh, here we go. Ooh, a fledgling. What's a fledgling? A baby vampire. All. I.E. One so new who has figured out so little they still need their sire to protect them. My status as a fledgling was cut short by Karen's swift departure. I had to learn the ropes on my own, and most of those lessons weren't pleasant. Yeah. Last year, a certain fledgling appeared in the city and attempted to build a coterie. The list you found on Callahan, that's the list they've got. They contacted each of us, then found themselves in deep shit. S.I., Kaiser, Sophie Langley, some shadow players manipulating everything from behind the scenes. Then they disappeared. I wonder if this has anything to do with Coteries of New York. Because I hear this is supposed to be like a side game, game of it. Hmm. I have to check that one out. Kaiser. That name popping up once again. Can't be a coincidence. No one knows where or why. Doesn't really matter. That happens when you punch way above your weight. Hope they're doing fine, despite all odds. In any case, Torque got involved too. That's how I met him, actually. He got hurt. Didn't want to say how. Claimed it could put anyone who knew in danger. Whatever happened... It gave him the drive and the desire for change. For two months, he was a beautiful kindred, plain and simple. But suddenly, something inside him snapped overnight. His tone mellowed out. His actions became timid. His language became more befitting of a political science student than a charismatic leader. I assumed he met someone who made him an offer he couldn't refuse. But I had no idea who that was. And then one night I followed him when he went out, and I saw him scheming at the docks with Callahan. When he came back, we had an argument, and when he refused to explain himself, I knew I was on my way out. And that was that. I understand. Wish I'd known that earlier. Might have confronted the facts with him and learned something more. He never told me of all kindred. What makes you think he would have told you? She's got a point, I suppose. All right, thank you. Now it's my turn. Here is your way out. I point at the manhole below our feet. Here's a map of the sewers. Follow the route, then burn it. You'll be looking for a one-eyed Nosferatu wearing tactical gear. Tell him I sent you, then give him the agreed-upon amount of money. What kind of route will I be taking, anyway? An armored van full of precious coffins. My man knows how to arrange them to allow for unnoticed extra cargo. Her face darkens. The circulatory system? Oh, God. We're going to be using the circulatory system? Fine. What did you expect? The rich and powerful always get the blood they want, one way or another. At least tonight, one of their roots will be used for something good. She drops her shoulders in resignation and opens up the manhole cover. Fine. But remember, if it doesn't work, I'll be at your doorstep with a vengeance if it's the last thing I do. I'm sure it'll work out fine. Just beware of a giant albino ghoul alligator while you're down there. Tamika rolls her eyes. Sewer ghoul alligator? For your information, it's just a story New York kindred tell the Neonites to mess with them while they're still gullible enough to believe anything they hear about their new world. 
Oh, that makes sense, I suppose. Well, this is a goodbye. If in a few months you hear about the first light presence in all Los Angeles has been decimated, assume that against all odds I'm still unalive and kicking. If you keep killing indiscriminately, you might cross a line of no return, you know. Shouldn't you take it easy for a while? Not until my brothers and sisters in blood stop being slaughtered. I care about what's left of humanity, but turning a blind eye on kindred in need would be even less human. Tamika, you're a badass. <laughs> I'm gonna miss you, Tamika. I'm gonna miss you. Uh, that's the kind of person she is, and probably will be till the very end. Never change, Tamika. Never ever change, please. Must be comforting in a way, to know how your path will end, yet to follow it all the same. I could never do that. Here's some parting advice for you. We might be monsters, but we were lucky enough to be born into a world that's even more monstrous than we are. If we rebel against it, we might still find salvation. If only I could believe it. Didn't expect the preaching tone. Why are you telling me this? Because I think I have a pretty good nose for people's auras. And when I take a look at you, I smell a penchant for ruthless opportunism. I smell a controlling anger that might get out of hand if you get a whiff of power. I smell someone who doesn't value the truth much. It's not much. Just a hunch. But you seem prone to giving in to the Camarilla's empty promises of safety and their petite Borghese values. I think I should take offense to that. I hope you do. That would reflect on you well. In any case, whatever happens... See you in your next life, Julia. Safe travels, Tamika. I skipped tonight's visit to the church. I'm not in the mood to see Benoit. I'm still embarrassed by yesterday's outburst. And I'm kind of pissed. None of the clan elders in Chicago bothered to reply to any of my fucking reports. No advice, no feedback, nothing. I feel like I was left utterly alone. Besides, it's late. I always get back to the apartment early in the morning, right before it gets bright. It's getting risky to be out here so close to sunrise. Accidents can happen. I'll try to get back earlier tomorrow night. Attempt to surprise Dakota. Yeah. I'm back! Yay! How was work? All caught up? Eh, I managed to get my deadlines postponed. All our clients are canceling and delaying orders left and right. Huh. Does that mean you'll have time to help me with my makeup tomorrow? We'll see. Perfect. Alright, I need to disappear before the sun catches up with me. Hey. Yeah? I love you. Oh. An uneasy silence fills the room. I'm not getting out of this one, am I? Well, I've already come up with one love story tonight. What's another? I love you too. I quickly turn away to avoid looking at her sincere smile and leave to rest. Yay, we got another achievement. That means we're closer to the end. Rest. Here we go, night eight. I finally reach Big Beat Burger, hoping to recuperate from all the mental damage accumulated over the past few days. Only to find that the doors are locked and nobody's inside. No, 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 no. I need to be soothed. I need my routine. You've absolutely got to be kidding me. Closed? What the fuck do you mean, closed? I mean, we're in the middle of a pandemic. Everything's closed. Pandemic? What pandemic? Do you live under a fucking rock? It's a new SARS virus straight from China. The whole world's going crazy over it. People are dying left and right. Holy shit. I didn't know something like this could still happen in this day and age. Somehow it always felt like we were beyond it. Well, guess it's lucky I'm dead. I walk away to avoid bringing more attention to myself. Now I understand why NYC feels downright apocalyptic tonight. It's like a psychedelic experience to see these familiar streets empty and abandoned. Well, 
Let's see what parts of the city are still alive in the middle of a plague. Uh-oh. A familiar smile. Took just two days for the city to go all last man on Earth. Probably won't have a better chance to soak in the atmosphere. Or an aristocratic taste. All this malaise spreading through the boroughs is putting me in a weird mood. Seems like I can't outrun it. Maybe I'll intensify it instead. Smallpox hospital, here I come. Oh god. Um. Let's go to the aristocratic taste. Oh god. Oh dear. What is this, this place? I entertained the thought of sneaking through a hospital to see how things appeared up close. But it looked like an actual war zone, so I decided against it. I don't know what I expected with the way healthcare reforms have been going in this state. Fewer facilities in poorer areas, fewer beds, less funding. We're just reaping what they've sown. They spelled they've wrong. That was a weird way to spell it. That's why I used to honestly consider going back to the old country. An American friend was like, Why would you go back to that shithole? He was shocked to learn we have normal free health care. Anyway, if an active hospital won't do, this, this one might. The smallpox hospital on Roosevelt Island. Built to quarantine the poor and the unloved victims of pandemics away from normal citizens' eyes. In spite of its disrepair, or maybe partly because of it, the architecture still managed to perfectly convey the building's painful history. There are ghosts here, but they're mostly the good metaphorical kind. Not the kind I usually see. Looks like there also might be a lone physical being here. I hear someone sneaking through the ruins. That's that for peace and quiet. But oh well, I needed to satiate my thirst anyway. How do I approach that person? Let's try through the shadows. I become one with the shadows. I let the flow of the void take me in the direction of the footsteps. Eventually, a female shape appears in front of my eyes. Slowly, I emerge from the darkness behind her back. Ooh, oh, God, look at her. Only to spook my target the moment I do. In her panic, she drops something on the floor. It breaks into a thousand little pieces. God, don't scare me like that. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, look what you made me do. She kneels to pick up the pieces of some ugly glass sculpture. The shape is familiar. Was that, was that a Scrooge McDuck figurine? Yeah, it was. A Carl Barks design. They stopped making these decades ago. You don't even know how long it took me to find it. I was really looking forward to decorating my haven with this. Uh, a Scrooge McDuck? Uh, it's Popper, okay? Haven. Of course, now I realize what I couldn't put into words. It was the feeling she might be kindred. She seems airheaded and eccentric, but I wouldn't want to pick a fight with her. Call it a hunch. Yeah, after the last time I tried to dominate someone and that didn't work out, I'm, I'm not doing that again. I apologize. My name is Julia. I'm, I'm a La Sombra representative for this city. Some representative you are. <laughs> Absolutely horrible first impression. Somehow we've never met before. You live here? I prefer keeping to myself these nights. More time for hobbies if you hide in secluded places like this. What's your name? Uh oh. Just call me Princess. Princess? My true name is for friends only. And after destroying my treasure, I count you a sworn enemy. When you least expect it, I'll find you. And I'll trap you in a reality of eternal pain. I should complain to the court at least, honestly. Tell Helen to start looking for a replacement. So sorry won't cut it, huh? Kadir would surely be thrilled to see Prince Helen assign me with a mission of looking for a rare Scrooge McDuck statue, but I'd prefer to avoid that fate, even if it doesn't seem very likely. How can I make it up to you? 
Should I, like, search for a replacement online, or... Uh-oh. Ah, uh, whatever. I'm not gonna lie to you. I prefer not to stay mad for long. It's exhausting. And it's a threat to your beauty, both inner and outward. So, yeah, I think I'm gonna ask you for a small favor. Then we'll be square, and I won't have to worry about becoming ugly. Sound good? What favor? See, I'm super into low art these days. That's why I collect stuff like Scrooge McDuck lamps. I used to be hardcore into high art before. Studied the harmonic structure of box cantata cantatas. Taught myself Arabic just to weep over Middle Eastern poetry. Read a lot of Joyce and Adorno, etc. Eventually, these hobbies got boring as all things do, though. So I'm switching it up now. Comic books, heavy rock music, modern Hollywood movies, you know, stuff made for small children, basically. What the fuck? That, the, what the hell? That, that stuff can be for adults too, lady. Get off your fucking high horse. Jesus Christ. The problem is, I think I'm still not low enough. There's still too much mastery of the form, too much restraint, too much respectability, too much tastefulness. This person's weird. I want to feel the rush of gazing into the soul of someone willing to admit to truly degenerate desires and obsessions. So I want the lowest kind of art you can find. Just sweep me off my feet and we'll be good. Not the kind of request I expected, but... How low is too low? There's no such thing as too low. Huh. Okay. Back when I was alive, I refused advances from a guy who lived just outside of Astoria. He definitely still owns some incredibly low art, but what exactly should I get her? An anime DVD, a video game, a fantasy book. Ooh, this is an interesting choice. Let's see. If I was to give her a book... Books can be pretty weird. Um, The video game or the anime DVD, though? Oh, I'm, I'm kind of debating between the anime DVD... Or the video game. I'm going to do the anime DVD. Because anime can be... Anime can get pretty low sometimes. Cartoons can. Okay, I'll be back in a jiffy. Takes me just over an hour to get there. Wake him in the middle of the night. Mess with his head a little. And get back with an appropriately low work of art. So, uh, I've got something. <clears throat> Don't be shy. What is it? I pass her a DVD box... With a busty, hand-drawn girl licking a giant katana. According to a description he printed for me, this thing is named Ririsu no Daibokin. The cover says Lilith's Carnal Carnival. Yeah, no idea why the name is written like that. Anyway, this 90s original video animation presents us with a tale of five... Big bosom samurai warriors traveling through America in search of General Hasta Vista, the Incubus King. Don't let all the titillation misguide you. The main draws here a peerless direction, a nearly avant-garde editing rhythm, and dialogue that coyly comments on traditional gender roles in anime. Once you see the animation in the final battle, you'll understand why it never fails to set a Sakuga fan's heart ablaze. Note, Sakuga, uncountable, in Japanese animation anime, or anime, a sequence of noticeably higher quality used to highlight a particularly important scene. What the fuck? <laughs> yeah, it sure does sound like low art. Depends on who you talk to. Eyes down, I await her response. This is great. It is? 
Yeah, I have no idea what I'm looking at, but I can feel that it's utterly degenerate and naked in its intentions. It's just what I needed. Believe me, I've had more than enough of art trying to dazzle or win me over or be used as a stepping stone in someone's illustrious career. I just want someone to be like, screw it. I don't want to impress anyone. I don't want to get anywhere. I just want to vomit all out of my soul for all the freaks like me to see. I think that in its own way, that might be the ultimate form of art. <laughs> Julia's just looking at her like, what the hell is wrong with you? <laughs> so, so is my debt paid? I suppose. So can I know your name now? Mm, let me think. No. She turns away and disappears into the night. Well, that was an interesting distraction from all the malaise in the city. Suppose it's time to go back to the miserable business I've been saddled with. The time comes for me to meet up with Kadir, and hopefully D'Angelo too. The last person on my list. This better be good. And that is D'Angelo's agency. Looks like a dump. Blech. Perfect for the clan of the hidden. I thought he wasn't hidden. I thought it was missing. And to be honest, I kind of expected the worst. Why would we look for him in the most obvious place? I've been asking around, and I've got a hunch. Just trust it and start looking. Fine. Who is D'Angelo, anyway? He's a good man. A useful man. But it took me time to get used to him. Takes sleuthing very, very seriously. His thing is acting like an, uh, idiosyncratic noir detective. I heard it helps him cope with something, but I never felt comfortable tackling the subject. Doesn't sound too quirky by this city's standards. Wait, what's that? There's a rat on the floor, frozen in an unnatural position. Weird shit. Examine it. Despite my disgust, I picked the rodent up. Now that's what being an investigator's all about. Leave no stone unturned. Shut up. This is so gross. What have you found out? I take a close, hard look at the rat. It's alive, but... From what I see, he's just stretching out and like... Grinding his teeth without a care in the world? That's called bruxing. What? When a rat chatters its teeth, that's bruxing. He's not acting panicked or aggressive. I guess he's just happy. I look at its face. I don't know. His eyes keep going out of the socket and going back in. It looks... Disgusting. Like he's in a lot of pain. So he's boggling. He must be really content. How does he know so much about... Never mind. I'm getting an eerie feeling. This is weird, man. I have a feeling there's a kindred hiding nearby, weird. My thoughts exactly. Kadir slowly approaches a secluded corner of the room. And there it is. He kicks a pile of clothes lying on the floor. I'm just a corpse. Leave me alone. <laughs> oh, wow. He did find someone. Lucky for you, we're all corpses here, D'Angelo. You're among friends. Clumsily, drunkenly, the pile of clothes transforms into an unkempt man who looks like he's suffering from some sort of skin disease. Oh, gosh. You know, a true friend would just bury me. Unlucky for you, we're not that kind of friends. Lucky. Unlucky. Schmucky. My ass. How did you guess I was here? See, I've been asking around for the past few days. What I've learned is that, for reasons that can be described as nebulous, you've made quite a few enemies since last year. 
Yeah, yeah. Tell me something I don't know. And one thing that caught my interest is how everyone has it on good authority that your place was raided a few times without you being found, yet nobody has assumed responsibility for these acts. Hell. Doesn't this den always look like it was just raided? Can't blame anyone for making an educated assumption. I had a hunch these might be more than rumors. See, it sure looks like a convenient coincidence when everyone hears something that makes them look the other way, and coincidences are for fools. Well, you've got my number, and you can see my ugly mug right in front of you. So it's now you playing dumb, I suppose. Agreed. You've seriously spent all these weeks holed up in here? Is the hunger not getting to you? Got a lot of critters around this area, and, uh, we've become chums. Some of these rats actually got addicted to the kiss. They come to me every night acting like coke hounds begging for it. What's the kiss? The fancy romantic word for taking a nice deep drink of mortal blood. Oh, he's been drinking out of rats? Ugh. The recipients usually enjoy it almost as much as the bestowers, though not in the same way. For us as sustenance and taking care of a deeply rooted need. Most people I drink from end up dazed, not happy. Ugh, he's been drinking out of rats. Been getting him drunk just to get some rush out of feeding on him. Feels a bit like slathering a horribly burned piece of pizza and ketchup, but in this situation, I'll take what I can get, you dig? It's so gross, I fail to keep my poker face. He notices. So who's the dame? Julia Sawinski, detective investigating Baron Callahan's death. He raises his head for a short while to stare in Kadir's eyes and treat him with a vulgar snicker. Fooey. So somebody's finally put the old man on ice. Whoever did it did the world a huge favor. Absolutely. But I got orders to establish who that was, and I've been stumbling in the dark for the past few days. We need your help. I'll be damned. Your sleuth skills must really not be up to par if you're begging a bum for help. Have some dignity. It's not an unusual case. Not exactly. As if... Have some dignity, man. He's just so sorry to look at. Dignity. Spare me, kiddo. I've got all the dignity I, I need, right? Ah, shit. He accidentally lets a metal flask in his hand. Slip out and fall to the floor, then struggles to pick it up. Kadir can't bear to watch. God, what happened to you, Gianni? I've never seen you this low before. Stress-related disorders causing a disruption in my routine, is what I think a shriek would say. Happens when a lot of shady folks are out to put a stake through your chest. Help us out. Tell us what you know, and we might be able to help you in return. Yeah, uh, respect where it's due, miss. But I think it's going to be the other way around. Uh, I ain't telling the two of you shit. Pardon my French. Until I know I can count on some protection. Gianni. Don't you Gianni me, Kadir Alasmai. I know your level, but I also know that your honor is one of the few things you care about. You want me to endanger myself. You put it on the line for me. And that's that. You either promise to extend your protection of me, or the moment you step away from here, I sneak away into the sewers, and that's the last time you'll ever see me. Kadir shoots me a weary sideways glance. I know, I know. He drives a hard bargain. Especially for someone whose sense of self-worth doesn't exactly appear to be sky high at the moment. Maybe, but I do value my unlife quite a lot. Thank you very much, friends. Kadir sighs. All right, three months from now, or the moment 
Prince Panhard tells me it's no longer possible for the court to offer you safety without compromising its principles. You're on your own. No negotiations. That's the only deal. I can strike with you. Take it or leave it. D'Angelo scratches his head, grunts loudly, tugs on his mask and stands up. That's Jake with me, big fella. I might have strong opinions about Panhard, but hell, I'm sitting on dynamite. I'll take what I can get. Who else in New York would you rather rely on? You want me to call the mayor? My opinions about the prince aren't that bad. So, what do you good folks want from me? Who wants you dead? Ah, starting the interrogation with a tricky one. Wouldn't I like to know? Step up, Gianni. You seem to be forgetting how quid pro quo works. Wouldn't I like to know won't cut it. What can I tell you? The, that warlock, Agathion, or whatever his name is, presumed dead. Tamaki, M-I-A, with S-I on her back, so possibly K-I-A by now. Hope the kook? Hidden in her office under Vander Weeden's skirt. Around the time they started having trouble, some rough-looking streetwise kindred started hanging out at my usual spots. Didn't take me long to connect the dots. Wait, what's the connection between you and those three? Ever since last year, folks started hiring us for various gigs, see? Some even trying to get us to join their coteries. All these opportunities were rather short-lived. However, the delicate tightrope act of working for various employers made us fully aware. There's an intrasect alliance in NYC. Kindred from both sides often work for the same goals without knowing it. The moment we started figuring it all out, a cleanup crew went downtown. I know the serious warlock boy sniffed something out in his own backyard, but then poof! He disappeared. Then, I lost all contact with Hope and Tamika and went AWOL. Hope they're doing fine and they didn't snitch on me to anybody. They are, and they didn't even tell me you guys knew each other, so I think you're safe. Huh? Wait a second. Why are you milking me for intel, kiddo? I found a list of four names on Callahan's remains. You can probably guess what they were. I get the picture, yeah. Christ almighty. I have heard it was just a list of freelancers. Potential associates. Probably prepared by Kander van der Weeden. This is... <sighs> this is all getting very intriguing now. Because... So before... So... Let's finish what he says first, and then I'll, I'll, I'll say what I have to say. Mm, my money's on him being involved, but I smell bullshit. You got any idea who might have done the boss in? Any more clues? Not at all. That's where we want you to come in, friend. Investigate the murder scene the only way you know how. Tell us what you think. Guide Julie in the proper direction. All right. So let's go over really quick what we know, right? So first off, all these people know each other. I'm assuming that this has to do with Coteries of New York, right? The, the one that came out before this one. I don't know why, but I have a hunch that these two stories are connected somehow. Um, so D'Angelo, Hope, that guy Agathon, and Tamika. Tamika we know used to be with the one uh, Torque. And Torque, I guess, is a big shot kind of guy, right? He's He is now the Baron of New York City because Callahan's gone, right? So, who would benefit from Callahan being dead? Well, a lot of people would benefit from Callahan being dead, right? 
a lot of people would sit there and assume that him being out of the picture would help a lot of people would help their their stuff out. I kind of think I think everybody's in on this. Right? Cuz nobody liked Callahan. Nobody liked doing business with him. No one really liked him. And then all of a sudden he's dead and no one supposedly knows who did it. The guy with the glasses that works with the prince, he's a prime suspect too because he knows some shit, right? The prince I don't know only because it's the prince, but I wouldn't be surprised if the prince had something to do with this too. Um, Yeah, this is getting crazy. I, I, I really don't know who to suspect as the potential like... Um, you know person I, I i i really don't know uh yeah sure whatever i will try my best kiddo lead the way i'll drive you there or at least as close as possible wouldn't be welcome that deep in anarch territory just clean yourself up a bit gianni i just had my upholstery cleaned earlier this week back in the car after dropping us off at the same place Catherine first introduced me to Mia, Kadir quickly drives away. Here we are. Swell, a classic closed room mystery. Let me take a look. He starts walking around the office, carefully taking in every element. So you're saying you're basically a nobody, but you can simply call Catherine Weiss and have her open Sesame and in our crib for you. Dunno, sure sounds like somebody to me. Don't misunderstand. I only met her during the course of this investigation. Everyone's basically been treating me like dirt wherever I go. And I'm only acknowledged enough to legitimize this sham. Lord Castlery. Now that was an abrupt interruption. I was busy sharing, damn it. Excuse me? He's pointing at the painting of the man overseeing this entire office. I met Murder on the way. He had a mask like Castlereagh. Very smooth, he looked, yet grim. Seven bloodhounds followed him. He seems to have completely switched his modus operandi upon seeing the murder scene. Oh, there's a ghost! There's another ghost! I saw it! By the painting! By the painting! If you look at the painting... Wait, let's see if it'll show up again. Please show up again. I'm not crazy. I, 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 I saw it out of the corner of my... Oh, there's another one! By the window! Okay. Yeah! Oh, maybe it was by the window. Maybe that was... Oh, no! There he is! Man, this is interesting. He seems to have completely switched his... Oh, we already read that. He's in his own little world, and his behavior has become more machine-like. Erratic. I, uh, still don't follow. I never knew the old Irish coot was into the Napoleonic era. But then again, I've no idea of his exact age, of course. So maybe that's when he lived, or was born. Anywho. Pay minimal, minimal attention to me, all right? Who am I looking at here? Right, right, right. That's one Lord Castlery, born as Robert Stewart, British Secretary of State for Foreign Affairs at the beginning of the 18th century. Incredibly influential. Incredibly hated. Ask one fella about Castlery, and he'll tell you. He was the man who destroyed Napoleon for good. The man who shaped British politics for ages. The man who built foundations for European unity at Vienna. Ask another fella, and he'll tell you he was the man who destroyed the Irish Parliament. The man who cracked down on any possibility of reform, and then supported the cavalry massacring peaceful protesters. He's spouting these facts like a computer. Is that the hint of a detective's photographic memory? I have to say, 
it's, uh, it's downright perverted for an Irishman to put up Castlery's portrait in his office. Definite proof that our victim was sick in the head. Ah, as if we needed more evidence there. Probably idolized him, too. Maybe identified with him, even. Yeah, that's possible. Callahan and his ilk adore these jagoffs who strive to reach across the aisle and achieve hard compromises. Too bad nobody else ever remembers them well. I feel like I should say something. I've got this nagging feeling in the back of my mind. How... how did he die? Committed suicide in the 1820s. Family took every sharp item away from him, but he was well... well dedicated. Why did he do it? Pressures mounting from all sides. Deserved hate coming from all sides. Plain old overwork. Also might have gone nuts. Kept saying he saw ghosts, otherworldly silhouettes were guiding him, yada yada yada. An unpleasant feeling grows in my stomach. Also, there's a rumor someone was threatening to expose him as a homosexual. Having to choose between being publicly denounced and ending it all by his own hand, uh, he chose the latter. Well, that's just depressing. Maybe. But the silver lining is, it couldn't have happened to a nicer fella. He stops above Callahan's corpse and laughs. <laughs> Posterity will ne'er survey a nobler grave than this. Here lies the bones of Cassare. Strop, traveler, and piss. And he kicks those bones with glee, causing me to jump a little. Is he still under the influence? Uh, isn't that tampering with the crime scene? You know, as far as I can see, this crime scene's been fucked with three times over. Can't really be ruined more than it already has. I agree, but it looked about the same the last time I was here. Then it was already a total mess before you even got here. Whatever. Standing by the metal shutters on the windows, he abruptly changes the topic. Light proof. Have you toyed with these? No. Uh, in general, I avoid machinery like that. It doesn't like me, and I don't like it. They don't like you? They don't work properly. It's like I give technology an allergy. Sometimes industrial cameras mess up my face. Sometimes I can't use a phone. You'd think it could be useful, but it's just a curse. I see. You think these blinds could have been the murder weapon? Oh. Actually, yeah, they could have. Yeah, I did entertain the possibility. Would make sense, wouldn't it? Let's say, for some reason, our stiff was just standing there as the sun was rising. Maybe staring at poor old Castlery. Castlery? I think it's how you his name. Looking for a soulmate to accompany him to the other side. Yet another guy pushed to suicide by politics. Pretty old school romantic. Yada, yada, yada. Or, maybe it was torpor. Or maybe it was a freak accident. Or maybe it was premeditated. In any case, sunlight would be a perfect murder weapon now. He takes off the, the mask to shoot a disfigured smile my way. Well, that's just a theory anyway. Well, it sounds... Sound? Does it? I was just spitballing. 
It's practically impossible to make certain now, kiddo. The most logical cause of final death would be damage to the heart, and that can easily be done without damage to the skeleton. And he sets off with a wink. What is he playing at here? The safe. Anyone made a crack at it yet? As far as I know, only Callahan knew the code. And the safe itself is pretty hard to crack. Watch me, kiddo. He presses an ear to the safe and slowly begins to rotate the dial. Stop clowning around. You're a safe cracker now? When you're cursed with countenance such as mine, and you decide on a job such as mine, you gotta be a jack of all trades. Yeah, but that still sounds pretty hard. Last year, there was a random feller visiting a heritage museum in Alberta. He found a safe that hasn't been opened in 40 years. Not a single specialist nor even a blacksmith could have handled it. The man just studied the numbering, listened closely to the mechanism, attempted the most sensible combinations, and voila! The unthinkable happened. That's where just trusting your instinct leads you. Too bad he found nothing inside but an old pay sheet. A metallic screech. The <laughs> I'll be damned. <laughs> wow. This guy's cool. I actually like this character. And it looks like we've got the same case here. Confetti. A few random papers scattered around. But, for what it's worth, the lock has obvious traces of mechanical manipulation. Probably recent, too. Reeks of foul play. What do we know for sure, really? I'm done here. You can take over. Another walk in a random direction. I look inside the safe. Quite spacious. I haphazardly grab everything that's left inside the safe and hide it on my person. Then close the door so that nobody knows we, well, he, managed to crack it. When I turn around, he's motioning me to come closer to a sheet of paper lying on the desk. So yeah, kiddo, you probably know the entire beeswax about Schrodinger's cat, so I'm not going to bore you with that. But honestly, anything could have happened here. I read the text he's written on the empty page. This place is w Oh, shit. It's wired. Yeah, actually, I'm not surprised. place like the Baron's house, of course it would have to be wired, right? That makes actually a lot of sense huh I, it gives me chills I think I think I'm okay I've tried to record my own voice a bunch of times on different hardware just to see if I can it mostly comes out as noise he nods, then starts scribbling something else as he continues blabbering on and on. The best strategy would be to make an educated guess about what happened here, then interrogate everyone about it. Maybe I'll take someone by surprise, drop a hook on them. The wiretap is a chip in the broken glass bottle on the floor. Absolutely sure it belongs to... Kaiser? Kaiser, the elusive information broker, the talk of the city, finally got an excuse to nab him. I understand. I think I have an idea how to use it to find him. Should I notify Kadir? Scribble, scribble. Takes longer than before. Uh, yeah, I'll be meeting up with Kadir. Uh, you stay here, sister. Maybe there's something you've been missing. Your call, doll. You're going beyond his jurisdiction, so he will try to stop you. Whatever you do, just give me a ten-minute heads up, you know, so I can get to relative safety. For sure. 
And it's back into the sheriff's custody for me. See you around, Julia. Sorry this old codger couldn't have been more help. I will get his ass. Whatever I got was pr plenty. See you around, D'Angelo. Damn. Well, here we go. I've got a plan. Now all I need is to execute it as a clueless bystander. This guy will do. Oh, it's random passerby. Okay, we got to give him a voice. Uh, do you like need me for anything else? Not really. Better take a hike before the guy you've just called shows up. I can't guarantee he won't make you hurt. Ugh, will do. He hits. He puts his head down and obediently trots away down the street. I might have messed with his head a little too much using my wily kindred charms, but I needed him to tell Kaiser where I want to meet quite clearly multiple times. I would have given him the kiss as thanks at least, but I told the big man I won't be here all night and that he'd better hurry up, so I want to be ready whenever he comes. Less than 15 minutes later, a menacing black limo takes a fast, sharp turn onto my street and stops right in front of me. Suddenly, something like an acid flashback hits me. I know this limo. I've seen it all around over the past few days, but never thought it might be tailing me. Still, it must have. Looks like I'm about to get some answers. Yeah, we fucking are. Doors open and a raspy voice comes from inside. Get the fuck in, Sawinski. I smile and accept the invitation. There he is. Kaiser, the king of New York City's information highways. Surrounded by screens, speakers, and newfangled technological gizmos of all kind. Oh, look at this dude. Holy shit. Is he a Nosferatu? He must be. <laughs> yep, he's a Nosferatu. First impression. He's one repulsive son of a bitch. D'Angelo was also a sewer rat, and he might have uh, had similar physical disadvantages, but at least he was wholly endearing. With this guy, there's no room for any kind of sentiment. He's inhumanly cold, and I get the feeling he's been like this for ages. You're getting on my nerves, little lady, and I'm far from being the only one. I get the sense he meant for all this to be threatening. Instead, I'm elated? What? <laughs> what? <laughs> After a week of running around like a headless chicken. Oh, I see. So basically what she's saying is, for a week, she was unsure she was getting anywhere. She didn't think she was making any progress. And finally, this backhanded comment is like the first thing that feels like she's getting somewhere in this investigation. Yeah, that makes sense. <gasps> Wait a minute. Wait a second. Hold the phone. Oh my god. Okay, I thought one of the TV screens was that lady with the fur ruff that was like dogging us in the diner. Shit, I had no fucking idea that might have been her. Damn. If there's one thing I learned back in Lodestar, it was that you only know you're doing your job correctly when someone powerful gets visibly mad. Don't piss me off, old man. If you want to escalate, I can escalate. And there's a lot of expensive shit here you probably wouldn't want me to break. Ah, yes, I did hear you in tech don't get along. Is that why you left the mess down in the double spiral basement? He scoffs at me with pure contempt. I'm sure. <laughs> I'm sure he did. Listen, 
I will speak as plainly as humanly possible to get this through your little head, since it's obvious you're not willing to read the obvious signals. You were hired for one thing and one thing only, little lady. To suck at your job. And you couldn't even do that correctly. Yeah, we figured that they were treating her like shit on purpose, right? People keep stopping by my limo this week, telling me, Kaiser, dear Kaiser, we keep trying to make her understand how hopeless she is, but she just won't get a clue. She doesn't have any evidence. She doesn't have any testimony, but she still goes around knocking on everyone's doors, causing disturbances. It's such a fucking headache. This guy's voice is hurting my throat, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna do it. I already, it, it seems like it fits. Usually I try to be a jovial host, so I cheer them up. She's not that much of a dunce, I say. She's making mountains out of mole hiddles to make herself seem useful, I say. She's about to stop. But you and your infinite idiocy decided to prove me wrong in the most spectacular fashion by knocking on my very own door, forcing my hand, threatening me even. Are you autistic or something, huh? Can't read basic fucking social clues? Stop for one second. Ask yourself, qui bono? Who even fucking wants you to solve anything, let alone this case? You see, this city has a delicate system set in place. Usually it's flawless. But ever since you started tinkering with it, it's been having those irritating malfunctions. And it's driving people... Are you done? <laughs> yeah, you, you tell him. Tell him, Julia. Don't take his shit. A weird, disgusting sound. It's like between a gargle and a bark. <laughs> Caught him off guard, apparently. Escapes his throat. Unbelievable. I'm assuming that noise was like, <laughs> All I'm hearing is that you're in possession of some information that might help me solve the puzzle I was presented with. If that's the case, I'm going to ask you to share it. I swear, you're absolutely irredeemable, you fucking garbage dump of a woman. How do I get through all the rubbish in your head to drive my point in? Don't you know who I fucking am? Ah, here we go. Oh, I know who you are. You are the person who had Callahan's place wired. Which makes you a possible witness of sorts. Or even a suspect. Psh! For Christ's sakes, woman, get real. Even if your accusations were correct, then who, pray tell, who would you even report them to? Do you even know what kind of people I answer to? No, care to acquire that? Actually, yeah, Julia, that's a good question. Who does he fucking work for? Now I'm actually genuinely curious. And I bet, you know what, no, you know what? I bet you, I bet you, that he works for the prince and all the higher-ups in that court. I bet you that's who he works for. It makes total sense. And I'll tell you why. Really quick. Before we, we continue for a little bit more. It makes sense because a baron was murdered. There are tons of people who would love to have this baron get murdered, right? Tons of people. Here's the part that's interesting. They picked a random person out of the blue, a total person they could say, oh yeah, this, this person we can, if something goes south, we can just blame her. All of our hands are clean. 
from the get-go, it seemed fishy. And now we're at a point where I'm like, I bet it was one of them, if not all of them. I am, I am calling it right now. That is my bet. I am calling right now that it was every, it was a conspiracy. I bet every, I never played Coteries of New York, but I bet you that it's a conspiracy and they wanted Callahan out of the way so that they could fucking go in, take all of his shit and do something with whatever he was doing. Again, I think if I played Coteries, I would kind of get an idea as to what's going on, but still, anyway. Is that really what you want? You want to know who pulls the strings? Give me ten minutes, and I can arrange a meeting. But this is your last chance to turn back. If you don't, I can tell you now, you're going to be sorry. The big kahuna! Finally, now we're talking! Yes, the big kahuna. So, this is your final answer, huh? Absolutely! Unbelievable. He takes out his phone and begins furiously typing. I relax in the seat. Finally, we're getting somewhere. It might be dangerous, yeah. But at least I will finally get a clue of what's going on. I'm just saying, this is the point of no return. My boss doesn't fuck around. Best case, you're going to beg him to take you in. Whatever. He keeps grumbling under his breath, but I'm not even listening. I just watch the streets go by. Until out of the blue, I experience a strong sense of foreboding. Oh, it's another ghost! It's another ghost! I first spot her in the corner of my eye. She's hovering right next to Kaiser with an expression that's impossible to discern. When she speaks, her voice is machine-like, otherworldly. Fine. We're five minutes away or so. Get the boys ready to give her the Mel Gibson special. She can... Oh, God. She... She's able to see people as they're responding to tech shit. Oh, damn. Dang. Okay. We are close. I can feel in my bones that we are getting close to the end. Something is going to happen and it's going to be big. The moment he puts away his phone, the silhouette disappears. Five minutes away. Better start figuring out the ways you might prove yourself useful to the honcho. There is no honcho. Oh my god, of course this motherfucker is setting me up. I need to get out of here now. I do the first thing that comes to mind. I grab the door handle and pull. He notices me scrambling and struggles to grab me. Hold up, you stupid fucking cunt. Glass breaking. Loud thuds of something heavy hitting the asphalt. Tires screeching. Oh god. We're gonna be in an accident. I think he grabbed me. I think he tried to pull me back in. I think we fell out of the limo. I think his body cushioned my fall. Good little shit. We're gonna beat the shit out of you now. But I'm struggling to process what's going on. It's like I'm blanking out. When I come to, he's already attempting to get up, cursing under his breath. The limo has stopped a little further in, but whoever the driver is, he's not coming out. It's probably a ghoul, right? Fucking... When he stands up, he'll be out for vengeance. He's an older vampire who knows how strong he is. I need something that will give me the advantage. The pepper spray! Hell yeah! Hell yes! It probably won't be as effective as it would be on a living person, but it's still worth a try. I limp 
toward the asshole, disarm the device, aim towards his eyes, and unload the entire canister. Ah! Oh, it got him good. Oh, I'm sure it fucking hurt. Fuck you, you bastard. Try to set us up or to kick your ass. It worked. It actually worked. I keep up the offensive. I punch him. Kick him. Throw him around. I pummel him. I smash his head against a curb. Wow, she really did kick the shit out of him. Holy crap. I struggle to harm him in, in whatever way I can, like a frightened animal. I don't know how long it lasts. Might be one minute. Might be eternity. The driver steps out of the limo to help his boss, but once he sees what I'm doing, he runs in a panic. <laughs> you know what? You know what? This is satisfying. After all this shit that we've been through, this actually is going to be satisfying for Julia, man. She's actually getting shit done. And that's great. Good for you. Yeah, you say it. I bet it does feel good, Julia. Good for you. Take some fucking assertion into the situation you're in right now. Feels absolutely horrible. Once I'm done, I sit on the curb and scream my lungs out to avoid crying. And then I look at him. Wow, she beat the hell out of him. Dang. That's actually a, a new still, too. He seems shocked. Barely hanging on. I know what I've done was extremely stupid. I did hear how he's one of the most influential figures in the city. But that's probably why he never expected to get his ass whooped. Yeah, well, yeah. Especially by someone like me. When he speaks again, his voice is pathetic, surprisingly close to a whimper. You'll pay. You'll fucking pay. You lost, mislaid, and abandoned property of a woman. He's unwell, talking nonsense. I approach him again. You wanted to have me whacked. What do you think I am, stupid? You needed to... Taught a lesson. Well, would you look at who ended up teaching who? This dude, th this is this is what this is, you guys. He is trying to teach her a lesson because she's actually making progress. And everyone, the lady in the diner that told us to be to turn this into a dog for a little bit mentally, that everyone has been trying to make Julia not succeed in her job. Because something is going on, and I, again, I, I said this last time, I bet you it's everybody. Everybody is in on this. It makes total sense why everybody, especially to the leagues that they're going to, to try to make her fail. Anyway, I'm sorry, I just, I, it's just crazy how now things are starting to add up in my brain. Now talk. Tell me everything you know about Callahan's final death. All of it. Go to hell. You can fuck me up. However bad you want. I'm still not going to tell you shit. You try anything. There will be consequences. There will be retribution. My mouth is shut. He might be my last chance to solve the case, but if I don't force him to talk, he won't. There's a burgeoning thought in my head, but it scares even me. Do I dare push him to the edge? Make him suffer until he squeaks? Ooh. Ooh. Well, you know, circumstances as they are, and the fact that he tried to get us killed, and the fact that that son of a bitch thinks that we're just going to let this slide, 
No. No. You know what? No. We're going to do whatever's necessary. Screw this asshole. Well, I'm sure you'll open your mouth if I do this. I put his shin against the curb. Wait. What? And kick with all my strength. Ah! I'm not going to do it too loud because my mic will be terrible. I apologize. It's a compound fracture. I barely manage to suppress my gag. Oh, because she's never done this before. That's right. It feels like I'm dissociating. You fucking psycho! You fucking psychotic bitch! He's actually weeping. Like a child. Wow, he talked a big game. And now he's crying. Go figure, right? Totally shatters the tough image he was trying to... Yeah, this is exactly what I was saying. It totally breaks the image he had earlier, for sure. Like, this is the first time anyone has ever used physical violence against him. But what if it is? I could see that. Because, you know, he's such a big information broker, it makes sense that no one would really try to harm him. Because he's like, well, I have a boss, and the boss will fuck you up. What are you going to do? You either start talking, or the other leg goes. Then the hands. And then, I'll get creative. Oh, he's thinking now. <laughs> he's thinking now. He's like, oh, shit. What do I do? <laughs> I, tr I try to collect myself and put his other leg against the curb. I'll talk. I'll fucking talk. The kick connects. It's a light one. A sadistic feint. It still manages to get a pathetic... Well, yeah, because he was expecting it to break, and then it didn't. He's just like, oh, thank God. Thank Gaia. Whoever it is. Then talk. But this better be good. He looks at me with pure fury. Then begins to speak through clenched teeth. You want to know who was in Callahan's office before he died, little lady? Everyone. Fucking everyone and their mother was there. Vander Weeden, Aisling. Arturo and Panhard. That Khmer douche motherfucker Torque with his sidekick. All of them. Oh my god, I called it! I called it! I was just guessing! Whoa! Hang on, hang on. I have to, like, process the fact that I was right for a second. Oh, gosh. Okay. Well, all right. Oh, God. I'd, wow. All right. Cool. <laughs> Callahan thought that the only way out was to pit them all against each other or to ally with every single one of them. Little did he know it was all in their best interests for him to just fucking die. That's good. That's great. But who killed him? I have no fucking idea. That won't do. Once again, I put his leg in a potentially disastrous position. In response, he starts howling maniacally. You fucking sadist! You fucking monster woman, I really have no idea. Who kept complaining to you about me? Who's responsible for getting rid of the evidence? Everyone. Everyone did. Goddamn Callahan had dirt on everyone and antagonized everyone. So it took everyone 
to fucking bring him down. All evidence is gone. Every theory is equally true, so none of it is. Don't you see, you fucking cunt? Everyone is complicit, so nobody is. Why the fuck you think Sophie Langley is no longer around? Why is Torque no longer pretending to be a revolutionary? Why are free agents involved? Why are they shutting you up tomorrow? Shutting me up? Who? Can't you connect the dots, you dumb whore? What are you, a fucking retard? Somebody's about to get... Julia. Oh, God. Kadir's here. Oh, fuck. Oh, no. Oh, this is actually not good for us. This is not good for us. I'm actually worried now. Oh, God. Kadir. Why are you here? How did you know what was going on? I look back over my shoulder and see Kadir. Bloody hell. What is wrong with you? Kadir? You're out of control. This is why I didn't want you to get involved. I had a hunch. A hunch that the moment you get a whiff of true power, all breaks will be off. Bullshit. You're out of your damn mind. I should have had you in for a potential masquerade breach. Just let me explain myself. This ugly fuck tried to have me beaten, maybe even killed. Don't you care about that? I have no idea, Sheriff. No idea she's a dangerous psychotic. Shut the fuck up. I can't control myself. I kick him where I know it will hurt him the most. My fucking leg! Stop this right now, you goddamn idiot. I freeze in place. I've never heard him use that tone with me. I will take care of you in a moment in my car, Kaiser. Hold on. I'm not done questioning him yet. It looks like there's a major conspiracy to... I'm going to have to ask you to leave, and you're going to be glad I leave it at that. He's in on it, too. Our boy, Kadir, is in on the conspiracy. He's against us. I didn't want to believe it, but now I believe it. If you do that, I'm going to have to assume you're complicit. That's worth two strikes in my book. You don't want to risk a third. So that's it? Tell me, what was all my footwork even for? We'll be seeing each other, little lady. Can you hear this? Go home, Julia. But... Go home. Fine. I will. But before I do, I take a quick peek into Kaiser's limo, still abandoned a little further down the street. I skip the church visit again tonight. I want more time to finish this report. Who knows, it might be my final one. I want to spend more time with Dakota. Yep, just forget about the rest of the world. A lot happened tonight, but I can still manage to, to be at our apartment an hour earlier than usual. She should be glad. I sneak into the apartment as silently as possible, trying to surprise her. Oh. Oh, no. When I reach the bedroom, I see something unexpected. This is a lot. You know? I mean... We found out, right, that my hunch... That everybody was involved in Callahan's death was correct. We get told, right, told that this dude has been following us for the whole entire week. He has been telling people that, you know, oh, 
She's not going to find anything. She's not going to find anything. D'Angelo gets on the case, and then all of a sudden, we get evidence that, yes, the place was tapped. He knows what's going on. And now we have Kadir showing up out of nowhere as if he fucking knew that this was happening. And he tells us to go home. He doesn't tell us that he's going to help us. He doesn't tell us that he's going to support our case. He literally is like, oh, I should have known you would do this. Oh, you're too drunk with power. What are you doing? So either Kadir is just... So Kadir is either against us or Kadir is basically misinformed, right? That's what... A, I want to give him the benefit of the doubt that he was misinformed, he was at the wrong place at the wrong time, and he just thinks we're doing stupid shit. But at the same time, a part of me is like, no, I know better. I know better. And I wonder if playing Coteries, I would have figured this out sooner. When I reach the bedroom, I see something unexpected. Is she dead? Is Dakota dead? I'm going to be pissed if Dakota's dead. It hits me like a ton of bricks. At the beginning, I can't properly parse the sight. But when I finally understand what I'm looking at, it causes a wave of terror and disgust to well up inside my chest. What? 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 She's fine. What's going on? I don't understand. Wait, is she wearing Julia's clothes? What the fuck? Yeah, what the fuck? What's going on? Wait, I don't get it. She's just sitting there waiting for us. She's dressed up like a goth. What's going on? Exclamation point. She's shocked to see me doesn't know what to do. She's like a deer in the headlights or a schoolgirl proper poorly trying to hide her misdeeds from a teacher. You're, uh, you're home early. Yes, I am. These are my clothes, Dakota. These are my cigarettes. That's my jewelry on the table. Yeah, uh, I was, uh... Okay, now I'm suspicious. What the fuck is going on? What is going on? I, I, I don't understand what's going on, guys. I, I'm actually confused. And I'm pretty sure... God almighty, I thought I was just being neurotic whenever I noticed something dreadfully familiar in you. I, I never... I can explain. Please do explain. Uh-oh. Can she, though? A good ten seconds of awkward silence pass. I can see her spending an eternity in her head. This isn't what it looks like. Oh my god, it is exactly what it looks like. I'll just come out and say it. Dakota? Are you single white femaling me? I don't know what that term means. Maybe I do, and I'm just not getting it in my head very well right now, because maybe I'm just too stupid to figure it out at the moment, but I'm just going to see what they say. Maybe it'll explain itself, and then I'll, I'll figure it out. It all makes sense now. No! C come on, no! I thought I was the leech in this relationship. We watched that movie together. We made fun of Jennifer L Jason Lee together. A roommate stalking and imitating her own roommate. Ha <laughs> ha, what a concept, right? But I was being fed on in a far more sinister way without knowing it. Don't, uh, don't be silly. Silly? Silly, I've never been this serious with you. So whenever she put on my makeup... Whenever I used her as a mirror, 
Was she always hyping me up because she wanted to live vicariously through me? So many little things make sense in retrospect. Little ways you kept modulating your speech after me. The, the weird ways our tastes were always compatible. Some of your art feeling so familiar. None of it would trigger any alarms by itself. And yet... She's as humanely embarrassed as possible. Julia, listen... Don't fucking touch me. Damn. Wow, that's rough, man. I can barely think of anything more repulsive than being put on a pedestal like this. It's like the other person is begging me to perceive them as someone worse, if not outright subhuman. Oh, man. Poor Julia, man. Don't be like this. You just don't. You know? This would probably be infinitely more palatable if you talked to me like a person here and not like, I don't know, your fucking mommy. Oh boy. Well, she caught her there. You know what? Fuck you. I've been locked in this apartment. By myself because of all the pandemic shit going on. The Backstreet Boys reunion tour. I feel that. It's fucking me up. I know you've had it hard right now, so I didn't want to bother you. Yeah, I was counting on you to ask about how I'm feeling. Babe, how's your work-life balance? Aren't you feeling claustrophobic? Hey, is it just me or is our drug supply weirdly shrinking too fast? But no... You were too much of a self-centered bitch. You regularly suck me dry. And it's okay, but the moment I entertain the thought of taking something in return, I'm crossing a line. Oh no. I'm a member of an immortal elite secret society. It's so hard to cope. Dakota, whenever I gracefully decide to visit our apartment, let's just do what I enjoy until the pain stops. Fuck you. Fuck you. Sincerely. Okay, so, alright, alright, alright. So, clearly... Clearly... These two have issues. That they really, really should have addressed. Way before it got to this point. Dakota has a point. Since we've been playing this, Julia has not really been taking into account... Dakota's stuff, right? She's not considered how Dakota's been doing. I mean, they talk about shit and everything, but, you know, they don't talk about things. They don't do a lot of stuff. She's not been able to get out of the apartment and have her own life because she's stuck because of the Backstreet Boys reunion tour. There, there's a, you know, a thing going around. But at the same time, Dakota should know that what Julia is doing is... You know, this is the first time since being a vampire that she has give, been given the chance to do stuff. And, I mean, Dakota at least was supportive, right? It wasn't like she wasn't supportive. But I do feel like these two, there's no right side in this argument. That's what I'm trying to get at. There's no right side in this argument. They both fucked up. They both fucked up. And now they've gotten to a point where instead of talking about things in a healthy way like most relationships are supposed to be, they just didn't say anything. And then all of a sudden, here we are. She's saying, fuck you, fuck you, fuck you. And it's like, well, okay. Now you've, you can't go past that point of no return now. You, you, you kind of are screwed, right? Fuck you. Sincerely, fuck you, fuck you, fuck you. There's nothing you can do but take. And you should have learned by now that just taking won't make you happy, you big dumb bitch. Stop. Just. I'm destined for better things than this. 
Get the fuck out of here. You disgust me. Dakota breaks down crying. She grabs a jacket and a purse, then runs out of the apartment, and I don't try to stop her. I stand there for a short while in silence and then lock the door. Did she take her keys? I don't know. I don't know if I care. I desired for someone else, not for myself, for a way to open a different world and not get locked back in mine. Well, I can't blame you, Julia. I mean, you're up shit creek without a paddle right now. You, you're... Your bosses are probably going to try to kill you tomorrow. Your girlfriend, well, ex now, just ran out. I don't think there's any hope of repairing that relationship. And if there is, it's going to be very, very thin ice. Yeah, I can see why she thinks that. I collapse onto the soft bed. I smell her perfume. I always liked it, but now it makes me slightly nauseous. I try not to think of Dakota. I think of Kaiser. I think of Kadir. I think of Callahan. No matter what I think of, I sense doom. I feel that I've just sealed my fate, whatever it may be. Everything fucking sucks. Back into the void. Back into the void. Back into the void. Oh boy, here we go. The last day. We've made it. The final night. It's the final countdown. For me, it always starts with an image. Oh, we're back here. An image which might be vaguely eerie or interesting, but usually not an image that would provoke particularly strong feelings by itself. Usually it hides a mystery. That much is correct. But that mystery doesn't exist without a text, or more specifically, a context. For context is everything. This is true, depending on the situation it can be. One way or another, you need to process what you're looking at. Maybe that context will be something you've heard or overheard. Maybe, although it's quite rare and pretty special, it'll be your own creative, captivating, Complete interpretation. A ghost of an idea. Is this a half-forgotten memory of something unspeakably beautiful I will never, ever see again? Just a scene from a movie? A fragment of a music video? An animation? Or maybe this really is the last thing Callahan ever saw in his unlife. Warm sunbeams, caressing his skin and turning it to ash. A giant ball of fire engulfing his body in flame from 93 million miles away. Was he terrified? Was he grateful? There's no will. No suicide note. No nothing. Instead, we can only count on what the local historians will write, presumably letting their bias shape the narrative one way or another. What am I looking at here? A horrible, laughable hall of mirrors? A creep whom I never ever want to see again? A vampire much more despicable than myself? Or maybe... Someone who loved taking care of me, and deserved to be cared for in return? Funny thing. Whenever I was high as a kite, mentally lost in dimensions parallel to ours, she was my anchor. Our shared history, my feelings for her were an anchor. Matthew McConaughey, returning to his estranged daughter from the other side of the cosmos, from beyond the event horizon, guided by nothing but love. Then, whenever I got back to planet Earth for a week or two, I was haunted by a memory of that affection, 
I was the best possible version of myself toward her. But that haunting always refused to transfigure into something real. What gradually took its place were angry, disappointed thoughts. And among them, one thought that I was always trying to suppress. I need someone who'd know how to raise me up spiritually. But all I have is a psychophant who's always working her ass off to lift me up without understanding what I need. It's hurting us both. Having these words pop up in my head hurt me, because they had a ring of truth to them. But also because I knew there must be another narrative. A better narrative. I was just too stupid to find it. Story of my life. Story of my unlife. I still have no idea what I think about this city. I had my best city in the world phase. I had a just a playground for wealthy fucktards phase. Now I'm in search of a better description. One day, probably, I will stumble upon, like, a piece of writing or a prestigious TV show scene that will contain just that. And suddenly I will look at this place with new eyes. Or, maybe I won't. It's like the frustrations I had back at Lodestar. All these words constantly trailing behind reality, trapping you in useless mindsets instead of bringing enlightenment. Fuck all those flashy writers whose main concern is furthering their own brand. Douchebags who present you with limited, pathetic, depressing realities where they are kings. Fuck them all to hell. We need words that will paint a brighter future before our eyes. But what if that can't be done without reinterpreting the past first? What if we haven't even defined the ills and threats correctly? Once again, my thoughts return to the same visual that has been tormenting me for almost every waking moment of this past week. A senseless demise devoid of any context. A crime scene stripped of evidence. An image created by an unknown artist designed to leave you dumbfounded. The investigation is over. All the possible avenues explored. All the non-testimonies are in. No concrete evidence found. The play is almost complete. The actor is ready to leave the stage. It is what it is. I failed as a detective. Maybe through no fault of my own. But again, it is what it is. This case. This scene. This picture never needed an investigator. From what I understand, all the people in charge ever wanted was a talented... writer. What if... a ghost of an idea? When I wake up, Dakota is still not here. I don't know how to feel about that. So I just don't. Hadir hasn't left any messages by the door. Still that mad, huh? Well, to be fair... To be fair, Julia. You did sort of beat up the information broker for the council people. They're not going to take that sitting down. <laughs> He will probably appeal to the court to take me off the case. And if half the garbage Kaiser was spouting is correct, he shouldn't have, have he shouldn't have much trouble convincing everyone. Hmm. I look in the mirror and stare at my warped non-reflection. This place is upsetting. You need a change of scenery, girl. The depressing streets of a locked-down New York City will do. 
I really don't know what's going to happen now. You know? I mean, we know who did it. Dakota's gone. I don't think Julia's going to get a happy ending. I, I really don't. I really do not think things are going to work out for our girl here. But maybe they will. I don't know. The depressing streets of a lockdown New York City. Here we go. Oh, she's at the church. I think of God. Maybe that's why I half-consciously picked the cathedral as my destination. I think of the silver cross adorning my chest. An empty signifier. Whenever someone asks me why I wear it, they hear a different story. I think of these silhouettes that I keep spotting from the corner of my eye. No. I don't even want to imagine what that means. I feel what it means, and it makes me nauseous enough. I think of my clan so closely tied to the Catholic Church. It's a loveless marriage, so to speak. Like, for example, the one between my parents. I think about the great irony of the La Sombra's truce with the Holy See. We are the only ones who stay so close to the Lord's light, even though we're certain we will never, ever reach it. Some of us shadows have visions. Visions of comrades who departed this world recently, traveling through some abstract space, one that's disturbing and astonishing in equal measures. They almost reach whatever afterlife there is for our kind, but then get caught and consumed by a dark, monstrous silhouette. The rumor is our antediluvian wasn't stopped by his final death. He's still out there, behind the shadows, taking revenge for our patricide, feeding on us like Saturn devouring his children. Or Kronos, I think, is what they're referring to. The forebearers of every kindred belonging to the 13 vampire clans. These vicious bastards of the third generation created the world as we know it, and some features of our blood are said to have originated with them. Thanks for cutting me out of the internet, you Mesopotamian dickweed, is what I'd say if I didn't have a premonition we might see each other again someday. Somehow. Wow, damn. Crazy. As Dakota would say, it might not be factual, but it is an emotional truth. From joining the Camarilla to panically scrambling for any safe house, it's like our elders are solely motivated by fear. The sins of our fathers are catching up with them, and it's young kindred like me who are given responsibility to clean up their mess with the constant sense of doom looming over the horizon. We don't talk about salvation anymore. We're just minimizing the impact of damnation. That's no way to live. But then again, maybe that's why they call it unlife. Shit, it's been no eight. Hello there, lost sheep. I'll have you know this shepherd was extraordinarily patient in waiting for you. What are you doing out here while the night is so young? Out for blood? Well, you're in luck. This place offers both the body and blood. If missionaries learned their methods from pickup artists, they would all be like this guy. I'm not in the mood, you sorry ass bum. Step the fuck away from me or you're gonna be sorry. Oh my, something troubling you. If so, I can arrange a confession. Or, if you're in a hurry, keep in mind. The path from inner turmoil begins with a friendly ear. 
And I've got one right here. Kurwa Jibana Tuja. I don't know if I said that correctly. I'm sorry if I didn't. You want me to fuck you up, don't you? Don't you? Julia, as you should know by now, I always interpret this kind of response to preaching the divine as the devil stirring inside. Is that what it is, Julia? The liar and the father of lies got a hold on your soul. If so, give me a signal, even the smallest one. I'll do my best to spot it. Something swells up inside my chest. I recognize the feeling. The handbrake just broke, and I'm definitely not on level ground. Fuck, here we go. Listen, I've had enough, alright? Enough! Enough of your sanctimonious attitude. Enough of your brazen lack of basic empathy. Enough of your dumb, ugly fucking mug. You're a fucking singularity of stupidity, tastelessness, and cringe. I've met all sorts of horrible shitheads and asshats this week, and somehow none of them have got under my skin the way you do, you motherfucker. Like a goddamn Jehovah's Witness going from door to door, except you're always knocking on my fucking skull going, Hey, do you know God exists? Have you heard that God exists? Like... Hold on. Hold it right there. When did I ever say that God exists? Oh, shit, he got you, Julia. He got you. What? I said, what makes you think I believe God exists? Oh, now you're just fucking with me. No, I'm serious. Well, he sounds serious, at least. I'm actually speechless. I think there's been some sort of silly misunderstanding that desperately needs to be cleared up. I'm all ears. I sure hope so, Julia. I feel like you must have ignored half of what I've been saying for you to reach these conclusions. That's very well possible, actually. It usually takes 15 seconds of him talking to me to get me completely zoned out. So, to avoid any further mix-ups, I will go back to the beginning and explain the core of my religious beliefs, okay? So, hmm. Hmm. I love the Catholic imagery. I cherish the tradition and lore. I adore the practices, the intricacies of the theology, the messages contained in the Bible. Of course I do. But does that mean I believe that one day I will see the big dad in the sky? Forgive me, Lord, but I don't think so. Doesn't sound very likely, especially for a bloodthirsty creature of the night. So, that's what this is about? Fun imagery? That's oversimplified, but yes, I suppose you could say that. Motherfucker, you ain't Catholic, you're just a weirdo cosplayer! Says a non-practitioner who still wears a cross. Oh, ho, ho. Ah, well, okay, she just made a good point, too. Yeah, but I don't shove it down people's throats for fun in my spare time. I'm simply trying to share the joys religion has brought to my own life with others. What joys? Oh, where to start when there are so many? The joy of having plainly understandable rules to follow. The, the joy of having a, 
a structure to your life. The joy of always knowing where to find people who share your values. Above all, it's the joys of being in aristocracy, surrounding oneself with exquisite, luxurious architecture, beautiful classical music, ornate rituals formalizing our actions and relationships. A pursuit of virtue separating you from the masses, the hierarchies, the communities, all serving an idea greater than themselves. It's like monarchy or some Camarilla traditions, but not as go goosh, Gucci, Gauchi, I don't know. So that's what it was? You saw pretty paintings and buildings and that... Hell yeah, I want in! And then you just decided what they mean to you? Oh, don't get me wrong. It's real faith that brought me to the fold. But eventually I whittled down this religion to its core. To what interests me. Unbelievable! But don't think for a second I wasn't empathetic when I was trying to convert you. You are the embodiment of existential despair surrounding us. The one that people usually try to drown out with drugs, sex, work, Netflix, pick your poison. All of them temporary copes. Empty yourself. Kill your ego. Get a routine. Join a community. Ground your morality in something tangible. Start perceiving yourself as part of something greater. All of it good advice by itself, but codified in an appealing, otherworldly aesthetic. One that keeps the beast at bay. One you're almost fitting into the way you are. What's there to hate? The beast. Ah, yes. The beast. The beast is a bottomless pit of savagery and hunger, always under the surface, begging me to lose control. All vampires, and Garu, have it. Some worse than others. And it comes in many flavors. I don't know what would happen if I gave in to this urge, but somehow I doubt I would like it. Most don't. Because the beast means... You ever seen... Day, was it Daybreakers? Daywalkers? There's a movie about vampires that, um, it's, like, in the future, and they, like, rule the world, and they're using humans as, like, food, and then the food starts getting scarce, and this company's trying to make this fake synthetic blood, uh, to try to, like, you know, keep doing that, and then they find out that there's, uh, anyway, I'm not gonna spoil too much of the movie, but the point of the movie is there's a thing where if a vampire goes too feral... It becomes more bat-like than human, and it's terrifying. And that's what he—that's what the beast essentially is, kind of. The beast is that feral side of a vampire or a garu or whatever that just wants to be let out to just do whatever the hell it wants. Anyway, unbelievable! You're a goddamn lunatic. He looks to the sky. Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Stop that! Your entire ideology is just aesthetics, you fucking loon! And how exactly do I differ from anyone else nowadays in this regard? Stop arguing semantics! No. You stop. Look at yourself. A privileged burnout who refuses to invest herself in anything. Only started committing to anything when, for once in your unlife, you were forced into a politically charged, dangerous task. Once it's over, you'll be back to being an aimless brat. Desire to murder increases. He is speaking truth, though, Julia. You said that yourself earlier. I mean, that's the thing. It's like you... 
Julia, you're, you're digging yourself into a hole here, and I know you just want sympathy and everything, but he's not going to give it to you. Ever since World War II, I've been watching every person and every ideal I cared about wither and disappear. That's the source of my pain. That's the reason I am what I am. The source of your pain? A thing that defines you? People have been... mean to you. Fuck off! People in third world countries keep their heads high while suffering from every sort of horror. But you have a complete mental breakdown every time you remember you have mommy issues. Wow. Classy. Oh, don't act like you have the high ground here, you oblivious sadist. All I'm saying is, everyone has a different framework, a different lens to view their suffering through. Yes, and if there's one thing abandoning your humanity should have shown you, is that kind frameworks are not enough. Petty vendettas. Childish romances. Pointless power struggles. The dumb gamble that's chasing a successful career. Mommy and daddy issues? Sure, why not? Pain and pleasure dictate everything. Everyone wants something bigger than this. They want to escape from this drudgery. They want psychedelia, but permanent. They want to stare at God's face even if he does not exist. And you can show them how. Except the cross you're wearing into your heart, Julia. Oh, she's thinking about it. Accept it. Creepy fucker. Just accept it. All right, that will be enough, Benoy. The mood changes in an instant. The sight of Father Leonard takes us both aback. Father, what are you doing here so early? You two are arguing so loudly, I had to come out and check. Even if, with all the panic on TV these days, simply walking outside feels like marching into a war zone. Yeah, I, I, I'm sorry. You should be. I was willing to turn a blind eye to your quirks, because I believe you have your heart in the right place. Mostly. But I'm very disappointed in the way you approach folks in need. Right now, Benoit Seagal is displaying all the confidence of a scolded teacher's favorite. <laughs> well, I mean, yeah, his heart's in the right place, right? But he's just not really thinking very th through all that stuff. But I was just trying to guide her to, to set her on the right path. I know, Benoit. I know. That's the problem. The sacristy... The sacristy? Sacristy? Is open. Please head there right now. We need to have a long talk. Get me some coffee, if you wish. But... Benoit. He slowly slinks away. Looking defeated. Deflated. Debased. I burn the moment into my retinas. Etch it on my soul. <laughs> kind of hoping I'll never have to see him again. And this is how I'll remember him. Father Leonard watches him closely until he disappears from sight. Then turns to me. I feel sorry for him. I keep hoping he might find some basic empathy through faith. But all I've done thus far is let him leave you at the end of your tether. Yeah, that's some faith he has. 
Are you okay with all the bullshit he's spouting? Huh. I don't exactly support it. But I don't reject it. It's like attrition and contrition. Imperfect and perfect repentance. You know. One is focused on a relationship with God. The other selfish and focused on personal gain. But both of them work. Yeah, but doesn't this strike you as completely missing the point? A bit. Purely secular takes on Christ's teachings are nothing new. Pascal's wager is a boring example, but... Have you, by chance, read Bulgakov's The Master and Margarita? Sure. Back in Poland, every teen trying to look intellectual online loved to repeat that joke about the talking cat who swears he'd never pour vodka for a lady because women deserve pure alcohol. That's one takeaway from the novel, I suppose. I read it as a moving depiction of Christ who's not a divine being, stripped of mythic qualities but open for transcendence. Jesus and Satan understood as powerful forces battling within us. Would have to read it again. It's been too long. Sounds nice, though. I stretch lazily and take out another smoke. Leonard watches me closely before speaking up again. Julia. Hmm? Four hours from now, there's going to be a meeting in the Elysium. The big finale of Celebrations of Power. Everyone will be there, but they were counting on you to not show up. The good sheriff plans to present the results of the investigation in your stead. It's a simple, crude strategy. Might work, but begs to be countered with an outrageous tactic. Take it as you will. Father Leonard, my man! You lovable guy! He is telling us, do whatever the fuck you want. <laughs> Wow, Father Leonard, you're cool, man. You're cool. You are a cool dude. You know what's going on. The game is about to end. Momentarily, I'm left dumbfounded. All I can muster is an eloquent... Eh? Oh, don't ask me. I'm just the messenger. Who relayed this message to you, then? A good friend. A cautious friend. Wouldn't be able to tell you more than... Even if you forced me to. Well, shit! <laughs> this is the moment that might decide the rest of my days. What would you do in my place, father? When I was faced with a dilemma that would shape the rest of my life, the world felt too big and scary and impossible to understand. So I simply escaped from that choice and did to the seminary. Yeah, if that's your idea of good advice, I'm gonna have to ask you to shove it. I would expect nothing less. <laughs> Don't you regret it? Regret what? You're kind of shady, but don't seem like a bad guy. Still, you have to accept that the people above you are responsible for some horrible things. If our superior's acts count as our own sins, then on the face of it, probably half the people in this world are irredeemable. Clever, but not a real answer. And being a low-level grunt for assholes you find wholly objectionable is no way to live. I don't know. Is it? 
I finish the smoke in silence. I have to go. Don't know if and when we'll see each other again. But when that happens, I probably won't be the same old me. Of course. But before I leave to school, Benoit, let me say one more thing. Yeah? These are difficult times. My parishioners keep calling me. The things people are going through, they might never admit. But if this keeps up, it will cause horrifying, invisible damage to this nation. A dreadful darkness is killing us all, little by little. And like every powerful evil, it manifests itself, little by little. Huh. That's some deep stuff. And yet, sinful as it may be, I confess to being strangely excited. For a moment, we're seeing the suffocating normal disappear. This is th the time to dream a new world is possible. Walk these empty streets, Julia. Remember how the city feels right now. Bask in its shadows and uncertainties. After the apocalypse comes great rebirth. The Amici Noctis await your next report with great curiosity. I give him a nod and sprint away. Now I know what I must do. Heck yeah, we do. Hey, Moon. My lone, constant companion. When I moved here for good from, you know, the old country... You were the only close friend who kept me company. Never felt in the right place back there. Never felt in the right place here. Especially now, when I'm not quite alive, not quite dead. Not that Slavic. Not that American. But maybe it's about time I finally carve out some space for myself. It's been a long road, hasn't it? Oh. Wish me luck. Ah, uh, yeah, we will need it. I catch him in front of the art hole because, of course, he had to be the first person I met there. No way. No, 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 no. I'm going to be the laughing stock of the entire city if I don't show up to the resolution of my own investigation. How about you demonstrate a m modicum? M modicum? I think it's a modicum. I think that's the word. Of courtesy. Courtesy? Girl, I should put you on trial. Can't guarantee I eventually won't. You've messed with Kaiser, the eminence grissy, gris, grissy, of this city. You've beaten him to a pulp like a random goon. He will do everything he can to destroy you from now on, and my bet is he'll succeed. Whatever it will be, it will be. For now, at the very least, I'd like to show the court I'm not a baby fledgling who can't see a task she was given to the end. You're making a huge mistake. How did you even learn this meeting is happening in the first place? Huh. Huh. Maybe I'm not as trash an investigator as you thought I was. Yeah, you fucking tell him, Julia. Kadir, you've lost points with me. You were cool. Now, now you've pissed me off just like everybody else. I never said. But you're showing it. Oh. Yeah, how does it feel, Kadir? How does it feel? That's not a fair assessment. I wanted to finish this mess myself for your own good. It would be nice if you asked what I think next time. I'm actually pissed off he tried to pull this off without me. But I'm not letting it show. Counting on being able to guilt trip him in, into submission. His deep sigh of resignation proves that my tactic was successful. Fine. But you will stay quiet. The whole time. No tricks, ifs, or buts. Now we're going to say something. 
But of course, no, we're not. We're going to say something, Kadir. I'm sorry. That's not how this works. That's not how this works. Y'all have pushed us far too far. Now we get to push you guys. This way. We step into the maw of the gallery. The celebrations of power are almost over. Everyone is back to their usual respective styles again, looking weary of each other's company, trapped in their own little worlds. The art hole is nearly empty now, and Kadir is gently strong-arming the last remaining nobodies into leaving the premises. Eventually, only he, me, and a select few New York Camarilla VIPs remain. Ah, Miss Sawinski! Barely made it, huh? The asshole with the glued-on smile spots me first, and he's just as authentically enthused to see me as ever. So he finally showed his face around here. I wasn't sure if you'd join us tonight. Kadir made it this meeting sound like a one-man show. The preparations took me a bit longer than I thought they would. I apologize. Are you, by chance, uh, planning to surprise us with something? Well, if I was planning something, it wouldn't be a surprise if I told you now, would it? Can I have... Oh, sure. Yeah, we're gonna fucking begin, all right. Can I have everyone's attention, please? We're about to begin. Oh boy, here we go. We're going in. Everyone remaining in the building gathers around Kadir. Ah, exciting! I haven't seen Catherine in so long. Is everyone present? Oh, Miss Aisling. Present. And accounted for. My prince. Yes. Before we begin, let me welcome an, uh, unusual guest to our fold. She gestures toward a corner from behind which emerges a silhouette that would have never, ever appeared here under normal circumstances. Oh, there he is. Name's Tork. I'm the Baron of the Bronx. I was delegated here by my compatriots as an oversight authority. I'm here to observe the results of the investigation. Nothing more, nothing less. Let me stress this one last time. This is a one-time occurrence, meant to elevate the tensions in the city, not a symbol of mutual recognition, not in the slightest. I peek at Addison's face to get a feel for how a hardline loyalist might grapple with this arrangement. His expression betrays no surprise, only at slight discomfort. Even if he is fine with it, the prince must have been extremely convincing about the necessity of a temporary truce. Or about some Malca Ma Machiavellian tactic she's got ready up her sleeve. Who knows? Of course, we might have irreconcilable differences. But there are times when they have to be temporarily put aside in order to quell unrest and open paths for constructive, meaningful change. If anyone would like to voice their concerns, the time is now. Torque, Arturo, and Panhard exchange glances. Normally I'd consider it an innocent gesture. Knowing what I know, I roll my eyes. A stick or a carrot, Torque? What made you break and sell your compatriots? How much do you really know? If not, Kadir, may I? <laughs> he steps into the middle of the room and clears his throat theatrically. First, let me plainly state that the conclusion I'm going to present is by no means my own achievement. It is the result of a tireless investigation conducted by talent and kindred I won't name here. A telling glance in Torque's direction serves as a second eh, explanation for why he refuses to call them by their names. And of course, 
Julia Sawinski, whose ceaseless groundwork over the past few nights served as a foundation for the findings that are about to be revealed here. Thank you, Julia. It's not the first time he sets out to oversell my achievements. As the sheriff, my role here is mostly representative. I spent the last few days overseeing the celebrations in Elysium, making sure no harm would befall anyone present. Luckily, well, none did. Looks like the prince's decision to move forward with the event was the correct one. And for that, we should extend our thanks to Gadir, and let us not overlook our guest to a degree. I managed to convince my key allies that diplomatic action is the only way forward in this case. No matter how wrong-headed the enemy can be, we still need avenues to negotiate and communicate. I'm curious how Tamika would react to him looking like a corporate bastard, designing the future order, dismissing potential for a change that lies in unrest. No wonder she dumped him. Spare us the empty pleasantries and let Katia move on. I don't have all night for this. Right. I'll be concise. Douglas Boss Callahan's remains were found in his office by one of his ghouls first thing in the evening. The first kindred to confirm it was another Anarch Baron, Torque, present here. A mystery book author would refer to the circumstances of Callahan's death as a classic closed room mystery. The metal door, locked from the inside, served as the sole way in. There was no murder weapon, no useful testimonies, and the evidence was, how do I put it, barely circumstantial at best. What was left for us was one hell of a puzzle. One where the answer couldn't even be approached using the tired and tested question, Cui bono? Look at all the people here, man. Look at all the, the assortment of people just hanging around this place. That's actually a really cool picture, though. We were presented with a poorly timed power of upheaval. A tense situation where a long-planned celebration was in danger. Suddenly all of us were faced with an uncertain future. Everybody benefited, yet nobody did. No one was especially fond of Callahan, but it's not like anyone seemed particularly keen on removing him from the equation, especially at this time. For a moment, we were sure this was the beginning of an offensive on the part of the Camarilla. We started wondering just how violent or retaliation should be. And as for us... We were momentarily convinced that the Anarchs were plotting to blame us for their own internal power struggles. A tense situation, resolved only thanks to the skillful and swift diplomacy. Dare I say, yet another victory for our talented prince? Julia made sure to examine all the contacts Callahan might have had in his last days. In both sects, her efforts were tireless and only rarely misguided. He just had to spit out at least one biting remark, didn't he? Ah, well, he's probably just covering his ass. Yeah, I, I would assume so. I, I think that's why he said that. That makes sense. But as exhaustive as they might have been, they only served to muddle the possibilities, not explain them. Callahan had a lot of enemies, but they were the most infuriating kind of enemies one can have folks who barely ever thought of him anymore. In other words, no one really had a particular interest in getting rid of him, because they could always simply work their way around him. Just before last Christmas, he even witnessed the first ever successful First Light raid against his extremely profitable blood trade supply lines. A lone ace up his sleeve. A downright shady ability to perfectly maneuver around all SI activities. Gone. Callahan's decline was apparent to all, 
and a domino effect made his empire slowly crumble. Up until recently, he'd done an admirable job keeping up with the times and getting away with murder. But suddenly, all of the prison spotlights were on him. The recent stories we hear about him all depict a depressed, downright maniac recluse lashing out at everyone, struggling and utterly failing to fit into the new reality he found himself in. A closed room, no evidence of struggle, a lack of strong why done -its, the corpse being found in the very early evening hours, the conclusion is simple. Callahan's final death was self-inflicted. Suicide, to put it in simple terms. Huh. Silence has filled the room. So, uh, wow. That really is the angle they'll be pushing, isn't it? Let's hear it, Sheriff. I'll explain. It was an independent detective who first set me out on this theory only last night. There is no suicide note of any kind, of course, but the message our recently departed has sent might not have necessarily been a verbal one. The particular thing was the position of the body. It was like an arrow pointing at us to notice something. It appears the last thing Callahan saw in his unlife was a portrait of one Lord Castlery, the second Marquis of Londonderry, which is... Coincidentally, where Callahan was born. Oh, that's why he had it. Huh. Interesting. To most, he was a reviled traitor, a heartless suppressor of all dissent, the main threat against each rebellion the Irish have gone through, successful in all ways but those that mattered to his people. Some call him a tragic figure, holding together selfish allies against a common threat always fighting for painful and unpopular compromises, ruined by overwork, sickness, and poor public speaking skills. Not hard to see why Douglas Callahan would empathize. <laughs> Polite snickers. Yeah, I can see that. Indeed. Especially when you realize that the sickness in his blood, his failures, the hatred from his own people, and a growing paranoia led him to commit a dramatic suicide within his own four walls. Ah, uh, I see. The assumption is, instead of stabbing himself to death with a knife or a pen, he decided to let the sun embrace him in its warmth, Cassari's face burning into his eyes. A poetic final death. It's not a closure we might have wanted, but probably the best explanation of his motivation that we're going to get. Does everyone follow? Huh. I mean, sure, that's one way to look at it. That is one way, but uh, we know better. Kaiser ratted them out. Actually, I wonder how they would feel about Kaiser ratting them out, honestly. It would be very interesting to see how they would react. A heavy silence fills the room. Nobody speaks up except Prince Panhard. To me, it is all perfectly understandable, agreeable, and, most importantly, it fits the man I've come to understand over the last two decades. Consentient murmurs resonate through the room. Agreed, and might I add, there were some irregularities in the handling of the crime scene, but the Anarch leader's findings suggested Callahan's resentful ghouls were to blame. Folks been real happy to see him dead, is all I'm saying, and they went overboard with the celebrations. They've all been interrogated, though. Yes. I have received all the resulting intel, and it's done nothing to change my mind. Their depictions of Callahan's state of mind only serve to support the suicide theory. It is my suggestion that we all announce these findings to our respective communities first thing tomorrow night. Sounds reasonable. And I think that concludes this meeting. 
I'll let the Keeper of the Elysium do the honors. No time wasted, huh? All right. Does anyone have anything to add? Any questions to ask? Take your time. Silence. I look at everyone just sitting it out in perfect agreement. Congrats, everyone. Congrats, us. We've achieved a perfect victory. No loose ends, no rocking the boat, no nothing. Makes you want to puke. How many of them contributed to this final report? How strongly does Kadir believe the shit running from his mouth? He's always been a Camarilla loyalist, a fanatic even, but... Miss Julia, any final statements? This is it. Now or never. If anyone can blow this pathetic charade wide open, it's me. But there's no coming back from this road, and it has a cost. I've spent all of my life and unlife on social climbing, and the sunken cost fallacy is kicking in. Challenging them here might be my only way of ever making it out of the pit I'm in. On the other hand, maybe this is my time to head into the unknown. Kill my ego, at least temporarily. Shut up the voice of the elders screaming in my head. Betray my La Sombra instincts. Make all these ghosts go away and figure out something new, no matter how scary it may be. Do I dare? Or maybe I don't. I feel like there's an incredible prize to be won, waiting right in front of me. If I just dare to take out this revolver with that single bullet I have hidden on me. And invite everyone here for a crazy game of Russian roulette. You do it, Julia. Pull the book out. Do it. Do it. Give in to your anger. You know you want to, Julia. Come on. Come on. You have the evidence. Don't back out now. But I also get this foreboding gangster movie feeling. Like, this is the scene where the future mobster could have gotten out, but he didn't. In the end, did Callahan think all the splendor of the Golden Era was worth this pathetic end? It's like there are two selves battling for dominance inside of me. One of them has to die. The other gets to live. Honestly, it's a flip of the coin. I reflect on all the kindred I've met. Lessons I've learned. Choices I've made over these past few nights to make a decision. And then, feeling like I'm simply following the way I conducted the investigation to its logical conclusion, I respond, <gasps> What's she gonna say? Actually, I do. Oh, she's doing it. She's doing it. It's like the beast itself flashed in Kadir's eye for a brief moment. Fuck off, Kadir. You don't get to say anything now. You said your piece, we're gonna say ours. You have yanked our chain. It is our time to yank all of you around. No, you don't. But I do! Miss Sawinski. Don't make a scene. Believe me. Every one of you will really, really, really regret it if they don't listen to what I have to say. Will we now? Oh, absolutely. I stand up and step right in front of Kadir. Don't get me wrong. Kadir has done a spectacular job of selling you a ready-made narrative to package and export to the outside world. Hail to the sheriff and all that. But was this little show really necessary? Did you all really need to hype each other up to believe this fairy tale? What are you getting at, little girl? Easy now, my prince. Insult me all you want. It's only going to make it all the sweeter when this little girl kicks your ass. Hell yeah. Let's do this. Let's do it, Julia. Do it. I'm getting at the fact there's a different, more reasonable theory that explains everything. Everything to a T. That's great for you, sweetheart, but do I really need to stand here and listen to it? The door's right there. But on the off chance you get implicated in something tonight, don't you want the chance to defend yourself? And what are the chances of me being implicated in anything tonight? 
Oh, I'm pretty sure a lot of kindred in this room are asking themselves the same question right now. In each case, my answer is the same. You won't find out unless you stay right where you are. She stays. Well, yeah, she's not going to leave now. <laughs> All right, where was I? Ah, let's assume that the cause of Boss Callahan's death really was suicide. Our man said, ah, oh, fuck everything, opened the window shutters, let the break of dawn take care of all his problems. And let's assume that he really meant to send a message using the portrait of Lord Cassery. Sounds dramatic, but sure, let's go with it. But it is commonly understood that Cassery was pushed into taking his own life as a result of a conspiracy against him. Needless to say, his biggest fan wouldn't miss that detail. According to historians, the man's last words imply that some powerful people faced him with a choice, denunciation or death, which, for an ambitious politician, is not a choice at all. So, you're claiming that Callahan left us a hint. It's a troubling hint, don't you think? Oh, yes. Yes, squirm, you little bastards. We're finally getting you right where we want you. What are you? Enough. We're not dealing in conspiracy theories here. Of course you're not. I mean, a conspiracy theory backed by the elites is no longer called such. It's propaganda. Is there a point to this little show you're putting on, Miss Swinsky, other than digging yourself a deeper and deeper metaphorical hole? Oh, Mr. Arturo, you're still trying to tell yourself it's me who's in trouble and not you? That's adorable. Listen, you. No, you listen. He freezes in shock, definitely not used to resistance. I don't blame you for peddling propaganda. You're politicians. That's what you do. I'm just laughing at you for coming up with shitty, poorly conceived propaganda. So, um, will someone stop her, or...? Mr. Addison Payne! You're the architect behind the loyal Camarilla's current speeches and political general narrative. Be honest. Does this shit show really meet your standards? Oh, Payne's thinking about it. He knows. Yeah, he knows that this is pure bullshit, and he doesn't like it. <laughs> we stare into each other's eyes, unblinking, slowly feeling each other out. Eventually, with a barely audible snigger, he whispers to his servant. <laughs> yeah, go, Payne. You're awesome. Heck yeah, Payne's like, now fuck you guys. <laughs> How do I put this? I'm always open to a better pitch. That's all I wanted to hear. All I'm asking for now is a little patience. That I can spare. Oh, for goodness sake, Addison, come on, man. You can't possibly... Silence. I said what I said. Now let her talk. Thank you. I'm starting to have fun with this. Oh, we're all having fun with this, Julia. Not just you. I'm greatly enjoying this. It is time to put everybody in their place. Everyone who has been treating us like garbage is going to be treated like garbage right now, and I love it. I'm starting to have fun with this. Or, more like, I'm feeling that weird rush. Reminding me of the first time I managed to ride a bike. The important thing is to keep up the momentum. Focus on pedaling hard. Don't even think of falling. You had it all figured out, didn't you? An improperly handled murder scene. A disposable investigator forced to blindly stumble around, hopelessly chasing loose ends. Your only problem is that tonight I realized I was using the wrong tools all along. Instead of a sleuth's magnifying glass, I only needed a journalist's pen. 
Here we go. Bring it out. Get the book out. Get the book out, Julia. Come on. So I sat down tonight and wrote my first article in almost a year. Two hours of ceaseless writing. Creative juices flowing the entire time. Everything miraculously falling into place. And frankly, I think it's my masterpiece. I get carried away and jump up on one of the benches. <laughs> you do it, Julia. Take over. Take over the, the investigation right now. You want to hear the contents? I know you're all dying to hear the contents. So, okay. Let's hear the contents. Aisling Sturbridge, High Regent of the Chantry of the Five Boroughs, violently splitting with her student after he discovered her plans for horrific experiments with blood magic. Her target? Baron Callahan, said student, conveniently missing. We've got an exclusive source, too. Agathon the Warlock's personal diary. Extra, extra, read all about it. She's trying to hide that she's nervous, but she's practically shaking. I should be the one shaking. I'm piecing together what little solid or relatively solid intel I have, gluing it together into something coherent with educated assumptions and pure conjecture. But, at least I'm fairly sure she recognizes me as a threat now. Just what I was hoping for. Next up! Is it true that Torque... The brave Anarch Baron, primed to be the next de facto leader of the sect in NYC, might have been manipulating his entire faction to secure his position. This appeasement candidate convinced his key allies that the revolution is not an option at the moment, appearing as a reasonable alternative to his bloodthirsty rivals. <clears throat> His ace in the hole was a strangely efficient ability to establish diplomatic channels with the Camarilla, which he then used to gain a series of small concessions from the NYC court. Could it be that Prince Panhard, having realized that her longtime collaborator Baron Callahan was just an undesirable asset, found a different, more 2020 candidate to be the leader of the Anarchs? Extra, extra, read all about it. Oh, Panhard's pissed now. This one's not shaking, she's just angry. Well, to be fair, I'm sure she would be. She's being put in her place right now. Torque is silent. And this one just seems confused. <laughs> yeah, he's probably confused because he, he probably didn't realize that Panhard was eagerly doing it in that way, right? the fact that Torque, Helen Panhard, Thomas Arturo, Carter Vanderweeden, and Aisling Sturbridge were all summoned to Callahan's office right before his death. Could it be that the so-called boss employed some final desperate measures to stop his downward spiral into irrelevance, at which point a rushed plan to bring on his demise was executed? Could it be that Kaiser, the legendary New York City info broker, striking deals left and right with both the Cambria and the Anarchs, wiretapped Callahan's office to eavesdrop on those negotiations? Extra, extra, read all about it. You could cut the atmosphere here with a knife, and it's only getting worse. For them, at least, I feel better than I felt in years. And the fact nobody is protesting probably means I'm hitting the nail on the head. Well, yeah, I mean, again, it's obvious, right? Could it be that for the entire 21st century, the conflict between the New York City Camarilla and the Anarchs was a sham? What if the Second Inquisition's operations in the city were consulted with the leaders of the two sects? How deep does the rot of corruption go? And what about Sophie Langley's disappearance, hmm? Attempts on the unlives of would-be members of a coterie she attempted to set up alongside her ward last year? Could all of these things be connected? And that's just the tip of the iceberg. 
Stay tuned, dear readers. Heavy silence befalls the room. When it becomes too overbearing, Kadir breaks it by hawking loudly, his poker face indecipherable. And where, pray tell, can one read all about it tomorrow? Ten different places. Among them, of course, a report received by Clan Lasombra's elders in Chicago. Constantly mixing truths with lies. I do know some facts. I did write something. But all in all, it's a confidence grift, plain and simple. Have you sent it out already? No. And Father Leonard's not the channel I used to reach Chicago, in case you were wondering. I took every possible precaution. The way you taught me. I know this hurts him, but I can't show a single weakness right now. Oh, this is ridiculous. She's probably bluffing. No. She knows, Thomas. Aisling, how could you be certain? I just am. Ha! <laughs> Take that, you kiss-ass. What you gotta say now, huh? You and your pompous-ass words. That diary probably just saved my ass. <laughs> Thank you, Agathon, I guess. Even if I was bluffing, it's all about the optics. You nominate a special investigator, then the moment she presents her findings, you do what? Subjugate her? Get rid of her? How do you get out of this? I get it. I get it. I really do. You gave me that role, that title, because you were counting on me remaining the same shitty, useless nobody I was since I started working with the court. But funny how that works, isn't it? A week ago, nobody gave a shit about what I have to say. Now I'm a grave threat to this entire Illuminati New World Order arrangement you've got going on. I still maintain you can't possibly know and prove all the claims you've listed. There's just no way. I know. I checked. First off, stop bullshitting. You don't know that for sure. Secondly, even if you're right, so what? I've got leverage now. Because of my journalist past, you gave me a detective title that wasn't worth a rat's ass in doing detective work. But ironically, it gave me the opportunity to do the best reporting I've ever done. It's kind of funny when you think of it that way, you know? Like, they gave her this position on purpose, n hoping she would fail because she wasn't really, you know, they're like, oh, she's new, we can just throw it on her, she won't know what to do, she not, won't know where to look, nobody cares, but here she is, standing in front of them with all this evidence, and she's like, no, 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 the shoe's on the other foot now. I have all the cards, I have the the winning hand in this poker game, and you all are trying to bluff me out of thinking I don't. And it doesn't even matter if it contains more facts than your official narrative. And you know why? Because the story I offer makes infinitely more sense, morally, emotionally, metaphysically, however you name it. It's a far hotter commodity than the low-rent bullshit you peddle. People nowadays buy into barely coherent crap like 5G and Kanan. Once they get a hold of my perfectly logical story and see you don't really have anything to counter it, you'll be fucked. Hell, the very fact none of you have denied any of my allegations yet speaks volumes, doesn't it? Gotcha there. The prince is absolutely furious that she's not in charge, visibly scrambling to figure out some counteroffensive. Why would anyone listen to you? You made that story of yours sound completely unrespectable, like a tabloid garbage. Tabloid would be fine. Just means it would reach more folks. Ha! She has a point. What? What do you want? Well, now we're talking. A primogen position for Clan Lasombra and a number of privileges befitting the title. We can negotiate the details, but a nice apartment in downtown Manhattan is a must. 
Demanding big, are we? And what could you even bring to the fold as Primogen? I turn away from her to speak to the manager. Mr. Payne? Yes. As you can see, we've all found ourselves in quite a mess here. Indeed, to say the least. If I find us a way out, will you form a professional relationship with me and back the decision to make me Primogen? The figure in the wheelchair lets out a sarcastic laugh, sounding like the final wheeze of a dumb... He likes us, I can tell, right? He He's totally like, I like this one. You got guts, kid. You put everyone in their place and it's hilarious. You really are swinging for the fences, aren't you, child? I'm not suicidal. Most of the time, at least. I wouldn't be doing this if I didn't have my sights set sky high. I understand. So, how do you propose we solve this little predicament? Easy. We give the masses an even better story than the one I just suggested. One that benefits nearly all the parties in this room. All right, then. Thanks to your moxie, you've secured yourself my tentative support, child. Let's hear it. Thank you very much. Okay, then. During my investigation, I recovered some interesting intel about a certain individual. Praise be to Kaiser's abandoned limousine. Said individual would definitely prefer his behind-the-scenes dealings to remain unknown. For the last 20 years, he's been an on-and-off mediator between the different parties in this city. He prides himself on his diplomatic skills. Interestingly enough, though... One of his main motivations was selling intel about both the Camarilla and the Anarchs to any party that might be interested. Usually that meant Kaiser. With a reasonable degree of certainty, he can be held responsible for a few recent failed Camarilla operations that weakened Helen Panhard's position. He dreams of being a prince, you see. I can already see him awkwardly shifting his weight. Recently, he obtained control over an IT company called Double Spiral, which he uses to influence NYC Kine in ways that further his agendas and weaken his political enemies. He also operates the most powerful law firm in the city. He uses both of these tools so he, that he can manipulate the mortals to slowly tie a noose around Anarch leaders and court members who he wants gone. I'm talking, of course, about... Carter Vanderweeden. In a split second, all eyes in the room are set on him. <laughs> People, whatever she throws at me, I'm sure I can explain. I throw a file I recovered from Kaiser's limo at the bench. Are you sure? Because there's a hell of a lot to explain. Oh boy, he got caught. Oh no! Addison's servant picks up the file so that his master can browse through it. If that's not enough, I'm sure Double Spiral will be happy to deliver us more. So all the things you said the other night were a steaming pile of bullshit, Carter? Addison, we, we're friends. There's a good explanation for every single thing that's listed there. I swear on my father's grave. Even if there is, I doubt you can justify allowing a girl who's little more than a fledgling ripping your credibility to shreds in a matter of seconds. You've proven yourself as something infinitely worse than a traitor, Carter. You're a weak traitor. Th Thomas! Helen! Don't you even dare speak to me, you bastard. That was the last element of my strategy. I hope they won't throw any curveballs my way, because from now on it's all pure improvisation. Just two minutes ago... I was the number one enemy of everyone in this room. 
Now I'm their unexpected ally, revealing a common foe that some people in this room have wanted to nail since forever. All I'm saying is we've got ourselves a perfect scapegoat to pin everything on. Shady dealings between both sects, all the real conspiracies he was involved in, impossibly perfect looks in history. The schadenfreude accompanying his fall will be enough to keep some kindred in the city happy for years. He shoots me a demented look, one I assume is typically reserved for a future strangling victim. You. You. You can't do this to me. And why is that? You are. You are. You are. You are. Incompetent. Wow. That's the best you can do, seriously? Kadir. Yes, my prince. Seize him. No. No, I beg you. Just, just no. Nope. You can come with me without struggle or in torpor. As usual, it's three strikes with me and then you're gone. No. No, 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 no. He talks a lot but puts up minimal resistance. Kadir drags him out of the room and that's the last I ever see of him. For a good minute, everyone just stands there confused. Then Addison begins to clap. <laughs> Addison's cool, dude. <laughs> I like this guy. Bravo, Miss Sowinsky. I haven't seen such an adventurous power play in years. Maybe our generation's not at all lost after all. <laughs> dude. Good job, Julia. Oh my god, you pulled a rabbit out of your hat and it wowed the entire crowd. It's a good thing she looked in, in that limo, though, right? If she didn't look in the limo, she wouldn't have been able to get that info. Because that was her ace in the hole. For sure. Does that mean I can count on your support? Of course. As far as I'm concerned, you're the kind of ruthless primogen the city needs. Especially now, when one seat will probably be made vacant. So, what do you say, my prince? Panhard recoils a little when she hears me refer to her in, in such an official manner. Oh, right! Because before, she didn't even do that. My relationship with Addison is a decades-long conflict. And by now, I know which hills I'm willing to die on. This is not one of them. Rejoice, girl. You're going to get what you want, as well as deserve. We do have one important condition, though. Of course you do. Mr. Payne, as I'm sure you'll agree, being primogen is an important representative position. It demands nothing but a display of impeccable respect for the masquerade and the traditions. Of course. It is my concern that it wouldn't be proper for us to be represented by someone who openly violated the rules of kindred society. But of course, that wouldn't do at all. They'd have to openly renounce their old ways at the very least. Indeed. And I think that in the case of Miss Sawinski, who has lived with a mortal under a single roof for a long time, the best course of action would be to renounce her and give her up to our sheriff. That kind of gesture would prove the new primogen's dedication to the court, beyond any reasonable doubt. Mm-hmm. Yes, yes, I definitely agree. Her ambition and pride are admirable, but it would be prudent of us to demand a display of humility as well. Sadistic fucks. My thoughts exactly. Well then, your answer, miss? <laughs> What's so funny, Miss Sawinski? I see it in your eyes, Arturo, you naive fool. You think you're so goddamn clever? You think I would have gotten this far if I didn't think it all through? Oh, she's thinking about Dakota. There's only one response. I agree. Do what you must. It... <laughs> he's speechless! Well, yeah, I mean, he's... He's... He was like... Oh, 
oh, well, she's never going to say no because she's been living with that human girl. But now that things have changed, he's like, uh oh, shit, w what do I get her on now? I, I can't actually, I don't have anything to pin on her. <laughs> he thought he had me pinned and I simply responded with a checkmate. Guess that solves our problem then. Let's head out for now. It's been an exhausting evening and dawn is nearing. Yes, let's just do that. He walks Payne out looking unstrung and defeated. Oh wow, she went missing. Oh wow. Huh, interesting. Soon after, Kadir ordered to take care of Dakota. He asked me if I wanted to know what was done to her. My reply was honest. Not really interested. No. He said that I'd gotten myself into a terrible game, the rules of which defied comprehension. I replied that if I'm winning and climbing upward, I must be doing something right. Still, we don't talk too much these days beyond professional interactions. I have a much bigger world to think about now. One that fills me with happiness. Come to think of it, my current state reminds me of those few halcyon days right after my embrace. It might not last, but at this point I have to ask myself, what does? It's always about the next bigger rush. I just realized she's smoking a cigar now. She's went up in the world. <laughs> I'm writing speeches and official communications for the NYC Camarilla these days. Helping out pain from time to time too. Funny, I've never felt more accomplished more fulfilled as a journalist than I am now. Karen is visiting in a few days to congratulate me on behalf of the entire Chicago-based clan. Apparently, I've not only met her expectations, but exceeded them. She keeps bragging to everyone about how great her eye was in picking me. It's like she knew, right? It's only... It's only these shadows that, that keep getting to me. I notice them everywhere these nights. But there are more and more of them surrounding me as time goes on. But it doesn't matter. I like to think they're being cast because my future looks so bright. Oh, I got the good ending! That's the good ending! We did it! We beat it! Oh my god! After so long, after so many literal, like, two years I've been playing this? Pretty much two years, almost two? We finally beat Vampire the Masquerade Shadows of New York. We finally did it, everybody. I think that deserves a round of applause, right? We did it. We beat the game. We, you know, I really enjoyed this game. I actually really enjoyed the story. I liked the whodunit angle. I really liked all the different angles that they tried to, like, you know twisted and all the different characters were interesting and oh man wow that's just what a good game man i actually really know <laughs> one of the pets names is batman that's awesome well everybody um thank you for playing no thank you guys who have this team thank you for making this game i had a lot of fun it was my first ever real jump into vampire the masquerade i had a lot of fun I had a great time, and uh, I hope you guys enjoyed it too. Um, that being said, uh, we are done. Thank you all so much for joining me on this journey. Again, I, I cannot stress enough, this was one of the longest things I've had to do on this channel because I was only allowed to record at certain times, in certain, in certain conditions and everything, and then I'm so glad to get this game done. And, uh, I hope you all have a good one. I'll see you guys next time for the next big thing that we're going to play. Take care of yourselves. Bye-bye.